Zach or Georgia, if you can hear me, I can't share screen because I'm not the host, so if you can let me.
Hello everyone, welcome back to the River Institute's River Symposium. My name is Lima Gahi and I am the program lead for research and community engagement. I'm really excited to be here today for our online day. Um, just a reminder, we're live streamed on YouTube and you're welcome to leave comments in the chat. In fact, it'd be great if you leave comments in the chat, tell us where you're tuning in from, um, who you are and why you're interested in, in what we're talking about today. Um, we do want to make an announcement just to say that we are aware that the River Symposium website is currently down. So we will be emailing out a program to everyone who's registered for the conference. And there is also a program available in the chat, so in the link. Um, okay, so today's first session, we are having a conversation today with some panelists. We're going to be talking about fish consumption advisories. Those of us that work in fish consumption advisories talk about them as if everyone knows what they are. I'm just going to introduce them briefly to say that fish consumption advisories are the advice you get if you catch a fish in the wild and you're wanting to know if you can eat it. So freshwater systems have various contaminants in them sometimes, and when they do, governments are responsible for providing us with advice for the fish that we can or can't eat. And if we can eat the fish, how many of those fish can we eat? And so there's um, the St. Lawrence River is in a place that has a very complex jurisdictional background. So we have lots of different um, jurisdictions that govern the water body that we're in. And so it can be complicated to understand what the fish consumption advice is on the St. Lawrence River. Um, so I'm going to start today by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and also tell us why they are interested in fish consumption advisories. So um, we're gonna start with Abram Francis, please. Abe, will you tell everyone you know, your affiliation and then continue with your interest in, in this particular topic? Oh, well, wonderful. So Sego Sego Gwego, Delhu Hyate Yungya, Akuza Sneka Nagale, Wagunye Tlono. So hi, my name is Abraham Francis. I'm Deer Clan from Akuzasne, born and raised. Um, and currently I am a PhD student at Clarkson University. Um, I'm also the founder of the Alunia Collective, which is really interested in helping empower First Nation communities and the work that happens with them. Um and Part of what brings me to fish advisories is this deep history of environmental violence in Akwazasne, this distancing of us from the landscapes around us, and how fish advisories are one of the contributing factors to that. And really what sort of my obsession over these years and promoting this understanding that violence on the land is violence on the people. And actually fish advisors can be fish advisories can be a part of that sort of expression of violence on landscape when they are from their inception with the best of intentions to care for people. And I think it was actually a 
colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Elaine Faustman, who, who pointed out that fish advisories can be an environmental taking. And so with that in mind, I sort of began this long journey um, with a fish consumption advisory framework funded through the IJC's um, research. And that's kind of how I came into working with Barry Madison and in an interesting way, connected to Kristen. Um, and I just, it's grown my understanding in this really beautiful way of how this idea I had that environmental restoration needs to be accompanied by cultural restoration that fish advisories need to sort of re-engage us with landscapes and we need to put opportunities to sort of re create that re-engagement. And so that's sort of this long, like this long roundabout way of saying that I wanna fish <laughs> and you know, I wanna be out on the river and I wanna feel safe with that engagement and that I need the necessary information in order to do that. And because Aquazusin is so complex with everything, you know, from Quebec to Ontario to New York State intersecting here and implicating us in so many different ways, as well as our history, that there's a lot of information that we need to feel safe. And I'm really grateful to have worked with so many wonderful, wonderful people conceptualizing what that could look like. And so that's what brings me to Fish Advisories is thinking again about healing our relationship with fish. And so my kids and future generations of Aquazo Slono can re-engage the environment around us and have the tools necessary to learn about that so we can be better relatives to fish. And so that's what I have to say about fish advisories and my connection to that. Thank you, Abe. That gets us off to a really good start. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Lawrence. Please introduce yourself and then also tell us, you know, what your connection is with fish consumption advisories. Hi, I'm Lawrence Gunther. I'm the president and founder of Bluefish Canada. We started the charity in 2012 to, uh, it, the, our mission is the future of fish and fishing. So we're really into water quality, fish health, and connecting people to nature through sustainable, responsible recreational fishing. The Great Lakes itself has, uh, in Canadian dollars, about an $8.5 billion fishery going on in the Great Lakes. They say it's the most valuable freshwater fishery in the world. That's according to the, uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. And uh, how that breaks down is maybe about $350 million of that is commercial fishing. So that's fish that are caught in nets and such and then exported or, or consumed uh, locally or nationally, but, you know, fish for sale. Uh, there's a First Nations uh, component to that as well. And there's a recreational component to that. So there, there, it's a lot of money spent by recreational anglers to go fishing, to catch fish. About two thirds of the fish they catch are, are released and well, one third they're harvesting. So, what is it? Are they harvesting? How how are those fish? Or, you know, in terms of are they safe to eat? And there's a lot of misinformation. A lot of um, uh, on one side mistrust. People don't believe the fish are safe to eat, and on the other side, there's people who just don't believe the consumption advisories. You know, I think it's like cigarettes, right? You know, we all thought cigarettes were pretty cool and everyone smoked a lot of people smoked and no one thought about it and then we started hearing more and more about cancer and things like that related to cigarettes but people still didn't quit smoking so we started putting advisories on cigarette packs but look at cigarette packs now and and there's still people smoking so you know fish consumption advisories you know they're not on your fishing lures or your your minnows your worms when you buy them where are they? Like, how come we're not hearing about these more often? Why aren't they being communicated in languages that uh, equate to the people who are going fishing in culturally uh, specific ways so people can find them and, and understand what they mean? Because they're quite complex and they're quite important, right? If you, if you start eating fish that, you know, too much of it uh, at the wrong time of your life and, um, and the wrong species and the wrong location, th this is all can get quite problematic, but we hear very little about that. Of course, we're also interested in, in the fish themselves because it's not just about, you know, a crop, right? And is it safe to eat? Is it organic or not? Is it got pesticides or not? It's also, are the fish suffering? You know, are they living free of, uh, uh, you know, stress? Can they carry out their fishy activities? You know, spawning, uh, hunting, breeding, uh, you know, being curious. Or are they you know, suffering? And we don't know much about that either. So, yeah, uh, you know, I also started the Great Lakes um, Fish Health Network. And uh, some of our presenters are part of that. 
today and we're pretty proud of some of the work we're doing in terms of articles and research and such. So you'll hear more about that. Thank you, Lawrence. That was a really great introduction from the recreational, you know, fisherman that you are and uh, yeah. give us some context in terms of the economy as well. I'm going to pass it over to Kristen. Will you introduce yourself, Kristen, and also your your um, interest in fish consumption advisories? Yes, thanks. Um, so I'm Kristen Lowich. I'm a settler uh, academic and I'm based in the School of Environmental Studies at at Queen's University, so joining you from traditional and unceded Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory here in um, Kingston, Ontario. And uh, my interest in fish consumption advisories are broadly around um, sustainable food systems. So that's sort of at the center of my uh, research program. Um, and I've been thinking more about for a number of years how sort of fisheries and small scale fisheries in particular intersect with sustainable fisheries. Um, so that's sort of my broad lens onto this and um, thinking, you know, how fisheries and also I think often other, uh, you know, freshwater and marine resources are often overlooked in conceptions of sustainable food systems. A lot of the academic research on food systems pays, you know, more attention to agriculture and terrestrial food sources. Um, I think within conventional sort of fisheries management, fish is also often viewed more as a you know natural resource or a commodity to be to be managed not necessarily as an integrated part of food systems and the complexity that entails so sort of that's sort of the perspective that I start from when thinking broadly about kind of fisheries and these interactions with sort of food systems and sustainability in particular um, ecological social and ecological context so these interdependencies you know among um, aquatic ecosystems food systems and outcomes for ecological, human health, uh, economically, culturally viable livelihoods, um, and community well-being that are based in principles of, um, you know, justice and, uh, and democracy. So it was really only more recently that I was, I even, you know, started thinking or engaging with fish consumption advisories really at all as a part of this kind of broader conversation around fisheries and sustainability and food systems and really just through collaboration with, uh, you know, the people on this, this panel. Um, so my interest is around thinking about, you know, fish consumption advisors as a part of food systems and their sustainability or their, you know, lack thereof for, you know, coastal and fishing communities and fishers. Um, fish consumption advisories may affect, you know, as, you know, as Lawrence and Abraham both said, you know, what people eat, um, the health impacts of that consumption, uh, how much and, you know, what types of fish people are catching, how that may they share that catch or not with, you know, their family or other people in their communities. Um, and I think uh, just as importantly, like sustainable food systems are also about justice and how communities are engaged in making decisions about their, their food systems. And so, you know, who fish consumption advisories are targeted to, how they are communicated, um, how they're implemented and developed. These are also, I think, questions about how we govern and make decisions about food systems. So, um, yeah, so in summary, I'd say my interests are really thinking about, you know, food systems as a lens onto fish consumption advisories and how FCAs are connected to these broader questions, not only around food consumption, which is really important, but also sort of food justice and uh, place-based food systems and, and relationships in coastal and fishing dependent communities. Thank you, Kristen. That's great. And Barry, I'm going to pass it over to you for that first question. So. Don't forget to introduce yourself and then your relationship with FCAs. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Barry Madison. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Biology in Brandon University, which is in the center of Canada, which is a little far away from that particular place where everyone else is, and I wish I could be there. Uh, I actually started some of this work a long time ago, um, looking at fish consumption advisories a few years ago with some of the group at the River Institute, uh, as well as Abe and those at the MCA, for example. And I kind of serendipitously happened into this because my experience is actually a background in fish physiology, uh, stress physiology, and more or less how animals themselves perceive the environment around them. So my interest is more or less from the biological standpoint initially, but as I waded into this particular puzzle with FCAs or fish consumption advisories, and just the complexity in which the advisories are constructed and what they're attempting to do and how they're attempting to go about that it was very detailed and very interesting to me. And so I took some time to delve into it. But basically, 
my interest came from a fish centric point of view and understanding how they interact with their environment and has slowly converted over to how to use that kind of knowledge to uh, expand our understanding of how we use FCAs, especially in these tricky regions like we're talking about today, where there's a variety of different authorities or jurisdictions associated with this, some decisions that need to be made. And then also, as Lawrence uh, very well pointed out, the uh, information that's available has to be sought out and used. And so to me, it kind of represents the end point of when I do my science, what happens to it? And how does the public use it, for example? And I'm not necessarily anyone that uh, a scientist who who creates these kinds of um, advisories myself. I'm just someone who is interested in contaminants and their effects on fishes and how they grow and things like that. So I spent a lot of work working in the uh, Great Lakes region on walleye, on uh, some salmonids as well. But as I said, I came to this initially with a different perspective. But since I've been working on this this particular project and, and this, with this group, I've actually had kind of a change of heart in my research. And now I'm also looking at things with uh, associated with human health and how contaminants will affect communities and also how communities can have the power themselves to monitor these things. So that's my interest, more of a technical standpoint. But uh, as I said, I'm happy to offer uh, my opinions and my uh, perspective today. Thank you, Barry. And I'm I'm going to jump in at this point and say that, that you know, I, I lead the Great River Report, which is an ecosystem health report on the Upper St. Lawrence River. And I also came new to this area and I wasn't familiar with, with many things when I started five years ago. And in fact, I, I didn't know much about fish consumption advisories. And I was connecting with community groups. I was giving talks. I was asking people what their concerns were on the river. And I was hearing a lot of you know, uh, interest around you know, what is the state of the river in terms of contaminants? And I, of course, then went to try and find the answers to these questions and realized that for this neck of the woods, we have fish consumption advisories. In other words, you catch a fish, can I eat it? And that decision needs to be made. And you can go to government sources to try and find out you know, what, what information is, is available. But it depends where you are. So are you in New York? Are you in Quebec? Are you in Ontario? Um, are you in Aquasasne? You know, whose advice should you be following? And when I went to look at the advice, it's often, in, in fact, for, for those, um, those websites that are providing the advice, they're providing a lot of detail. But as a novice coming to the website, I was like, wow, I, I see if I catch a fish at this size, I can eat four of them. No, 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 I can't eat four of them. I can eat four portions of them. And then you know how big is that portion and and it it changed depending on which you know jurisdiction i was trying to find the answer for and of course when i spoke in new york they wanted you know to know where they should go looking and i i kept thinking well this is one body of water this is pretty complicated and i feel like i should at least be able to figure it out and imagine how challenging for the public and so I, i'm going to make that the introduction to the next question, which is, you know, what do you think are the main issues or problems with fish consumption advisories and their impact on fish and the people and economies? And I, I'd like to put this uh, over to you, Barry, to start with, if, if, if you can take it from here. Sure, thanks, Lee. So I've spent a few years kind of delving into the comparisons and the technical details of three jurisdictional advisories in the area, so the Ontario, the Quebec, and the New York State, as well as the advice from the Akwesasne community, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, the community-based advice, which is a really interesting synergistic document that takes all of these other components and makes them one. But the details behind the other uh, FCAs, as I will, I think some of the issues that I have run into with my work is just the sheer amount of detail associated behind the scenes that are leading to these numbers or to the choices that you can make. Now, I think you did a very good job in introducing this, Lee, and that is even if someone with a background in this particular area would still have some choices and maybe some challenges to make as some of the approaches are slightly different. Some of the numbers used are slightly different. Some of the compounds measured are slightly different. Like there's enough subtlety in the advisories across the board that uh, some of these things add up over a long time to an extra meal, for example, or an extra portion. And so if you're eating, for example, fish on a daily basis, uh, that actually matters, especially for contaminant loads and things like that. So to me, it's finding the information that's out there and then how do you use it? 
And say, for example, you need to, or you're in two different areas, advisory zones, and you move back and forth between them, you're going to have to approach the advisories differently, I should say, you know, use the New York state ones in New York and the Ontario ones in Ontario. But even the difference, for example, of having metric to imperial is enough to sour some people to figure out exactly how deep they need to go to make these calculations. You have to convert all the numbers. And then things like even the masses of the portions are slightly different. So something like 227 grams versus 230 grams. They're both Canadian advisories. Three grams difference doesn't seem like a lot, but it rounds up over time. So to me, I, I find that the confusion within the advice is just with the subtlety. Now, all of this said, one of the biggest things that I ran into also is the fact that this is dynamic. So the advisories are constantly changing, as they should, because they need to be updated. And so they are rolling. So you have to constantly check back to make sure you have the most up-to-date information. And there's a, a large number of people working very hard behind the scenes to make these things work for people. So I understand that and want to respect that. But in terms of its practical application, this is why I'm interested in it, because it's where the quote unquote rubber meets the road for us scientists to figure out how our information is being disseminated and how the public can then use it effectively. And that's that's kind of the impetus is the work there. So to me, the main challenge, I think, is just what do we do with all this complicated data? How do we distill it down so that the public can view it, use it and be safe in their choices? Thank you, Barry. That's a, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking, okay, but I caught a fish and I don't really feel like weighing it. I just want to eat it or, or I want to take it home and I, my family wants to eat it and I don't exactly. really feel like cutting it up into seven equally sized portions of however many grams. And But I guess I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pass that over. Yeah. I'm sure both Lawrence and Abe have, have something to say on that. Maybe Abe, I'll, I'll hand it to you. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's something that I've thought a lot about too, right? Like thinking through how we're communicating this information through, um, you know, like 227 grams, 230 grams, these, these, these numbers that sort of exist out there, but how do we convert these into things that people can relate to, right? And something I heard recently at like a conference was this lady, I'm trying, I can see her face, I can't remember her name, but it was the Indigenous Environmental Network. And she, she mentioned she was like if it fits in the hand it goes in the pan and like little little things like that are really helpful in trying to get people into engaging it right and what I've noticed in my in the research that we've done is like people use a lot of logic when they're thinking about fish consumption they're sort of like you know we sort of put out these ideas about well don't eat, eat the really big fish because there there's a lot of biomagnification um you know and and sort of like care about the little fish because like we want to make sure that like they're growing up right and and it's really interesting to see like the logic that people go through in particular what it got me thinking about is um risk perception how do we ex how do we evaluate risk in and what i've come to realize is that it's this like multi like Const it's this constellation of different information and different histories that ultimately imbue you with this idea of like, can I trust this? Is this trustworthy? Like, and that's where like, you know, I think about the indigenous context in this. Who do we trust? You know, and who is giving out these these uh, these advisories? Obviously the government is responsible for doing it. So the government is doing it. And as we know, indigenous people do not have the best relationship with the governments of Canada or the United States. Our history is layered and we have this historical pain, pain body that I talk a lot about. And so if we're given something, we're like, well, I don't trust it, right? And then also we have like this big history of research in Aquasasana trying to understand, well, okay, we understand like there's all this research happening about well the, what is the contaminant loads in the fish how are we providing advisories the research in aquasasne in the 90s into the 2000s was about well how much contaminants do we have in our bodies right and sort of thinking through that element of it finding it in breast milk finding it in in young kids and and adults and like sort of what are the implications of that and and that's where it got me like really inspired about, well, why did this fear develop and how can we characterize that fear and how even just the name of a fish advisory, it's advice, like it's an advisory to not consume fish. And that's why I was really inspired by what Lawrence was talking about, how with cigarettes, we have warnings on the cigarettes, right? It may cause cancer and these, all of these different information. And 
kind of like if we're we're if we're putting like a cigarette label on fish and stuff, how like scary that can be for people. And thinking through that process and what can that mean for us as we sort of think about renegotiating, you know, and in a lot of the stories I hear from my community, I only I only fish for enjoyment. You know, I'm not fishing for these other purposes for food and for sustainability, you know, and that for me is what really has me thinking about the social change that has happened here. And even the economies, there used to be a large fishery in Akwazasana and it's no longer here. And I think what's interesting too is like, you know, what I heard is people got lazy. That's why we don't fish anymore like that. It's too hard. And when I was like thinking about it and I was like, this was the eighties and you could make like 30 or $50 an hour filleting fish for the fishery during certain times of the year. And at that time, that was a big amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. And then you think about now, like just imagining sort of inflation and what does that mean? It, for me, laziness as a factor of why people aren't out there is too easy of an answer. It's too simple for me. And I want to see like sort of the complexities around why we don't do these things. And what I sort of speak about too is like the grief that comes with that. You know, growing up, not having access, you know, um, not having a teacher, you know, like, and, you know, even sort of imbuing myself with the inspiration to do it. Like, if somebody in my family was fishing and providing that for us, if we were interested in consuming fish, I just think about the relationships that exist around fishing in Akwazasana and the sort of barriers that were introduced, which ultimately created this contentious relationship between us, the fish, and the river. And so the, a lot of the work that I'm interested in is how can we develop communication that's about restoring that relationship? And I always introduce, like, you know, you hear me introduce the asterisks into this, is, is it safe for us to consume? You know, the data that we have in Akwazasana, there's data gaps, there's different information on different sides of the border, there's all of these things. And I think that that just promotes this continued distrust within our people. Well, it's all over the place. We don't really know. and so. That's what I've really kind of been reimagining is like, how do we story these things, get them out in the community as we've, we've, I, I think is funny. How do we tap into the anti-network in Akwazasana to share this information out to the people? How do we get people that, that like trust this information and also understand what's being said to them? And so that's where, you know, ultimately, I think that's kind of how I've been informed in a lot of my work is like, okay, my people don't understand something or we don't understand the science behind something. Let me go learn about it. Let me be able to translate that. Let me think about creative ways. Let me take it from the models and the graphs and the long explanations of how this and give it to them in a way that they can they can take home with them and they can share with their with their families so we can then introduce and transform this relationship. Um, yeah, so that's where I think it's been changed and that's where I'm ultimately trying to understand it so I can then restore that relationship in a way that is kind and, and generous. And that way we're, we're, we're out on the water and we're, we're fulfilling our roles and responsibilities to fish. So that's kind of the way that I think about all of that change and chorus with like all of this information that we're talking about now. Thank you so much, James. That's that's really great. And I, I, I saw Lawrence nodding while we, while you were mm -hmm. talking, and I'm going to hand it straight over to him to, to comment as well. Lawrence, the question is just to remind you, what do you think are the main issues and problems with FCAs and their impact on people, fish, and economies? It, it comes down to public trust and, and public awareness, right? And if I think about the angling community, and you know, when I use the word community, I, it's, I use it very loosely. I'm just talking about people who go fishing. So there's people who fish, who are aware of fish consumption advisories, who follow fish consumption advisories very closely, and uh, take a very sort of academic approach to, to you know, where they fish, the kind of fish they're catching, which ones they need to release for conservation reasons, for their own personal health reasons, and which ones they can take home and safely feed to their family, right? There's, there's, there are a group of anglers, and they number in, in size for sure, who do that very closely. There's also a, a group of anglers who just don't, uh, you know, care and they don't think it's it's true. And they just say, you know, if you ask them, are you you, you can take those home to eat? And oh, yeah. And I say, well, you know, are you following the fish consumption advisory? You say, well, you know, I don't I just know that you know, if you just take it and you're just careful, you just you know moderate your intake. And they think it's like drinking. Right. Or, or you know, if you if you're not drinking every day, 
you're okay, right? If you're not eating fish every day, you're okay. But they don't realize, you know, there's some that you shouldn't be eating at all. And there's some people in their family, like maybe nursing mothers or pregnant mothers or, or young children that shouldn't be eating at all. And it really depends on the species and the location and the size of fish. And there's a lot of variables there. And just to say, you know, just moderation is the, is the only approach you need to take. And, you know, you don't get all upset about it. You're just spoiling it. Then there's a group of anglers that just look at the Great Lakes and say, you know, I'm not eating those fish. Uh, you know, it's you hear too many things. You, you hear, you know, a lot of uh, information being broadcast from different groups who are concerned with water quality. And there's a lot of groups concerned with water quality with respect to the Great Lakes. You know, we have all these areas of concern in the Great Lakes, 32 of them, where they're, you know, chemical hot spots that need to be cleaned up and they are being cleaned up. But, you know, there's still things happening, right? There are microplastics, and we hear about microplastics in the, in, the, in the muscle tissue of the fish now. And do we want that in our muscle tissue if we eat these fish? Or there, there's forever chemicals, you know, the, all these PFAS chemicals that are being uh, released into the water. Uh, the, you know, the, the Teflons and the fire retardants and the water treatment and, um, you know, waterproofing treatment. These things that just don't break down in water. And they don't break down in your body either. So, you know, people are just really not convinced that it's safe to eat. And then there, there's a fourth group of people who fish who have no idea that any of this is happening. They're people who are maybe English or French is not their first language. They're new to Canada. They're fishing for food security reasons because they probably don't have good, uh, you know, they come from parts of the world where food insecurity is a big issue. And they come here and they think, oh, you know, I can feed my family. Look at all this free food swimming around in here. I'm going to harvest it. I'm going to feed my family and, and my community. And uh, I'm going to be, you know, this is amazing. And, uh, but they have no idea. And if you look at literacy rates in Canada, you know, about you know, 25% of adult Canadians are illiterate, functionally illiterate. And another 25% of, of Canadians have a literacy level that's around grade six, right? So, you know, if you think about 50% of Canadians, that's all, all adult Canadians, not children, uh, are couldn't even, you know, if they read these fish consumption advisories, if they found them on the website, first of all, and they knew how to find them, and they read them, they probably wouldn't understand. Like being functionally illiterate means if you you can read a headline in the newspaper, but if you read the article itself, you couldn't really give a, a clear understanding of what the article is saying. You get the general impression, but you don't really understand the details. That's functional illiteracy. So there are people who don't know, who can access, who aren't able to make sense of it. And that's a sizable chunk of the population. And these are the ones that probably, and I don't want to be stereotyping people, but they're the ones that are, are more likely to be harvesting fish and not just recreational fishing or practicing conservation. They have experienced food and security. They understand what that means. And they see this as a, a bounty that they can, they can harvest and, and address that in their own home and their own community. So there, there's a, we, you know what, I made this up, right? These four groups, you know, I'm just thinking about this. And no one's done surveys. Not that I've ever seen any of these services. Kristen could talk about that. She's doing all this research all the time and writing articles for us. And and uh, but I've never seen a survey. We see surveys about all sorts of other food consumption. Is it safe? You what do people think about these labels? Organic, blah blah blah. But around fish, we we ha we have no idea what people are thinking and who's thinking what, and what the trust level is, what the awareness level is, you would think that would count, right? But I think, honestly, and you know, I'll probably get uh, roasted for this, I think there's a willing uh, sort of not to talk about it because we export this fish to other countries. And when we export fish, it's up to the other countries that take our exports to prove that they're not safe. Yeah, we have the Canadian uh, Food Inspection Agency that's checking, and they, and they they check when they know there's problem fish. They'll check and they'll make sure the, the the contaminant levels are below a certain level before we export them because we know and and it's been pointed out to Canada, so we have to make sure about that. But other things, you know, lots of other chemicals we're not testing for, just the ones we're told to test for, 
And uh, but we don't want to uh, have that those doors slammed shut to our exports. You know, this three hundred fifty million dollar exports of fish to mostly Asia. Uh, we don't want to lose that market. So there's this sort of I think. You know, and there's tourism, right? If we talk about it too much, people will just stop fishing. And that's an $8.5 billion industry, annual industry, that could, you know, be be uh, affected. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yes, I'm sure there'll be, well, maybe we'll start getting comments now on the on the live stream to respond to, to all you brought up. But I, I just wanted to add to say that, you know, I, I have a colleague, and I'm sure she won't mind me mentioning this, who, you know, even when she was doing her PhD herself, her and her partner were unaware of um, fish consumption advisory. So in some cases, it's really, you know, irrespective of people's levels of literacy, it's just an awareness that they're not, you know, that it's just not out there. So, um, Kristen, you haven't had a chance to comment on this. I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure. I'll say a bit, and I think uh, some of what it you know, I might say echoes a little bit with uh, one of Lawrence's last uh, uh, points, but some of, um, I'll kind of two points. And I just want to say first, that I think these ideas also emerged from like, you know, previous collaborations we've had and discussions we've had in this group and um, a paper we've been writing together around um, fish consumption advisories that will be, um, yeah, forthcoming soon on this topic. So um, with respect to thinking about food systems, so I guess, you know, one one gap, and I think you know Lawrence and Abraham both started to speak to this, was around this consideration of you know cultural food practices and FCAs and sort of minimal, I, I think, often consideration of um, you know culture than fish consumption advisories. So um, you know not just within uh, you know the Upper Saint Lawrence, but research more broadly has pointed out that fish consumption advisories often tend to be weak in this respect, right? They tend to provide more sort of universal. Um, dietary advice, you know, sort of like, you know, Canada's food guide or something, right? This kind of universal guide of what we're all sort of, you know, supposed to eat. I mean, that's starting to change a bit, but it often tends, you know, to overlook the, you know, the risks or benefits associated with different eating practices or the, the kind of cultural context in which people are, you know, accessing and eating um, food. Um, so as, you know, as Lawrence just pointed out, there there have been studies in, in the Great Lakes you know, watershed as well that have suggested that, you know, ethnic groups are more likely to keep some of the fish they catch for consumption. Um, but a lot of these, you know, uh, kind of differences, you know, race, social, ec ec uh, ethnic, cultural differences in, in recreational angling, harvesting and uh, consumption practices, you know, tend to remain sort of, you know, un understudied and not often reflected in some of the, you know, consumption guidance in these, uh, you know, in these advisories. So that's sort of one piece, I think, from a kind of a broader food system perspective, thinking about this greater, you know, engagement with cultural eating practices and, and context of, um, of fishers and, and uh, communities. Uh, I guess the second point, um, again, thinking more with respect to sort of governance of food systems, this is something we've spoken a bit about as a, a group, and I know Lawrence and, and Lee have raised this before, is that we can also see sort of, I think, silos and um, policy that we can observe uh, uh, that are operating around, you know, fish consumption advisories. So, uh, for example, you know, fish consumption advisories often don't consider, you know, say for, for you know, recreational anglers, um, you know, fishing management regulations, including how many fish a recreational angler might be legally, you know, allowed to, to keep, right? So this sort of siloing in policy could uh, you know, contribute to advice to eat fish that are low in contaminants, but their catch is, you know, limited, right, by fishing management regulations. So, um, so I think there's opportunities to think about how consumption guidance for anglers could be better aligned with these harvesting um, regulations. And, you know, I realize there's complexities to, to doing this, but again, I think from a kind of a food systems lens, we need to kind of work across these kind of policy um, silos more. Um, I guess the last piece briefly, and I think this really speaks to what uh, Abraham was saying earlier, is just, you know, the, the sort of environmental uh, I guess violence of the of these, uh, you know, in, in Akwesasne and contaminants and so forth and the role that fish consumption advisories play. And I think, um, you know, just I think a lot of this resonates with, uh, you know, perspectives around food sovereignty and the rights of communities to make decisions about their their food systems. Um, and so, you know, if fish consumption advisories aren't developed by or, you know, implemented in partnership with communities, then they can lead to sort of, you know, further disruptions and, and, and losses 
um, you know, including among, um, you know, especially among indigenous communities. And I think many of the discussions that, you know, what, what Abraham shared also resonates um, I think with, you know, emerging movements around and scholarship around indigenous food sovereignty coming from indigenous communities and, you know, scholars and, and activists and print around articulating some of those, those principles of food sovereignty for their, for their communities. Yeah. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Kristen. And you actually got us started on on our you know on the on the next question, which I wanted to go with, which was what we you know what what do we see as opportunities and areas of improvement for the future? And as you said, we have had that conversation between you know, well, are we steering people towards you know fish that have no contaminants? So you know, catch these ones, but actually their stocks are low, you know, or are they? Are there opportunities there for those ministries to talk to each other so that we can have harmonized, you know, licensing with the information about the contamination and how many you can catch? I mean, telling someone they can catch 50 perch and then somewhere else telling them they can only eat four of them might also be, you know, that you have to go and get that those two pieces of information in two different places. And maybe if they could put up be put alongside each other it would be really helpful. So uh, along with that in mind, um, so what do you see as the opportunity areas for improvement for the future? Um, I'll I'll give it back to um, Barry to start us off with with that. And we we don't have much time, Barry. So if you can all give me like a high a hitter, and then I'll I'll go to the questions online, or maybe um, you know I'll I'll hear from the team who from the audience might have questions. But um, yeah, what do you think are the opportunities or area of improvement for the future? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll truncate it because there are many. Uh, but in the high level, I think we've almost touched on the main one, and that is there is some opportunity to provide some, I would suggest, some balance to some of these things. And so, for example, looking at some of the positive or the benefits or the health benefits from fishing, consuming fish, can technically be used almost quantitatively to counteract some of the risks associated with some of the contaminants. Now, that's already been talked about in a variety of these particular um, uh, advisories, but it's mentioned in passing of all of the benefits. And so they're aware of the benefits for consuming fish, the social components, the cultural components, the exercise outside, they have all the beautiful things that we want to see in our environments, but there's no real quantification of it. And so I think moving forward, the biggest opportunity is to have a revamp or at least a, a readdress in terms of what the FCA or fish consumption uh, advice is actually providing. And it should be, I think, in our cases, our opportunities are to provide balanced information. And that is to look at some of the more uh, things that we're glazing over. For example, the benefits associated with the consumption of omega-3, 6, 9 fatty acids and their ability to protect against cardiovascular disease and cancers and things like that. So. Some of these, although are not the exact targets of some of the contaminants in uh, human health or in fish health, they do have uh, contrasting benefits that can be implemented in some kind of quantitative uh, process. Now, I am fully aware of how difficult that is, but we're all, if we work together, we're all fairly bright. I'm sure we can figure out a way to make this benefit everyone. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Barry. Yes, sorry, I know there's lots. Of, and, you know, I'll just monitor the chat. So if we don't get questions in, I, I can give you back the microphone to to um, to expand on all of that. I, I will hand it to Abe next to um, give your give your thoughts, opportunities, areas of improvement going forward. Yeah. And I think for me, I mean, I'm always talking about this no matter what I'm doing, which is to build these deep, meaningful relationships between uh, communities and different organizations. I think that's like really necessary from like the Indigenous perspective, because I think as we start arriving at that deep, meaningful relationship building, we can start addressing the issues of trust, of governance, of um, information, how does it need to be delivered? I think it's through that that process that we can arrive at that. And I think, you know, they, so that, it sounds like the government needs them a lead um, in some respects, um, because like, I think that's what the River Report has, has shown me is like what that could look like and how we could transform the possibilities of our understandings of landscapes and providing that information out to people through these deep, meaningful relationships, which allow us to understand that history of pain and then transform that relationship into something that we can action, like we can make some action around. So that's what I have to contribute. 
Okay, we we do still have, you know, we have 15 minutes still to go, including some some question time. So we don't have to cut you all off too short. And I will, um, I will give everyone a chance uh, to, and I'll come back to you, Abe, if you would like. Um, Lawrence, would you like to give your your thoughts on on what you see as the future opportunities here? Yeah, you know, my dream would be, uh, you know, that we put this into our, our our smartphones, right? And I know not everyone has a smartphone. But, you know, Lee, you touched on something there. You know, we have the, our regulations on which fish can be harvested at what time of year and which ones, you know, what size of which species where you should be able to harvest and which ones have to go back all around conservation, right? And and it used to be we'd get this in a big printed booklet in Ontario, along with fish consumption advisories were also referenced in that same booklet. It was a bit, pretty big magazine, almost the size of a catalog. They took the fish consumption advisories out of that. Uh, book that they printed every year and then they stopped printing them like that i think they were printing maybe fifty thousand a year and they disappear pretty quick and then now it's just you look it up online because they figure everyone has the way to look it up online so why why can't we have geospatial information delivered to us on the shore on the water so when we show up on the shore when we show up in a place and if we move around we would say okay this is an area this is a uh, maybe it's a, a sanctuary so we don't fish here now we are outside the sanctuary we can fish here and these are the kinds of fish we can harvest in this area and these are the ones that are the seasons are closed and then these seasons are open for this species and here's the limits of the fish in this area of a certain species that we're allowed to keep and which ones we have to put back. And, and, and by the way, here's the consumption advisories when we make those decisions on whether or not to keep those fish. So we don't bring home, you know, fish needlessly and find out later that we've been eating or we brought home and harvested fish that aren't safe to eat by our family members. This is all sort of geospatial information that can totally be delivered to our smartphones in a, in a real-time way if someone just took the time to do it. And it, what I'm noticing is we're going in the other direction. Okay. Lauren, so you're talking about, I'm, I'm imagining an app on my phone that says, it's called, can I eat this fish? And and I pull a fish out and I take a picture of it. And then the app goes, oh, wow, you caught a yellow perch. It's this long. Uh, you can eat the whole thing. You can share it with your family. Or it says, you know, um, yeah. let's put that one back in the river and let's, let's you know, move on to another area because that's not a fish to eat. I mean, that that sounds like we definitely have the tech these days, right? You can put oh, yeah. your phone up to almost anything to ID it. Um, yeah. Is that what you're thinking? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like fishing apps are really popular amongst young people now, right? We have we have a, a company in Canada that makes Anglers Atlas and they make the MyCatch app and it, they're gathering data that's helping researchers understand fish health and fish quantity and uh, across Canada and in specific areas. And, and, and it's also being used for competition, right? So you can have on these online competitions, you can share information with your friends about your catches. You can, you can tell people where you caught the fish if you so choose or not. You know, we have um, the fish health, um, the fish health uh, app that CFIA helped create. So it tells you if you catch a fish that looks weird or you see dead fish, you can take pictures of it and it's turned in as shared with veterinarians who have specialized knowledge in fish health in your specific province. And they'll look at that fish and they'll decide if we have to do a deeper investigation into this, you know, so we're having, you know, all these apps being made by different people. We know people use them. Some choose to, some don't, but it it can be done. And we know it can be done. We know people will use them. It's it just a matter of a will to do it. And again, why aren't we doing this? You know, and it comes down to legal responsibility. If if we have a governments that are gathering this knowledge and and they understand the significance of this knowledge to to the health of the fish and to the health of the people who are choosing to eat the fish, don't they have an obligation to share that knowledge in ways that, you know, are meaningful, not just make a lip service, you know, by putting it on a website somewhere. And, and if you stumble across it, you, just, you know, so be it. And if you don't, oh, well, they made an effort. I, I don't think that's enough. 
Lawrence, I think you, yeah, those are really important points. And I, I guess for the agencies that are putting all the information together, it's it's a huge effort, you know, just to get the data into one spot. And <laughs> and so maybe we need to make an effort, like you know, as as nonprofits ourselves, to to help mobilize that that knowledge. But I agree that it could be done in a more user friendly way. And I I I just was I just stopped for a second and thought, well, there might be someone in the community who had logged on to this panel discussion because they actually wanted to know, you know, where they could get this information from and not hear all the complications that we've brought up today around it. So I just wanted to ask the panelists, does someone want to make a recommendation to anyone who might be watching this panel to say, okay, that's great. You're talking about, you know, future things that we want um, to do you know, that we uh, we think need to be done. But if you're catching a fish today on the St. Lawrence River, who wants to put out there where you would like to direct them if they wanted to get some information today? Any of you? Any so for myself, I recommend using um, the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Fish Consumption Guideline for people in Aquazasna. I mean, it has its flaws and, you know, whatnot, but I feel like it has more, it has more fish on there than is on the other fish advisories around us. And that for us is really important because there's certain fish that only we can gather um, as Aquas Oslono. My one concern about that is it's, it can be a little difficult to find online. Um, you can go to the tribe to pick one up. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's a easy, easily accessible piece, right? Um, I remember a couple of times I was trying to look for it and then, you know, you end up finding it on New York States. Um, you got a couple of clicks and whatnot. And I always like think about that adage, like if you got to do more than three clicks, nobody's going to find it. Um, and so like thinking about those pieces, can people, do people know the name of it? Like, but, but that's what I recommend for my people to go look for in here in Aquazosna. And I think that provides really good guidance. Okay. Thank you, Abe. That's great. I'm going to just refer to the comments. So Lexi has said that super insightful learns accessible science is so important. And then Sandra Lorne has also um, put something in the chat here. She says, having random thoughts, Lancaster fish rolls, traditions for decades, considered a delicacy in the Cornwall area. Um, are there any careful studies, so cultural components, the area of concern, the impact, et cetera? So, I mean, I, I heard this a lot from the community, too, when I was engaging with them. You know, I was told about how blank as the perch rolls were just the thing to eat even in New York City. You know, people wanted to get perch that came from Lake St. Francis. Um, and, yeah, I think that the there's a lot of... Um, the, there's there's a lot of questions around you know was it all fine then and and let's assume it was and and how long have we known how contaminated it is and we know there was a height of contamination before and that things have improved at least in this part of the river um does anyone want to comment on on any of that the delicacy that now is not is no longer really thought of in the same way i i got a comment to make i i know the river institute did some research on you know can you test fish in one part of the St. Lawrence River and identify their le level of contaminants based on their proximity to these areas of concern and then go to the other parts of the river and find the same fish population, the same species, and identify them as having lower levels of contamination because they're inhabiting a different part of the river away from that area of concern. And what they found was, you know, you catch 10 walleye and two will be contaminated and eight won't. And it didn't really matter where you were. They move around. So it's problematic in that sense. You know, we have to, there is mistrust for sure in, in, in these fish consumption advisories because they're not that accurate. And that's why you have these differentiations between, you know, in the New York state, they'll just say, you can't eat that. And that's often the case. And I think it's because on the American side, they're more litigious, right? They're more concerned with being sued because people sue more often in the United States. And in Canada, we're more passive and and more laissez-faire. But I, th I think it's problematic, right? It, we're not, we're not, it's not a perfect science. And as my friend would say, Jack Johnson, you know, who's who works with Toxic at Great Lakes, we shouldn't even have these. There shouldn't even be a need for fish consumption advisories. It's a Band-Aid on a rotten situation that's been allowed to develop over industrialization. And it's not, you know, we're cleaning up 
but we're also at the same time still making it worse with other chemicals like these forever chemicals so we can't rely on fish consumption advisories we should just have fish that are safe to eat that should be the norm these fish consumption advisories they should go away we should work towards their going away Thank you, Lawrence. I think that, yeah, okay. I, you, you wouldn't have been able to, no one would be able to see, but Abe was cheering you on for everything that you were saying, <laughs> which is really nice to be here in the panel and see that. And Kristen, I never gave you the opportunity to answer that final question on what you see as the opportunity areas of improvement for the future. So if you, we've still got a couple of minutes if you'd like to comment yeah, on that. So really briefly, and I think that's such an important point that Lawrence made and sort of wanted to, you know, to almost kind of conclude with, right, this fact that you know, fish consumption advisories shouldn't be a permanent solution, right? So preventing, reducing contaminants. Um, you know, Abraham also often talks, you know, talks about, you know, the associated harm reduction in communities that are affected by these really need to be priorities. Um, so I guess just four really short points in terms of, you know, where we're going. So, you know, in transboundary contexts like, you know, the Upper St. Lawrence River, so thinking about more kind of integrative, transparent, shared approaches to monitoring contaminant levels, fish species, putting together these advisories. Um, you know, more engagement with cultural food practices, including um, enhanced outreach to, you know, angler populations, as Lawrence was talking about, and including increasingly more diverse angling populations, um, and upholding the, the self-determination of Indigenous communities with respect to how these advisories are affecting their communities, how they're implemented and um, developed. Thank you, Kristen. I'm going to open the floor here to my panelists. Has anyone got anything that they wanted to say that I haven't given you the opportunity to comment on? So I just want to say something about perch. And honestly, this was like my initial like thing that I thought about when we were writing the perch paper. Um, was what I thought about was like perch in my life, right? And how I remember catching perch. Like those were the first fish that I would catch. Perch and sunfish off a rock behind sweet grass in Akwazasne or off a dock somewhere. And they were, they were abundant, right? They were everywhere. And then, you know, how growing up, like places we would go to get perch was Harry King's. And a perch roll is like super expensive now. <laughs> um, you know, and I thought about those stories about our connections to perch in that way. And then learning about perch through our analysis, through what we understood, how, you know, the perch paper and the perch research that we did help us understand like how perch levels have changed across this ecosystem and the, and the importance of that relationship. But ultimately, too, I do think about like what is the implication on my body? Um, like what is that going to mean accumulating those things? And I just kind of wanted to add one more thing, sort of thinking about what Lawrence and what we've all been talking about, too, is I think a lot of these fish advisories are based on risk assessments, which is this larger field of research within expo like a part of exposure science that contributes to this understanding of how much we consume and how dangerous chemicals are. And that that field right now is in this, this moment of transformation where they're starting to think more comprehensively, like what Barry was talking about with, um, you know, thinking about fish more like with from the nutritional benefit right and the implications of that but from a comprehensive analysis also that there's socio um circumstances that can implicate us and introduce more violence that stress is a part of one of the contributing factors of our disease package that we have and so like looking at that more holistically right that you know the removal of fish from our from our food diet has these more cascading impacts and it can make us more um, susceptible to other comorbidities out there in the world and so like being more expansive in our understand that as, of those things is really important for me to think about and and that relationship and that like science is catching up right and science is constantly growing and changing and learning and that's kind of what I feel like sometimes is lost in this conversation is the empirical elements of the conduction of science and our objectivity that we're supposed to have removes that humanness from it and the exclusivity around it. And I think that's what we're all we're all challenged with right now is to open those doors. So that that was just something I wanted to add based off those like those uh, being inspired by Kristen and everyone here. Thank you so much, Abe. Anybody else got any sort of passing thoughts before we close out the, the panel discussion today? Are we good? Lawrence, you've unmuted yourself. Shall I let you have the last word? <laughs> oh, I just want to say to Abe, you know, 
I mean, I have some friends, you know, that we share in common and, and, um, and I hear stories about the history of your, the Mohawks of, along the river and their connection. And it just saddens me so much that, you know, several generations had been forced to sort of turn their back on the, on the fish of the river and, and, and a big part of their, your culture. And it's, and it's not your doing. And, um, it's another, you know, act of, um, uh, aggression, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's, it's tragic. And I, and, and we need to work on that to make that a, a, an issue of reconciliation as well, because, you know, to force you to leave a big chunk of your culture by abandoning the consumption of fish and the struggle you're facing eh, to get people to start eating fish again, because it is so healthy. If you pick the right ones, it's so good for you. And we all know that, right? I mean, when I started Bluefish Canada and I mentioned the name of the organization to my father, he said, Lawrence, he said, that's a bad name. I said, why? And he goes, well, you're talking about fish and most people don't even like to eat fish because they don't like the taste of it. You know, it's, and it really, you know, 10 years ago, it's, and it still applies today. Try to get kids to eat fish, right? It's not easy to do, but we do it because it's good for you. And, and it should be, I mean, it goes way back in history, eating fish, right? It's, it's such a big part. And that's why. We have pescatarians, you know, we make an exception for people who are vegetarians who eat fish. We call them pescatarians because we know it's good for you. And we see fish as a food and they are animals. They are animals, but they're still, we see them as a food. And, and that's what I always go back to saying too, like, hey, they are animals still though. And we need to respect these animals and make sure they can live in a world of water that doesn't stress the crap out of them or turn the male fishes into female fishes which is what we're seeing or 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 make the fish you know unresponsive because of different pharmaceuticals in the water you know antidepressants and 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 hormones and things like that i mean we're altering their habitat in crazy ways that if we did that to deer and rabbits and bears on land people would be outraged but what's happening underwater out of sight you know is just unacceptable. Lawrence, thank you for that, for finishing on that note. I think it's really, it's really good, you know, to remind people about the, the health of the fish in and of itself. Um, but then also that, yeah, it, it is good for us. And we just need to understand what, what we can and can't do and still have a healthy, you know, have healthy bodies ourselves. And a healthier environment will have healthier fish in it. So we all uh, we all know we want to strive towards that. So I'm going to say a big thank you to everyone on the panel today for joining me for this conversation. Um, as we've alluded to a few times today, we've had many conversations between us. And it's nice to share a bit of that of those conversations with the public, which is what we wanted to do today. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we're going to take a, a break and be back. I think it'll be in 15 minutes. So thank you very much.
online event. And um, we have this session on rivers, people, and culture. And um, we have three presenters. We'll be starting with um, Lawrence and Althea. And they'll be talking on shaping the next generation of conservation-minded anglers. Um, I would give the floor now to Lawrence and Althea for the uh, presentation. For those online, um, you'll be able to ask your questions after the whole presentation. You can tag um, each of the presenters, or you can just ask your questions. Then I would um, relay the questions to the presenters, and then they can um, answer your questions. So um, the floor is yours now, Lawrence and Althea. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, please, if you guys have some comments uh, or questions, just uh, uh, write them down and we'll make sure we can get to them as much as possible. If not, send us an email. You can reach me at director at bluefishcanada.ca. So we founded Bluefish Canada uh, just over 10 years ago. It's to give uh, anglers more information about conservation and stewardship and responsibility and to inspire them to become citizen science because you know we felt that there was um a lot of emphasis was uh, placed on just fishing and catching fish and catching big fish and catching many fish and we see that you know that was sort of passed down through the generations but you know i think about my own life and uh, and my father when he taught me to fish it was just so oh, catch catch fish and bring them home and eat them that was that was it, it was pretty simple and that's the way it had been for many 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 thousands of years right you go to catch fish and to bring fish home and to eat the fish and then it, we started to moderate that because we realized conservation was an issue and if we all did that you know and we didn't really track that we still don't really track recreational fishing the number of fish being harvested we we don't know that information well we have some you know on some lakes we do creel surveys but it's not that much so we really have to make sure people who embrace fishing also embrace the responsibility of knowing when enough is enough, uh, knowing when to report things that are going on, taking part in, in fisheries research as citizen scientists, and, uh, and, and making sure we leave it better than we find it, right? And that's what Bluefish Canada, we're about, you know, blue, the water, water quality, fish, and fish health, and connecting young people to uh, to nature through fishing and this it, you know for uh, past quite a number of years the amount of people who fish has been sort of dropping off as as people people age out you know as you get older you, you get back issues knee issues you, you you just don't you know you don't have it's too painful to go fishing and to do outdoor activities so the number of the baby boomers, you know, are, are starting to age out of fishing and young people weren't going into fishing so much, but that started shifting a lot with COVID as we look for things to do that were safe in the outdoors. And, and also with environmental uh, concerns, people wanted to get more involved with nature and, and forage and things like that in, in, in the outdoors and connect with nature and, and, and do things that could help nature and to preserve nature for future generations. And, um, so we, we have a program called Get Ready for Fishing. And uh, Altea was one of our uh, guides this past summer. And, you know, we also partner with water rangers this year. So we were able to bring in water testing into the uh, into the project. And uh, this is something, you know, all anglers do. They they look at the water, they, they stick their finger in the water, they smell the water, you know, uh, it, it, they take the temperature of the water but they're very curious about the water and because you know you could be one day and you're catching fish and the next day you show up and things have changed and you're not catching fish and you're trying to figure out what happened i'll tell you why don't you talk about water quality uh, we we had some good fun with this for sure this past summer oh uh, yes thank you so for water quality and fish health bluefish has really been focusing on educating the youth and giving them opportunities to try out like water testing kits and uh, feeling and seeing the importance of freshwater um, health and how that affects both fish and people and how it's all linked together. So by giving them real experiences with the help from water rangers, we've been able to check uh, water conducti conductivity, temperature, the pH level, and how that all has effects on fish health. 
there's a really good uh, like article that they've wrote with um, mentions to Bluefish on the Water Rangers website. So you guys should go check that out for some really interesting information, uh, better knowledge on each of the things I mentioned. There's some information about what some stuff Bluefish has done and the overall importance of testing water quality, fish health, and increasing awareness is big steps toward working together with nature, being aware and collaborating to have healthy environments for both anglers and fish and all together good togetherness. <laughs> for, for sure, Altea, thank you so much. I mean, you know, we teach young people two things really, is if you're gonna catch fish, you have to make sure, you know, in conservation uh, that you, you know how to release those fish as well. And uh, that's so important that you understand how to handle fish, how to make sure they go back healthy, that you're using the right equipment, you're unhooking the right way, you're using the right hooks, you're using the right kind of, you know, non-lead lures and uh, sinkers and so on for the environment as well to protect our loons and other aquatic birds and birds of prey. And, uh, you know, understanding all that stuff to make sure, you know, so yeah, we're letting the big breeders go. Yeah, we're letting the juvenile fish go. Yeah, we're ke keeping a couple mid-sized fish of a certain species to have a meal and to share the family and to celebrate our day on the water and uh, to to be foragers and and practice that that activity of foraging, which is goes back you know thousands and thousands and thousands of years we've been doing this, and uh, and you know fish still count as a main source of protein for over a billion people on the earth. It, it, they still count on fish as their main source of protein. So it's 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 a connection. And some may argue it's the last real connection that people have with with wild grown food, you know, that that this is our connection to nature. And we're concerned that if we stop eating fish, if we stop going into nature to find fish and understand fish and and look at the habitat the fish are living in and and make sure that that habitat is doing well and provide you know act provide that stewardship sort of oversight if we stop all that and we stop eating fish and we stop fishing then that is our last real connection for many many people with the natural environment and once we disconnect from nature we'll start to make those decisions more easily about, you know, balancing economy and an environment, right? And we'll think oh, about our, our, own, our own wallets. And we'll say, well, we, we want a job. We, we want to have uh, cheap food. We want to have uh, cheap fuel and, and um, you know, homes that are heated and light, lit. And, uh, and if the environment has to take a second, you know, backseat to that, you know, we'll make those decisions more likely. So it, we really believe that, you know, young people understand this. Young people understand that we are impacting the environment and young people want to find ways to maintain their connection with the environment through fishing, through um, this act of this traditional act in ways that are sustainable and in, in ways that are responsible and, and to contribute to make sure we leave it better than we find it. So if you want to learn more about that, visit bluefishcanada.ca. We have, uh, under resources, we have a ton of material. Visit our YouTube channel. Follow us on our podcast, The Bluefish Radio Show. Comes out every couple of weeks, and we have great uh, interviews with people who are doing amazing things uh, for the future of fish and fishing. And, and sign up for our newsletter, The Bluefish Newsletter. Comes out every couple of weeks. There's a guest editorial article in there. Lots of links to current issues affecting fish, fishing, uh, fish habitat. Uh, all the things you want, could think about in terms of fish and fishing, it's in the newsletter. Uh, it's long, but no one's ever complained about it being too long. It's amazing. <laughs> so there you go. Lots of information. Bluefishcanada.ca. Thanks, everyone. We have a tiny bit more time. Did you want to talk about the Bluefish Exploration Center a bit? Yeah, hey, that's a good. Uh, thanks, Altea. Yeah. So, look, we've been collaborating with organizations, um, you know, Water Rangers, Earth Rangers, Watersheds Canada, uh, you know, uh, lots of organizations you know, that are interested in the environment and water quality. Uh, the Canadian Environmental Law Association, 
we chair the Great Lakes Fish Health Network, but we we never had a place where we could actually, you know, study and and do long term research and and bring people and and give them really in depth uh, instruction. Well, now we do. We we managed to get a piece of property. It's seven acres on a beautiful lake, uh, thirteen hundred feet of shoreline. It's got a seventeen hundred square foot cabin, all nestled under beautiful giant white pine trees, uh, gorgeous forest, uh, a, a beautiful waterfront with uh, all, mostly all natural. And we're sandwiched between a, a fishing lodge that was set up in 1906 and a First Nations community. So we have traditional knowledge and local knowledge, and we're bringing the science. We're, the research station's being modified to provide accommodation for people who want to do long-term fisheries research. And we'll be bringing young people up as well. People of all backgrounds and abilities. I'm blind myself. And to me, making something that's uh, per, you know fully accessible for all people of all abilities is so important. So we'll be having some beautiful uh, glamping canvas wall tents with cots set up under the trees for young people to stay in with their families or with their leaders. Uh, we'll have uh, boats and, and access uh, with side-by-sides to other other lakes and rivers to explore the bluefish exploration center is located just a couple hours north of ottawa and we see it as a base camp to allow you to explore into the wilderness uh, we are in the wilderness we have no electricity we have no cell phone connectivity uh, maybe at some point we'll have some starlink and we will have some you know we'll be making our own electricity but it is off-grid uh, situation and we have black skies at night so there's no ambient light so you can stargaze and we have complete silence uh, during the day and at night as well it's just amazing just um, love it up there all right thank you for listening <laughs> thanks you guys thanks Altea. thank you very much Lawrence and Althea that's very very insightful and um you are doing a very great work and um I mean, hopefully it's going to grow bigger and bigger. Um, we'll move to the next speaker without um, wasting time. Um, that's Lauren Michael. He's going to speak on indigenous sovereignties, settler science, and a river resisting borders. Um, the floor is now yours, Lauren Michael. Thank you all. And I know I only have 12 minutes, but I want to make sure that I set aside at least one maybe more of that time to dwell in a space of gratitude. I want to give thanks to the Aquasas Lono, first and foremost, for hosting us physically and virtually in their territory, as well as their relatives at Gonawage, Ganasatage, and really all of the indigenous caretakers and knowledge holders who have joined us in this uh, momentous symposium. I also want to give thanks to the animals. I want to thank the eels and I want to thank the yellow perch who gave their bodies, who gave their geo coordinates, who have given us so much knowledge, even through their suffering. So we can come together as scientists, as historians, as community practitioners to think about better ways to be better caretakers of Gunya de Lawana, the great river. And so I do give thanks to them. And I'm especially grateful to the incredible panelists who have taught me so much these last two days, have challenged me, broadened my consciousness. And I hope I can reciprocate those gifts of knowledge by not just giving a history lesson, but bringing that knowledge in conversation with you. In academia, we tend to think of history as analysis of the past, analysis of change over time, but I'm grateful to Ganyankahaga teachers like Ahunde Horn Miller, who reminds me that for Akosas Lono, history is an active process about making it alive, making knowledge alive in the minds of the people. And I hope that being in conversation with you today continues that process as we realize that conversations about water levels and droughts and climatic cycles and community engagement, they're not new. That being on the river, being part of this diverse community that calls the river home, either in person or even at a distance, uh, 
are continuing conversations that predate us. And if we do our work right, we'll continue uh, well into the future. And finally, I really want to thank Mackenzie, Aaron, and everyone from the River Institute who's made this possible. If all of this seems like a well-oiled machine, it's because of the conscientious efforts to be in communication with panelists, to make the format very clear, um, and also to solve a lot of logistical problems from behind the scenes. And so I'm grateful that I can speak to you today from Atlanta, Georgia, from the ancestral homelands of the Muscogee Creek people. And... I'm especially moved at the opportunity to speak with you today because at Emory University, where I am, we have the opportunity and the, the pleasure of welcoming the Muscogee people home today. Uh, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative is hosting the Muscogee Teach-In. And the conversations that we've been having in this symposium about being better caretakers of the water, what it means to welcome, uh, to remedy rather than re-traumatize our ongoing here with the Muscogee people. And so the knowledge you've brought is nourishing these conversations and healing waterways far beyond Ganya de la Juana. And so my talk today takes us back a few hundred years, a blink of the eye, um, you know, for Aquas Oslono, but perhaps uh, a great deal of distance for scientists or folks uh, who tend not to think on you know, orders of magnitudes of hundreds or even thousands of years. And this is a map of uh, what I might think of as Aquasasne and, and present-day Cornwall Island. This is a map done in the 19th century, a map that largely erases the indigenous presence, a map from a moment in time when both the United States and Canada were invested in transforming this river, transforming the space uh, from what we might think of as the Great River, into what one panelist described as, as Highway H2O. Uh, this has been a dream of colonizers since the 1690s. It has been ongoing. And that process of opening up Ganya de la Juana to mercantile shipping, I want to contend, uh, violates one of the oldest and most enduring treaty relationships we as non-natives have uh, with the, our um, indigenous neighbors, and that is Gaswenta, or the two-row principle. Now, Darren Bonaparte and other knowledge holders at Aquasasne can tell this story much better than I can, but as non-natives, we are obliged to comply with these laws, even if we are not made aware of them in our settler education system. And other scholars have talked about Gaswenta as a framework for doing respectful engagement uh, and community-engaged knowledge as a way of thinking about our obligations to care for shared spaces. And in a nutshell, very basically, we see those two uh, parallel paths uh, on this white river of peace. Uh, one represents uh, indigenous peoples in their canoe. Uh, others represent settlers in their ships. We share this river. Sometimes our vessels are linked together. But fundamentally, we each have the right and autonomy to pursue our own self-determined paths, recognizing we're on the shared river of peace together. And I think, right, we think about there's, and there's, we can spend months, years sort of unpacking all of this, but fundamentally, from these questions of ecological uh, decline of fish populations, of industrialization, it really comes down to this process of, of colonizing Ganya de Luana and opening it up to the ship. At a time when, from most of this river's history, there were spaces, still are spaces, that are only accessible via canoe. I look at the Long Sioux Rapids, where those dams are now. Space is only accessible, not just by native boatmen and the skill and knowledge they have with the river and that knowledge of how to shoot those rapids, but also uh, a way of being. And so this is really about thinking about what happens when the ship is going where the ship is not supposed to be. And what can we learn? How have non-natives learned from knowledge that comes, that can only come from the canoe or perhaps in today's parlance, uh, the pontoon boat? The relationship is there. Uh, the river is there, even though the watercraft have, have changed over time. And so as we go back, I want to go back to the year 1816 to 1818. This is right after the War of 1812, very much a civil war. Aquasasne, Ganawage, Ganasatage are, are, are sovereign actors in this conflict. 
and their homeland becomes a war zone. And Akwesasne in particular has to confront both the horrors and pain and grief of a civil war, as well as invasion of their homelands. So war is dividing this community, damaging the land. Civil strife continues long after the armies have gone home. And when that war ends half a world away in Ghent, the Treaty of Ghent does a couple of things. The Treaty of Ghent restores all the territory that the British and the United States have, have, have taken from each other. So it sets the clock back to 1812. But what it also does is it recognizes indigenous sovereignty within a body of international law. You know, one speaker talked about we're, we're living the failure of conventional legal theory. Well, that's a recent failure because in the 19th century, there's a recognition that indigenous peoples are sovereign members of a global community of nation. That when this war ends, not only does, you know, Toronto and, and all these territories have to get given back, but indigenous nations have uh, the right to their possessions, privileges that they may have enjoyed before the war. And that meant free border crossing. There is no border through these territories. Their land is sovereign and inviolable and contiguous. And as much as settler nations have tried to abrogate these various treaties, I would contend the Treaty of Ghent, um, you know, if, if you want to abrogate Article 9, then, you know, what does that mean for settler nations? Do we abrogate the whole treaty and, and start ceding swashes of territory back to the United States and Canada? The absurdity of that proposition um, underscores the absurdity of ignoring uh, the centrality of indigenous sovereignty in a global community of nations that largely predates the 2007 United Nations uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So there's the treaty. It's signed by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, who takes a keen interest in Akwesasne, because he realizes that borders and border disputes are a way that large nations like the Brit Great Britain and the United States can get pulled into these world wars. So what he says is, well, wait a second, let's, let's innovate something. Let's have these small boundary commissioners, these small commissions that look at different segments of the border. And they're going to team up with scientists. They're going to, we're going to have an American commission. We're going to have a British commission and we're going to work together. And instead of drawing one gigantic line on a map, we're going to figure out where this border is and, 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 and figure out, you know, what is the limits of our, of our national sovereignty. And of course, one of those places where the keystone of where these borders comes together is Akwesasne Mohawk territory. The border runs through Ganya de Luana in perfectly. And then makes a hard turn on the 45th parallel, slicing through Akwesasne Mohawk territory. Now, again, for Akwesasne, that border is not there. But for settlers, that border begins to have some consequences. And so it's agreed that maybe because the British and the United States don't like each other, that maybe Akwesasne Mohawk territory is a good place to base these boundary surveys because this is neutral native territory, because this is a third space of sovereignty. So without this sovereign native space, you, you these settler nations cannot begin to carve up their own national borders, right? Indigenous sovereignty necessarily facilitates uh, the later uh, claims of sovereignty that settler nations claim. And it also reminds us that from, from time, you know, from, from the pre-contact era through the present day, Ganya de Luana has always been a river of treaties and, and negotiation. And, you know, we can read the news today about uh, the deleterious effects of climate change. In Akwesasne Mohawk territory, the scenes of wildfires and, and wildly fluctuating water levels wouldn't be unfamiliar, especially in the years 1818, 1816, 1817, 1818. Um, the year without a summer was kind of a misnomer because you had snow in June destroying crops, uh, followed by uh, sweltering droughts in the fall. You had years of successive crop failures. You had water levels that left older dams high and dry. The Adirondacks were on fire. So people were taking notice. And it wasn't just scientists who were really keen to begin working with native interlocutors to understand climate science. You're having whole communities think about what does it mean to be connected to this ecosystem and what are our obligations to each other. Uh, one of the most famous out, uh, you know, intellectual products of this time is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. 
You know, what are these unintended consequences of a world we hardly understand? And I think we could think of the organic machine that is the Seaway, and really a manifestation of this Frankenstein monster born in this era of what some scholars have called romantic science. Now, one of those scientists is a man named Joseph Ludwig Turks. Many scientists will come to Aquasasne, but Turks does things a little bit different. He is coming. He doesn't have any stake in where the boundary is going to be. He doesn't care about territorial disputes. He does care a great deal about respectful engagement with Native knowledge holders. He is sent by the Royal Society of London because science is high politics, and Turks is one of the best astronomers in the world. We'll get to why astronomy matters in a minute. On his way over, he tries to learn Ganyankahaga, the Mohawk language. When he arrives at Akwesasne, he doesn't really take too much interest in, in the drinking and the partying that many of the American or the boundary uh, surveyors are interested in. He wants to make friends in the community. I mean, authentically make friends. One of those people's name is Thomas Tachite. Thomas Tachite becomes a chief... Um, in Aquasasne uh, Mohawk territory. This is a community riven by factions and Thomas uh, belongs to a neutral faction. They weren't interested in the colonizers war. They were interested in taking care of their home. And over the you know several months that Turk spends in the community, he gets to know Thomas. They, they talk about astronomy together. They're doing math together. They um, hang out in each other's house. His wife makes, uh, he buys a pair of moccasins uh, that he then sends home to his mom because, uh, you know, you always go to the gift shop, first rule of the cultural center and support local artists. And more importantly, he's helping out with housework. He's helping out um, with, with, with maple sugaring. And as a consequence, unlike the other scientists, the Aquasas Lono, especially the aunties and clan mothers are very generous in the knowledge they share about their community, not just its history, but the natural cycles of the rise and fall of the river, the flows of fish, right? That he's engaging in a knowledge economy predicated on hospitality and, and understanding your obligations of being a good guest. Now, Turks has a very important mission because Turks has to find where the 45th parallel is, where this international boundary is. Now, in the Age of Enlightenment, when Benjamin Franklin and others carve out American borders in 1783, most people thought the Earth was a perfect sphere. Very logical. And of course, the 45th parallel being the median line between the North Pole and the South Pole seemed like a very uh, rational place to put a boundary. The Earth begs to disagree. Uh, by the early 19th century, scientists are realizing that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. She is uh, very curvy. She's an oblate spheroid. And that means that 45th parallel on the ground might not be where people think it is. It could be 10 miles to the north or 10 miles to the south. And this has big re repercussions because the British, if they survey this boundary and it turns out that the 45th parallel uh, leaves Gunya de Luana in purportedly American territory, they're not going to invest money in putting in those canals and putting in that infrastructure that would open it up to the ship. On the other hand, the United States is always interested in gaining more land. Church doesn't care about this. He just wants to figure out where this line of latitude is for the sake of understanding how do we as humans fit into this world that's much more complicated and curvy than we thought. And so his method involves stargazing. And he and other Aquasas Lono do what many Aquasas Lono do tonight, and they look at that gorgeous night sky and they go hunting for bears. In this case, it's Ursa Minor, the, the little bear. Because they figure out that depending on your position, not just where you are in the earth or where you are in relationship to the sky, can tell you exactly where you are in the universe. And so he's figured out the equations to locate that 45th parallel with scientific precision. The problem is, is that it gets very cloudy and very cold, <laughs> uh, especially at night. Um, and so he doesn't always have opportunities to do this. And so um, most of the time he's hanging out with Aquasas Lono. They're talking about science. They're telling stories, talking about the river. And he uses the land and, and this uh, landscape as a way uh, to, again, build a healthy relationships. On the other side, there's a cartographer named David Thompson. 
Uh, David Thompson is, uh, you know, his travels across the continent with his uh, Cree uh, partner uh, make Lewis and Clark uh, look like um, little rascals in terms of the knowledge he gains. He's one of the best cartographers in the world at this time. And the maps he produces of Akwesasne kind of give us this impression of a harmonious um, landscape as seen from above. But in reality, he has to rely on that canoe knowledge to navigate these spaces, to produce these high resolution images. We can see clearances in what is now Cornwall. A lot of that is, you know, these are farm fields, but a lot of that was because the Royal Navy came in and cut those trees down to build warships. We can see St. Regis and we can see where Thompson thinks the boundary is. Of course, Akwesas and Mono are living throughout this territory. So Thompson's map erases as much as it makes uh, visible. And we could also see that projected, um, you know, where the boundary is and where Thompson, uh, you know, thinks the 45th parallel is and where scientists now know where the 45th parallel is, show that this process of mapping and making native space legible doesn't always lend itself to uh, public policy solutions that fit with these tidy categories that academics create. And so I want to be mindful of time. Um, we can see on, on Thompson's map a couple of things. There's an American camp on St. Regis Island. There's a British camp on St. Regis Island. Each of them are taking their, their, their surveys and they're, and they're collecting data. These camps are far apart. What this map doesn't show are the native tombs that are being raided and ransacked by the American scientists. The ancestors that are being stolen and this indigenous presence being erased from this island. So there is scientific violence being perpetrated by some, not all, of uh, the guests involved in the survey. And when, as it often is, the night didn't lend itself to the taking of these uh, astronomical readings, Turks is often gathering with members of the community to do science. He builds a generator. And they test it out in Father Marco's uh, rectory, still there to this day. And Aquas Lono, you know, they're 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 not bedazzled by this scientific magic. They're interested. They have a conversation. Okay, what is this word electricity? How does this translate into the Mohawk language? Maybe you know the word thunderer works. So they're having a conversation about language. They're unpacking this knowledge. But then the elders say, "Look, you know, this is an interesting machine, but we've been having droughts for three years." Can you use this to bring the rains back? If it's going to thunder, you know, and make lightning, can this help us take care of our gardens? This is not far-fetched. As people around the world are thinking about ways these new machines and ways that are fantastical and very practical can make life better for the community. It's the same way that traditional knowledge holders and community members are thinking about how can geotagging, you know, not so much tell us where the fish are, but how can it help us feed our community better? And so I'll conclude with, uh, you know, Turks leaves the community as the boundary survey moves on, but the relationship continues. He continues to host Aquasas Lono uh, in his home in London as they assert their sovereignty in an international community of nations. He represents this moment in time, uh, really before the word scientist emerges, when traditional ecological knowledge and academic science haven't had this acrimonious divorce and, and have been placed into these colonial silos, the way that relationships can produce better knowledge about the land. Uh, Turks's data was good, but because boundaries are a political process, that data was rejected. And the boundary remains open until 1842. And this is really very important because uh, Aquasas Lono are able to exploit the ongoing tensions between the British and the United States to avoid and survive and portage around some of the most aggressive and genocidal actions of the United States government during the, quote, Indian of Era removal. So that open border, that river that defied borders, helps us understand why we are able to gather with and community with Aquasas Lono today. And in the end, it was this historian, not a scientist, who found that border. They found Ben Franklin's red line map. Um, the commissioners in 1842 just said, let's turn it back to 1783. And that's where the border purportedly is today for non-natives. But as we've seen, provincial boundaries, state boundaries, the fish, the waters, the animals, 
they don't think that way. They don't live in this world of borders. And as we come together, as we gather to respectfully engage each other and indigenous knowledge holders, we could imagine Ganya de la Juana unbound in the future without borders. Now what? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Lauren Michael, for the wonderful talk. Um, would we'll move straight ahead to the last speaker, and that's um, Sarah, Amber, and Laura. And then they will be talking on confluency, framing and reframing water rights as an intersectional social justice issue through an interactive mobile heart exhibit in Canada and South Africa. Up the floor is now yours, Sarah. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um... I'm presenting on behalf of Sarah. Um, I'm Amber Abrams. I'm the second presenter in the group, and I'll just launch right in because I know we're a little tight on time. So Confluency um, is an exhibit, and I'll explain a bit more about it, but the effort here was reframing water rights as an intersectional social justice issue through an interactive mobile art exhibit in Canada and South Africa. So in early 2018, um, Cape Town took center stage as an international focal point for the global water crisis, when this major city nearly became the first in the world to run out of water. This catastrophic climate event brought issues of water injustice to the fore against the backdrop of racial, economic, and land injustice from the country's apartheid history. Surfacing how issues of water scarcity intersect with other pressing issues such as health disparities, food insecurity, and gender inequality. Meanwhile, um, places uh, with an abundance of fresh water such as Canada continue to grapple with issues around water quality due to a similar history of colonialism, land dispossession, and legacies of poor water infrastructure with marginalized populations. Evident by many first water nation communities sorry, many First Nation communities continuing to live with challenges to access safe drinking water. As evidenced by these two examples, access to clean and adequate water is a pressing social justice and environmental issue, requiring novel and intersectional, uh, intersectoral approaches. <clears throat> so Confluency is an interactive mobile art exhibit that seeks to address issues of water justice with attention to the marginalized populations who are most impacted. It is a Canada-South Africa co-production that seeks to collaboratively reframe water rights as an intersectional social justice issue. Confluency fuses transdisciplinary and arts-based approaches with methods of engaging local and indigenous knowledge in an iterative method for growing a water justice exhibit, <clears throat> or sorry, growing a water justice knowledge commons as it travels between host communities. We call the conference and exhibit confluencies because of the du dual meaning. It describes the meaning of tributaries within a larger river, but it can also describe the meaning of perspectives between people from different backgrounds. We need to acknowledge a range of um, partners and collaborators. So the Confluency Colloquium and Art Exhibit are supported by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The principal investigator is Professor Carmen Logie from the University of T Toronto's Factor Inwitash Faculty of Social Work. Sarah has had the honor of coordinating the Confluency project um, as Professor Logie's postdoc. And the research team is listed in this slide here. There are many other people who have supported the colloquium and exhibit across its numerous host institutions. I'm here presenting because I was co-coordinator in South Africa with Sarah. So we developed the Confluency art exhibit using three key steps. First, curating art featured in research presentations. Second, facilitate, facilitating art workshops. And third, designing interactive stations. The Confluency art exhibit emerged out of a three-day colloquium, also titled Confluency, which took place June 5th through 7th in 2023, hosted at the University of Cape Town's Future Water Research Institute. That's where I work. <laughs> the colloquium is rooted in three themes. One, indigenous and local knowledge and water justice. Two, participatory water governance. And three, arts-based water justice research with marginalized populations. Since three days is extremely tight to create an art exhibit, Sarah co-curated an exhibit framework that led up to the colloquium so that there were core elements of the exhibit in place which we could build upon during the three-day event. 
This framework consisted of arts-based research materials from project speakers that they were presenting. Some examples include a comic corner, comics that show water scarcity coping during COVID-19 with refugee youth, for example, a QR code dance mat, <clears throat> where photographs of lived experiences of water shortage and floods by community members from the Cape Flats in Cape Town, South Africa. Sarah discussed these materials with presenters in advance of the colloquium, determined which materials and displays would be most appropriate and engaging. And then we worked together to curate all this into a basic exhibit framework. Um, so arts-based workshops designed specifically for the Confluency project were held each afternoon of the colloquium to build on keynote and panel discussions from the mornings and create original works for the exhibit. These were facilitated by co-researchers, so community members from past research projects um, amongst us as collaborators on this grant with experience in using arts-based methods. The facilitators were people Future Water had worked with previously and were trained in these methods in the week before the colloquium. Workshops were supported by artist mentors and community engaged researchers working with arts based me methods. One art method was featured on each of the three days of the colloquium. So day one was water songscapes, day two was river of life social sculptures, and day three was putting a face to water justice digital storytelling videos. Here are some examples of the river of life social sculpture. Um, a more detailed description of the arts workshop methods can be made available if you guys want, if you request it, we're happy to share. So we designed um, interactive stations and a central guiding principle with our exhibit is that was that visitors could build on the exhibit and participate in ongoing knowledge exchange around water justice. To realize this aim, interactive stations were strategically incorporated into the exhibit. And some of these um, were suggested to presenters or by presenters or were developed through discussion with our presenters. So it was collaboratively built as well. Some considerations including having modes of engagement that link to certain artworks, either in materials or topics or both. And from a curatorial perspective, having a diversity of modes of engagement across the exhibit. The exhibit design overall resulted in 10 interactive stations. Examples include drawing on water drop shaped templates, writing short poems in response to a poem by award-winning poet Rita Wong, and stitching a panel of hydro rug using recycled materials from beach, river, and or campus cleanups. <clears throat> the inaugural Confluency Art Exhibit launched on June 7th, the final evening of the three-day Confluency Colloquium, and was hosted at the University of Cape Town Center for African Studies Gallery until the 21st of June. Following UCT, the exhibit traveled to Rhodes Memorial, uh, or, sorry, Rhodes University, as part of South Africa's National Arts Festival in Makanda, Eastern Cape Province. The exhibit was hosted inside a large classroom at RU's Environmental Learning Research Center and featured on the National Arts Festival's website. The classroom could be locked and the space was open to the public daily from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The exhibit was set up and takedown and staffing were greatly supported by NAF staff and students as well as some ELRC staff. So thanks to them. <laughs> um, from June 22nd to the 29th, um, we engaged a total of around 200 people, including two public walkabouts, a workshop on collective action for water justice hosted by a South African nonprofit called the Equality Collective. We also had a group of MED students from Rhodes University visit. And on the final day of the exhibit, 100 school students engaged with the exhibit through two scheduled workshops organized as part of the Schools Fest that aligns with the National Arts Fest. These workshops were 1.5 hours in duration and involved a few icebreakers followed by a series of five of the 10 minute interactions with, e sorry, five of the 10 stations and um, 10 minute interactions with each of the stations. These interactions took place in small groups and were each guided by a facilitator. These workshops were extremely successful in engaging youth in the activities and in peer learning and sharing around their experiences and ideas related to water justice. For example, the Songscape station alone produced 10 songs involving all youth in some way. This showed the enormous potential of the art exhibit method as a pedagogical and research tool. If we had programmed these workshops at the start of the exhibit at National Arts Festival, all subsequent visitors would have had the opportunity to explore and in turn respond to these youth's creations. Over to you, Laura. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, Amber. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Laura. Um, I work with the Office of Sustainability at Western University in London, Ontario. So I'm going to speak to Confluency's role um, in here at Western. Um, so it began its Canadian tour um, here at Western um, at our second annual Riverfest. So Riverfest um, aims to reconnect students, staff, and faculty to Deshkan Zibi or the Thames River. Um, so that's the river that runs through our campus. Through a collaboration with Western's Office of Sustainability, so the office that I work in, the Department of Visual Arts, the Office of Indigenous Initiatives, and the Indigenous Students Association, the exhibit under the collective branding of Riverfest Confluency was hosted in the Cohen Commons John Labatt um, Visual Arts Centre here at Western's campus from September 9th to 26th. Um, and so by integrating the exhibit into Western's second annual Riverfest, this exhibit supported the festival's aims by providing unique programming while the exhibit benefited from the audience um, that the festival drew in. So Western's visual arts department provided support with the exhibit, so the setup, takedown, and all of the documentation. Dr. Leslie Giddings, um, the co-applicant on the Confluency Project and an assistant professor um, here at Western in the School of Health Science, was the primary contact for the Confluency um, Project here at Western. And so this team um, were really empowered to adapt the curation of the exhibit to suit their, their venue and the goals. And they had access to wall space and, and co-opted it to display the, the items directly onto the walls without needing any freestanding displays um, that were part of the original mobile um, exhibit hardware. So there was a little less floor space um, at previous venues, but uh, we adapted resourcefully to this challenge by displaying some artworks on the walls that had been previously displayed on the floor, for example. Um, so one of the fabric um, uh, tributaries on the, the river of, of life social sculpture you can see there, um, and the growing mosaic of patches from the hydro rug. So since the venue was an open space with walkthrough traffic, large monitors were fixed onto walls um, for, for visual um, assistance, and they were used to display some of the audiovisual works um, as well. And due to some spatial limitations, not all the elements of the inaugural exhibit were included, um, but I would say a, a good collection were. Um, so this unique rendition of the exhibit included a special call out from local artists here in London um, as it relates to the theme of water justice. So our office um, oversaw this call out and this resulted in two works by local artists being exhibited um, alongside Confluency. So you can see here um, Lila Ava Bloomstones out of the Ravine um, oil, um, acrylic oil um, piece, and then Chloe Sorenko's counterfeit bait and tackle piece um, as well. And on September 19th, our office um, hosted an Ode to the River Coffee House alongside the Confluency exhibit that invited community members to perform river related works. So this event included music, comedy, soundscapes, um, music video screening, poetry, and this included a group of volunteers that recited excerpts from poem visitors um, that they were able to add to the exhibit. Um, the event brought approximately 30 diverse people into this space and some of whom contributed to the exhibit's um, interactive uh, stations during the intermission. So Riverfest uh, Confluency's opening day engaged about 300 undergraduate students in the Faculty of Science who were brought through the exhibit as part of campus orientation. And thereafter, it was estimated that approximately 20 people per day visited the exhibit over 14 weekdays um, for a total of about 580 visitors. So and after it completes its initial 2023 tour, this exhibit will be available to be hosted by additional institutions, organizations, or conferences, and incorporated into future water climate related curriculum, research, and public engagement activities. If you're interested in utilizing Confluency um, art exhibit, or if you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to contact Dr. Sarah Van Borek. Um, and we really hope this presentation has given you something you can take forward to honor and protect the, the confluence of rivers uh, along that which we work, live, and play. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Amber, Laura, and um, Sarah in absentia for the wonderful comments. Um, and then to all the presenters, um, Lauren Michael and Lawrence and um, Althea, thank you for the wonderful um, presentation. Um, we'll now move into um, the questions. Um, 
we are, I mean, maybe we can take one or two questions. Um, let me go online and see. Um, there's a question from Georgia Bork, which says, um, what types of material or art did you think the most well-received or interactive? I think this goes to Sarah Namba. Uh, I think in each setting, it was very different. Um, and with each group, so we had a couple of activist groups come through to the Cape Town exhibit, which I was able to witness. And in those cases, um, it depended on people's time to engage. So that's why the variety of, of materials and forms of engagement were so important to our vision. So for the people who had very short periods of time, writing a haiku was much quicker than creating a kind of river story. <laughs> those take a little bit longer. Um, and I think each one... Um, is framed differently. So it, 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 the, the variety of options are importantly there for the variety of users that we hope come through the space. Sorry, that doesn't answer your question directly, but. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm still monitoring the space. Um, um, if there are any questions um, for now, none. Um, do we still have time to wait or should we? Okay, just one minute. Okay, let's see if um, we have any other question online. So if you have any question for the presenters, um, we have just a minute. You can uh, pose your question then. I would um, read it out to, to the presenters and then they can do justice to that. Okay, um, in the absence of none, um, thank you very much um, for the wonderful presentation. Um, Lawrence, Althea, Lauren, Michael, Amber, Laura, and um, Sarah to, um, for your presentation to this session. And then to the online participants, thank you for taking the time out to stay and to listen to these presentations. And then hopefully we we'll see you next year. Um, have a wonderful day. Um, the next session starts um, at 11 o'clock. If I'm right, um, there's a break now, so we'll come together again for the next session. Uh, thank you once again, and um, hope you have a wonderful day.
Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Greenwood, and I will be the chair of the following session, which is a continuation of yesterday's discussion about uh, freshwater ecosystem challenges in the vein of connecting resource use to overarching ecosystem health. During this session, we uh, will have four speakers, including myself. Um, after the session concludes, we will have a group Q&A period um, where the speakers will answer all of your questions. So please post your questions and tag the speaker in the YouTube live chat um, on the side of the screen, and we will make sure to read them out to all of the speakers right at the very end. So first up, we have Armand Hagigi of the University of Ottawa presenting on ship-induced wave effects on bank erosion along the St. Lawrence River. Armand, take it away. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Arman Halida. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, UOTOVA and uh, I have been lucky to work with the uh, River Institute and Great River Network for this project. Uh, uh, today we are going to talk about the shipwreck impacts on uh, St. Lawrence River shoreline erosion. The project came from Great River Network to River Institute and the University of Ottawa and has been funded by DFO. Uh, the objective of uh, this project was uh, to determine the, and, and investigate the shipwreck impacts on the shoreline erosion. And uh, for that purpose, we did a historical changes uh, assessment at the beginning of our study to see how much of uh, the erosion has been caused by the ship impacts and uh, how much was caused by the creation and excavation of the uh, seaway channel. Uh, as you can see, the green one shows the previous uh, uh, shoreline before the seaway creation. And uh, after that, we have this uh, pink one that is the new shoreline. And the major uh, erosion happened after the changes of water level and uh, uh, basically excavation of the uh, uh, seaway channel. Uh, for uh, moving forward, we did a reconnaissance at uh, Jacob Island, which is a Mohawk territory, and uh, Maria Town in Morrisburg, Ontario. And uh, uh, my supervisors uh, helped me with the reconnaissance, and we decided about the locations. We chose to do the instrumentation, 
at the following for the following steps and uh, we chose six uh, RBR dual wave loggers which are sampling at two hertz and uh, they are, are equipped with a uh, two reach sensor depth sensor and pressure sensor uh, the other instrument that we used was uh, wave RBR wave 16 which is a wave logger too but uh, it's a uh, is able to uh, sample at a 16 hertz rate and it has uh, depth and pressure sensors. This sensor was used to separate, to detect the high frequency waves, which are the caused basic mostly by wind. Uh, and we need that uh, to separate the ship waves, which are the waves generated by ship passages from the wind waves. Uh, we, uh, designed and uh, produced these uh, mounts to secure our instruments and make them stabilized. At the river, we did a uh, uh, test on them at the NRC lab to see how much and uh, how they react with the dead waves on the feeds and without the dead waves and uh, to see the uh, reading of the wa uh, wave loggers that we have. Uh, the other thing that we used was uh, cameras. We, as you can see in the maps, uh, we installed two cameras at uh, Mario Town and Jacob Island facing the shipping channel. And also we used the aircraft as stainless steel table to secure the instruments from uh, being moved uh, by waves or humans. Uh, these are the locations that we deployed our six uh, wave loggers. The other uh, wave 16 wave loggers was uh, uh deployed uh, for a week at each location as the battery life would uh uh led us to do the deployment with that in specific instruments uh this is a picture of a uh, or a camera deployment at these two locations the cameras has an ai motion detector which means that they detect the ship passages at the frame that they are recording and they would uh, record two minutes before the passage and uh, five minutes after the passage to see the impact and source of the waves that our wave loggers uh, would uh, collect. And as you can see, uh, the uh, camera works at, uh, it has an uh, infrared sensor which can, which allow uh, the uh, camera to record the ship passages even at nights. Uh, these are the first readings that uh, we had uh, from our loggers. And we had some issues in the bottom graph. You can see we had some issues with the true real to data recording as the uh, auto gain uh, setting of the instrument uh, was not uh, adjusted well and wouldn't work for us in our situation that we have low uh, turbidity most of the time. And uh, at some wind events or ship passages events, we have high turbidity, so it couldn't work. So we changed it to 2,500 NTU. Uh, and the other, it, and we had some issues with our deployment. Uh, there was uh, some algae and vegetations that uh, would cover the sensor, as you can see in the left picture. The sensor we used uh, for turbidity is an optical sensor. So uh, this coverage, this sensor being covered results in uh, uh, basically errors in our data collected. Uh, these are the results. As you can see, the uh, blue line in the graphs represents the water level changes or waves. And each time that uh, we have a water level changes, we can see a turbidity spike too. These are the indi uh, indicators of the, uh, basically when uh, a ship passage or wind event uh, happens, we have uh, two resistor spikes. Two resistor spikes uh, represents the suspended sediments in the uh, water at the shoreline. These sediments has been washed out by those uh, water level changes during uh, the wave events. Uh, moving forward, we did some analysis on the uh, uh, wave events that we recorded. As you can see, there is a down drawdown 
or dendrod uh, at the beginning of the wave. It is uh, generated by the shape of the hull of the uh, vessel that has the uh, location. And uh, after that, we have a wave train, which is the Kelvin wave, the V-shaped wave that uh, you would see it uh, behind the uh, moving vessel or both. It doesn't depend on the size of the vessel, but this first part, the drawdown, uh, would only happen depending on the shape of the vessel and mostly is uh, seen at the, for the cargo vessels and large vessels at the river. The other thing that uh, we observed is that uh, after the ship passages, we have uh, four minutes delay to see the waves sorting and two minutes after the ship passage to see the drawdown. This uh, timing has been uh, defined by the uh, camera recordings that indicates the source of the event. And this is our uh, turbidity data. The turbidity spikes happens after uh, six and a half minutes uh, delay after the ship passage and would continue for uh, almost uh, 30 minutes. Uh, the other issue that we had with the data, these are the recordings that we had uh, and I showed you previously uh, from the wave loggers. The top one, the blue one, is the two, represents the turbidity, and the bottom one represents the water level changes. The water level changes uh, uh, is caused by both ship wakes and wind events, and we needed a, a way to separate these two events from each other to be able to uh, indicate each factor role on the turbidity events and followingly uh, the shoreline erosion. In this uh, graph, the first part, we don't have any noises. This is the pure uh, ship waves. And after that, we have noises in our water level changes. These noises represent the high frequency waves, which are resulted by wind waves. For that purpose, I generated the Python code uh, and using an AI, it detects the uh, turbidity events as we have more than 2000 uh, events during our uh, data collection for two years. And uh, it separates the uh, wind waves, which is a high frequency. And you can see it in the red uh, graph and uh, the blue one represents the ship waves or low, low frequency waves. In this, uh, these graphs will help us uh, to uh, detect the uh, role of each factor, wind or ship wake, uh, at the erosion. And uh, as you can see, we had a high turbidity event in the uh, above graph. And uh, in the bottom graph, we can see that there was no ship waves and the turbidity has been generated only by winds. Uh, next step uh, would be numerical modeling uh, and uh, de uh, determining the erosive energy of the wakes. Uh, for that purpose, we uh, generated a nesting model for the whole section of the river from uh, Iroquois Dam to uh, Somerstown. And uh, we use the fine, uh, we use the coarse mesh for the nesting model. And uh, as we cannot uh, model the specific location as we are uh, facing the uh, centimeters of uh, erosion per year at our uh, lo study locations. We couldn't use a fine mesh uh, for the whole uh, river section and it would take uh, years to run the model and see the results. So we use that nesting model to give these uh, red uh, lines that you can see in the left graph uh, uh, that are the boundary conditions of the model at the location. This location is uh, representing the Marietown, and we use uh, uh, this uh, red line at the right graph uh, as a uh, shipping lane passing the uh, area. And we did the mo we modeled it uh, in Mike Twenty One SW model, and this one is uh, for Jacob Island and the Stanley Island. And we did uh, the same, we took the same approach and uh, 
we had these uh, results. For example, uh, at Jacob Island, as you can see, we can see the wave propagation affecting the other side of the island, even though the shipping lane, uh, ship, uh, the other side of island is not facing the shipping lane. And uh, finally, we are going for our next step. Uh, we are going to use Mike Tree, which is a 3D model, uh, to follow the morphological changes by giving uh, the wave pattern generated by ship passages for 100 years uh, as this uh, red line in the middle of the, uh, which represents the uh, shipping lane in the middle of the domain that we have. Thank you so much, everyone. This was my presentation. Thank you, Arman. Um, so just to make sure that I'm keeping us on track in terms of time, uh, I am just going to move to the next person. And um, that person happens to be myself. <laughs> so um, like I said before, my name is uh, Sarah Greenwood. Um, I am a master's student at Carleton University. And I am here today to talk to all of you um, about bats, uh, cortisol, and mercury. So um, to start us off, I'm sure if you are here for um, this particular conference, you're probably uh, familiar with what mercury is. But um, just very quickly, uh, mercury is a persistent bioaccumulative neurotoxin known to cause a number of issues in small mammals um, with chronic exposure having been shown to lead to things like impairment of motor function and reproductive success among a host of other things. Um, a threshold of 10 parts per million has been proposed for sublethal effects within small mammals, which includes bats. Um, and if you are a regular attendee of the River Symposium, you've likely heard before that high levels of mercury have been found uh, by a number of previous studies undertaken within this region specifically. However, if, um, you're, <laughs> if, if this is new to you, you're probably wondering how mercury ends up in a bat anyway. So the answer to that is that exposure to mercury within terrestrial predators like bats occurs primarily through their diet. Uh, mercury is deposited into our water bodies where it tr is transformed into methylmercury, which is the type of mercury that um, most readily biomagnifies within food chains and bioaccumulates within individuals. So methylmercury is taken up by primary producers within the water body that are then in turn eaten by insect larvae that begin their lives aquatically. So think along the lines of mosquitoes, midges, caddisflies, mayflies, that kind of thing. Uh, when those aquatic insects then emerge and fly as adults, they are then eaten by terrestrial pred predators, such as spiders, birds, and bats. So because bats eat so many insects each and every day, um, and are they are relatively long-lived for their size, there is plenty of opportunity for bioaccumulation to occur. Um, while mercury is a really powerful neurotoxin, the high levels of mercury that we've been finding in bats specifically um, have not yet been linked to any adverse effects, which is um, kind of indicative of <laughs> kind of how why this why this um, high mercury is so interesting. Um, so in terms of cortisol, uh, cortisol is one of the primary hormones produced within most mammals as part of a stress response. Exposure to stressors is associated with increased activity within the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and therefore levels of cortisol are generally considered indicators for stress. Cortisol modulates a number of complex bodily processes beyond stress response, including things like immune function, metabolism, sleep cycles, among a whole host of other things. Um, its function is to keep the animal alive when conditions are suboptimal, facilitating a shift in behavior and physiology so as to minimize the effect of stress on the individual, as well as prepare the body for subsequent stress events. So cortisol is incorporated into fur as it grows, allowing for the assessment of long-term cortisol levels. Because fur can also be used as a matrix on which to measure exposure to pollutants, during which the fur, the time the fur is grown. Um, we can also say that by measuring both cortisol and mercury on subsamples taken from the same bat, 
would actually show us a comparison of overall physiological stress to pollutant exposure during the same time frame. So all of that, oh, <laughs> I forgot I had added that. Um, so uh, all of that to say, our research question kind of going into all of this was, do bats with high levels of mercury in their fur exhibit signs of physiological stress as a result of this contamination? And going into all of this, um, our main hypothesis was that little brown and big brown bats with higher concentrations of mercury in their fur would also exhibit higher levels of cortisol in their fur. So um, in terms of our methods, our site selection was based on a network of known bat roosting sites facilitated by the work of the River Institute's Brian Hickey um, with the goal of catching an even 100 bats of each of the target species. Field work spanned um, the season of May to September of 2022 and included 12 distinct sites across the region of Eastern Ontario. At two of the sites, number seven and number nine in orange, we were able to catch both species of bats in colonies in very close proximity to one another. Um, in blue, we have our big brown sites, and then in green, we have our little brown sites. By the end of the sampling season, we had caught, processed, and sampled 151 little brown bats and 72 big brown bats for a total sample size of 223. During capture, we would also record a number of additional descriptors, such as the species, sex, current reprodu uh, reproductive status, forearm length, mass, and approximate maturity level, either young or um, young of the year or adult. Uh, prior to snipping a fur sample from between the shoulder blades on their back. In terms of the actual lab analysis, all of the fur samples were split up into subsamples for the various analyses. Uh, the mercury analysis was completed at um, Environment and Climate Change Canada's National Wildlife Research Centre by myself. And um, we also partnered with the Toronto Zoo's endocrinology lab in order to determine the cortisol concentrations. Um, so in terms of our results, uh, you can see the results of the mercury analysis for all bats separated by species on the left-hand side of the screen, while on the right-hand side, um, these same results are separated by site. So, um, sorry, uh, big brown bats will be represented in blue for the remainder of this uh, talk, while little brown bats are in green. So the bars represent group medians and Finally, the uh, red lines um, represent the 10 parts per million threshold for sublethal effects that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of differences between the species, the initial raw data shows statistic no statistically significant difference between little and big brown bats. Um, this is interesting in contrast to all of the previous results for this region, which have shown big brown bats having higher total mercury in their fur than little brown bats. Um, however, one sort of funny quirk of my data set is that we had a much harder time catching big brown, uh, adult big brown bats than we expected to be able to, resulting in around a third of the big brown samples being taken from young bats that had just been born that summer. So fur mercury concentrations have been shown to increase with age. So as such, it was not particular, particularly surprising when I then compared only adults of each species and found that there was a statistically significant difference between each group. So when you're looking at only adult big brown bats, you can see that the median total mercury concentration exceeds that 10 parts per million threshold, though there are members of each species that are shown far surpassing. Um, when comparing by site, the main thing that I wanted to point out is just that um, most sites exhibit a fairly large range of variation among individuals, and there isn't really a single site that is driving the difference between the two species. In terms of cortisol, um, once again, uh, big brown bats exhibit higher concentrations than little browns. Um, while the breakdown by site shows there isn't a single site driving the differences similar to the mercury. Um, site one, which is on the far left of the right-hand side graph, um, it does appear to have the largest amount of variation. Uh, this may be because site one is the largest colony that we sampled, um, as well as being the place where the most bats were captured. I think of the 223, we had 40 bats from this colony. So 
kind of circling back to my original research question, do bats with high levels of mercury in their fur exhibit signs of physiological stress from the contamination? So this first graph has all bats that we caught together. It demonstrates basically an overall lack of a linear relationship between cortisol and mercury as the point essentially from the vertical line. Um, very little of the variation in cortisol can be explained by increases in mercury um, when examining the data kind of all together. Um, so this second graph shows just little browns. Once again, there's kind of a lack of any correlation between the two variables. Um, there's a lack of statistical significance, just kind of uh, demonstrated that there really wasn't any sort of relationship when looking at this subset. Um, and then finally, this final graph shows um, just for big brown bats. So while it is still not necessarily a perfectly explanatory relationship, uh, there is still a recognizably linear shape to the data demonstrating a positive, though not perfectly explanatory, relationship between mercury and cortisol that is highly statistically significant. Given the wide variety of functions performed by cortisol within the body, it is not surprising that mercury would not perfectly account for all variation within the data set, um, but it does point to there being some sort of relationship between the two things. So in terms of conclusions, uh, big brown bat fur in this study uh, contains more total mercury and cortisol than that of little brown bats, especially when you are looking specifically at adult bats. Um, these differences appear to be species specific rather than site specific. Uh, the average big brown bat also exceeds the 10 parts per million proposed threshold, which may indicate that um, that threshold needs to be reevaluated. Um, these results also indicate that there is some linear relationship between mercury exposure and cortisol levels in big brown bats specifically. Um, this is really interesting that this relationship only seems to hold true for bat species that have been found with higher levels of mercury. So it may have something to do with just the overall amount of mercury um, as opposed to, um, yeah. Uh, however, this relationship and was never really likely to be fully explanatory given the overall complexity of uh, glucocorticoid function within the body. Um, there are a number of potentially confounding variables that may need to be considered if anybody was to try to um, try to assess this any further. Uh, reproductive status, for example, is known to influence cortisol levels, and this is kind of further complicated by any sort of overlap between uh, for growth and molting windows and um, like where exactly within that time period all of these things are happening, um, just because the cortisol and mercury levels are in the fur are very specifically reflections of when the fur is grown and those sort of cycles are very individualized. Um, so overall the relationship between mercury and physiological stress I think should be further explored within big brown bats uh, but I think it would require a more rigid sampling plan accounting for likely both uh, fur growth timing and as well as probably requiring a higher number of adult bats specifically. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I will hand it back to myself, I guess. <laughs> so I will stop sharing and then. So next up, we have uh, Christina Charette of the uh, St. Lawrence River Institute, and she is going to be presenting her research um, titled Biological Invasion Modulates Eutrophication Impacts on Freshwater Food Web Energy Pathways and Nutritional Quality. Uh, take it away, Christina. Thank you. I'm starting to unmute myself. I couldn't find anything in my screen. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm really happy today to share with you some of my results of my PhD studies. So freshwater ecosystems are threatened by many anthropogenic stressors, like you all know, and that includes biological invasion and eutrophication. So biological invasion represents um, means like when a new um, 
the introduction of non-native species in a novel environment. And often those invasive species can represent a new abundant prey for native uh, predator. And because of that, they can modify the food web energy pathways. Eutrophication well represents an excessive level of nutrients, especially total phosphorus in the environment. And that can change algal community, uh, zooplankton and fish uh, community structure, and that can lead to changes in food web nutritional quality. So when we look at both of these, um, there are very few studies that have looked at the combined effects of uh, those two anthropogenic stressors. So when we're talking about uh, nutritional quality, we can um, really relate that to essential fatty acids. So essential fatty acids are fats with more than one double bond. That includes uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids like PUFAs and highly unsaturated fatty acids, so more than uh, three double bonds. And these include omega-3 and omega-6. And these essential fatty acids are synthesized de novo only by uh, phytoplankton and are transferred up the food web via the diet. And it's, they're really important because they support mainly fecundity, but also other um, functions like membrane fluidity and sens sensory functioning as well. So given that essential fatty acids are, um, can be a limiting compound in food web, it's really important to understand how anthropogenic stressors can modulate nutritional quality. When we think about biological invasions, often we, we think about those two invasive species, so the Rangobi and the Dresnids mussels. So these invasive species are now part of many native food web in the Great Lakes and in, in the St. Lawrence River as well. So like you can see here, so Dresnid mussels can filter a lot of water, including the nutrients and the phytoplankton, and that um, increase water transparency and can promote the benthic energy pathway. The rango bee um, is now a really important prey for the native smallmouth bass, and it's recognized to be, in general, a benthivorous fish feeding on uh, the low-quality dressed in mussel. So the, the rango bee can also favor the benthic energy uh, pathway. And in, in general, when we think about essential fatty acid, usually the benthic pathway will have the low essential fatty acid compared to the pelagic pathway with zooplankton, and we have a higher essential fatty acid. So knowing, um, so invasive species has uh, have the potential to modify, um, restructure the benthic versus uh, pelagic energy pathway, and that can be reflected into changes in food web nutritional quality. Eutrophication can also influence nutritional quality in food web because, uh, for example, total phosphorus can modify the, the phytoplankton community. So, for example, at high total phosphorus, that can stimulate phytoplankton like diatoms, which are really high in essential fatty acid. But when we move to higher level of total uh, phosphorus, then that can stimulate the growth of cyanobacteria and chlorophyte, and these don't have a lot of fatty, acid, fatty acids. For example, cyanobacteria have a none of those higher um, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So eutrophication can actually downgrade the availability um, of essential fatty acids, and that can reach up to fish and affect their nutritional value. So it's important to understand how both eutrophication and biological invasion together can modify the food web nutritional quality. So with that in mind, my study had two objectives. So the first one was to examine how both dressin mussels and rangobis can alter the energy pathways and also the nutritional quality. And secondly, to determine if the invaders can modify the effect of, of eutrophication on nutritional quality in the food web. So for the first objective, my hypothesis that, well, if invaders can actually promote the benthic pathway, then I would predict that at, um, that it will be reflected into the native predator, like the smallmouth bass, and bass will have lower essential fatty acid in that situation. For objective, objective two, well, if there can be a negative effect of eutrophication, uh, well, that could be transferred from the cestin all the way to both the invasive rangobi and the native analog benthivorous uh, yellow perch. But I'm predicting that the effect might be uh, worse um, 
with the rangubi because of its connection with Dresden's muscles, which can filter a lot of water. So my study area was the Upper St. Lawrence River. Um, it's perfect because it offers a gradient in total phosphorus, like you can see with the colors from yellow to high total phosphorus in orange. And also there are uh, three different fusual lakes with different um, level of invaders. So for example, Lake St. Francis, we have high density of gobies and the presence of dress and mussels. Lake St. Louis here, we have intermediate level of gobies with uh, dress and mussels present as well. And in Lake Two Mountains from the Ottawa River, we have no raw gobies present and the dressings are really rare in that uh, fuva lake. I did an intensive survey across those fuva lakes, um, mostly at a near shore level, sample across the food web. So I use different indicators. So the first one are stable isotopes, which is a good indicator of the energy pathways, because when you look at the um, carbon-13, well, it reflects uh, the diet of a consumer, and this is over a long-term diet. So I was able to determine the pelagic versus benthic energy pathway, like you can see here. And with nitrogen-15, uh, usually consumers are enriched in nitrogen-15 compared to their diet. So I was able to determine the trophic position along here, the y-axis. In terms of nutritional state, I used essential fatty acids like the PUFAs uh, for the top predator nutritional state. But I also used a more commonly um, used index called the relative weight. Um, so the, the relative weight looks at the weight in relation to a standard weight, which is based on a length and weight regression uh, for the 75th percentile. So if you have a value under 100, it means that the fish is less plump than the average fish of the same length. And if you have a value over 100, it means that the fish is plumper, so it weighs more than the fish of the same length. All right, moving on to the results now. So for the first objective. So here you see uh, the graph with the trophic position in relation to pelagic diet proportion, four to three lakes. So San Francis, lots of gobies, uh, San Luis intermediate level of invaders, and two mountains, no invaders. So in orange, you have a small mouth bass, in blue, the large yellow perch, in green, the smaller yellow perch, and in gray, the round goby. So what we can tell here is that in Lake St. Francis, where the invaders are, are there in high density, it's more benthic energy pathway compared to where the invaders are absent, we see a more pelagic pathway. So we can say that actually the presence of invaders in high density promote the benthic energy pathway. So how does this re reflect to uh, the smallmouth bass nutritional quality? So here you see uh, the effect of lake on smallmouth bass PUFAs in relation to the different lakes. So again, no gobies, bass of gobies, intermediate levels of gobies. And we see a significant difference between the Lake Two Mountains and St. Francis. So what it means is that bass um, from St. Francis, where there's a lot of gobies, have lower essential fatty acid, lower PUFAs. Now, when we look at the relative weight, Again, we have the same type of graph. We see a significant difference between uh, two mountains in San Francisco. So here, what we can say is that in San Francisco, where the gobies is present in high density, the bass are plumper. So yes, they are bigger, but they actually have lower fatty acid compared to the bass from two mountains where the leaner fish, but with, with higher level of PUFAs. So what we can see here is that the round goby may not represent a beneficial prey for the native predator, but it might reduce uh, the energy cost in terms of foraging for a prey because you know the round goby is everywhere, basically. So the bass can reduce that cost and put more energy into into growing. However, you know low essential fatty acid can have implication on fecundity, and when you grow fast, you can die young. So. Overall, these can have um, consequences on lo long time, lifetime fecundity. Now, moving on to the second objective in relation to the eutrophication effect. So what I can say here is that the eutrophication effect was indeed transferred from the cestin to the round goby, but um, 
yeah, so to the Rangobi. So here what you can see is a total phosphorus effect on the Rangobi PUFAs in relation to total phosphorus. So a high a level of uh, phosphorus. So eutrophic condition here, we have a reduction in essential fatty acid. However, this effect was not seen in the yellow perch, in small yellow perch. So the main difference between those two benthivorous fish is that the perch will not commonly eat to dress in muscle. So what we can say here is that actually maybe the link between the, the, the rangobi and the dress in muscles um, uh, 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 made the eutrophication effect more important. So to summarize, well, as I've shown that the invasion by rangobis and dressing muscles favored the benthic food web pathway, and that had consequences on the native smallmouth small bass uh, nutritional state. So the bass are plumper when the gobies are present in high densities, but they have lower nutritional state. Also showed that biological invasion can exacerbate the eutrophication effects because there was no negative effect that was seen in the benthivorous yellow perch. So finally, uh, the combined anthropogenic stressors can both influence the food web pathways and nutritional quality in a kind of a synergy way, and that can have um, important impacts on the native uh, sport fish like the smallmouth bass. So thank you everyone who helped me throughout my studies, including the Dairy Lab members, the River Institute staff and volunteers. Um, and if you want to contact me, here's my contact information um, for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. That was super interesting. Um, okay, so I think we have our final presentation of this session up next. Um, for that presentation, it will be uh, Georgia and Brittany of um, the River Institute and the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne, respectively, and they are going to be presenting on progress in the St. Lawrence River Cornwall Aquasasne Remedial Action Plan. So I will hand it over to you guys. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? I can get a thumbs up from uh, Sarah, perhaps? Okay, perfect. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thank you once again for joining us today. My name is Brittany Bordage, and I'm the Remedial Action Plan Coordinator for the Northern portion of Aquasasne. Um, today, I'll be presenting with my colleague, <clears throat> Sumi Georgia Bach from the River Institute, whom I will uh, let introduce herself. Thank you, Georgia. Hi, yeah, I'm Georgia Bach. I, as Brittany said, I'm with the River Institute and the Remedial Action Plan Coordinator there. So Brittany and I work really closely together on this project. So I will start uh, by going to the next slide. Hopefully. Ah, okay. Um, so just a brief overview. So I'm sure a lot of you know what the areas of concern are. We've mentioned it throughout the conference, but um, essentially, back in the 1980s, there were 43 areas of concern identified in the Great Lakes Basin, uh, and these were identified because of uh, human or anthropogenic um, impacts, or they were highly polluted, degraded areas, I guess. Um, and you can see over to the right of the screen in the uh, it's a diamond shape is the St. Lawrence River, so we're one of the areas of concern near Cornwall Aquasasne. Uh, and we're one of the five binational, or we could call this one trinational area, areas of concern. Uh, so here's a closer look at the area of concern. Um, you can see that it's divided into two. So the one that Brittany and I work on is in the green there. So we call it the, we refer to it as the northern portion of the area of concern. And there's a southern portion uh, that's the St. Regis Mohawk tribe and New York State and, and, uh, and the states govern, which is uh, in the orange there. So it's divided mainly due to jurisdictional issues um, and also due to different contaminants of concern. So there are different industries on both sides of the river impacting things. So in Cornwall, mercury is a Cornwall aquasosne, the mercury is a contaminant of concern in New York uh, and, say, and say in aquasosne, it's uh, mainly PCBs. 
So for those two areas of concern, there are actually two different uh, remedial action plans, or we call them cleanup plans, to clean up these areas. Um, and the aim of uh, cleaning up these er for cleaning up these areas are to make sure that we're kind of on par with other levels with other areas in the Great Lakes. So um, we're not going to clean it up to be perfect, but we're trying to make sure that we're not at the not, not lower or de more degraded than other areas in the Great Lakes. And we do so by addressing um, various beneficial use impairments. And these this is a complicated term term, but we Mainly, these are environmental issues that are kind of highlighted. So here, here are the beneficial use impairments that we're still working on. So these are different for the two areas of concern, but for the one that we're working on, uh, there's been seven that have been restored. So that means they've checked some scientific criteria that have been outlined um, back, back in the day that people think that should be checked. Um, and then there's uh, seven that we're still working on. So the ones in red are are considered impaired, so they still need to be worked on. And the uh, ones in yellow uh, need further assessment, so they need some more information. Um, and for this process, uh, we have a local council that oversees everything. So all of the work that goes into it, um, the beneficial use impairments, and whether we're ready to move things along or not, the monitoring, all that kind of stuff, uh, local council helps oversee this. So uh, it's made different government uh, agency members. So you can see the ones on the screen here, like Environment Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, there's also the Mohawk Council of Opposite Environment Program. So you see Brittany. And then there's also uh, uh, community members, seven members. Our chair is actually a community member too. Um, and then members from industry and local organizations. So I'm going to pass it on to Brittany uh, to talk about what's happening in 2023. Thank you, Georgia. Um, yeah, so a little overview here of 2023. Uh, something that was super exciting for 2023 is that we have one of the first beneficial use impairments um, to go through a redesignation process since 2007, which is the beach closings uh, beneficial use impairment. We had a 60 day comment period. Um, there was presentations for MCA council um, and the SLRC, um, many other presentations uh, such, in, such as in Cornwall and in South Glengarry, uh, tons of engagement from the public. Uh, and we're really happy to say that this is um, based on levels for E. coli and what we are seeing uh, was great. So it's in the process now of being redesignated. So some good news for the rep. Some of the current sampling that we have going on right now is eutrophication monitoring. Uh, this is being done jointly with the River Institute and MCA. And we are looking at ass assessing nitrogen and phosphorus uh, and fecal coliforms, uh, for example, anything that could impact harmful algal blooms. And this is being done for nearshore and tributary locations. And we're also complementing this research with um, benthic surveys because those are great indicators for water quality. So that is going on right now. Uh, next, we have the Bainesville Marsh, uh, Marsh Restoration Project that's being led by the Raisin Region Conservation. And within this project, um, we're just looking to expand the wetland, plant wild rice. Um, there's also plantings of various native vegetation. Uh, a lot more goes into this project as well. But if you're looking for further information, I encourage you to look at the Raisin Region website. Next, we have um, excuse me, our partnership with the Natural Edge Project. Um, this is Watersheds Canada, MCA, and the River Institute. And we're doing lots of plantings in both Cornwall and Aquasasne. And this is to help to stabilize shorelines uh, and reduce erosion and any ne negative impacts that result um, to water quality from that type of activity. Then we have um, the ALICE program that's also led by the Raisin Region Conservation Authority uh, and Agricultural Best Management Practices. Essentially what this program does is it works with farmers and it provides incentive to maintain ecological features on their property. So if they have a wetland, not closing in that wetland and that sort of thing. Um, and there is compensation for the farmers who join the program. So spread the word if you know anybody who might be interested. 
Um, additionally, we've been doing some snapping turtle contaminant sampling. Uh, we've been testing the eggs for mercury and PCB content. Uh, we have yet to receive that data, but hopefully we can update you on the results of that next year. And then we have um, our fish contaminant survey. Um, so we recently ended a two-year study in 2021, and we sampled over 330 fish samples of species of interest. Um, these were sampled for mercury and PCB content as well uh, for the purpose of informing the consumption DUI. And we are actually looking at that data right now. So hopefully we can report on that to you next year and give you an idea of what came of that study. Uh, and in addition, some work that we have going on this year that's really cool is we're doing the same type of study for American eel and lake sturgeon, as those are culturally significant um, species as well. So what is next? One of the things that we're doing with the wrap that is innovative and exciting uh, and long overdue is adding cultural dimensions to beneficial use impairments. Um, historically, uh, for the wrap's inception in the late 80s, it was more focused on Western scientific points of view in terms of how criterion were developed. But now we have a voice and are at the table more than ever. And as such, we are adding uh, cultural delisting criteria to these beneficial use impairments. Uh, and we're working on this collaboratively with the River Institute and the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe who govern the Remedial Action Plan program uh, in the southern portion of Aquasustin. Uh, additionally, we have been working towards uh, a multi-agency framework, which includes Canada, Ontario, Quebec, New York, US, uh, and the tribe. So getting all of the people involved in the wrap for Aquasustiny as a whole, getting people at a table together, and hopefully making joint decisions that um, are reflective of this area uh, and moving beneficial use impairments together in a meaningful way. Uh, for example, fish don't know borders. So just getting on, on top of things with um, giving the same type of advisories. All right, I'll go back to Georgia. <laughs> Thanks, Rodney. Um, and just to close things off, we have, uh, so the RAP is, um, is a project that's kind of, it's confined. So it's dealing with these specific beneficial use impairments and it can often, uh, it, anything that's out, outside of that is hard to, to deal with. Um, so, and also this plan will eventually end. So uh, the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne and uh, the River Institute has have partnered together to create this new initiative called the St. Lawrence River Strategy, um, which will move beyond the remedial action plan. And so when the re remedial action plan is no longer here, we'll have a place to, to address some of the concerns and some, uh, some concerns that are maybe outside the scope of the wrap anyways, the climate change and, and things that aren't to deal with uh, past industry. Um, and so, yeah, the, we just had a great meeting on it yesterday. So uh, more to come on the on this. And I think that is uh, our, the end of our presentation. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing and thank you very much. Thank you both for that, that was great. Um, okay, so I think that takes us into our question period for um, this particular session. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and tag the speaker that you want to direct them towards. Um, I believe as of right now, there is one question and I think it is for myself. So uh, the question is, Sarah, do you have a linear relationship for only adult uh, total mercury versus, uh, I'm assuming, cortisol in big brown fats? Um, so the answer to that is yes. Um, there is still that same general linear relationship. I will absolutely admit it is not as strong of a relationship. Um, and it is just, just barely above that. Um, 0 0.05 p-value that would mark it as um, statistically significant. However, I do think that this is largely because when I cut out all of the um, when I cut out all of the juvenile bats, it does leave the sample size at only um, 38 individuals. And like I mentioned 
uh, because cortisol um, and the way that it functions within the body is so complicated. I think that um, having a sample size of only 38 just doesn't really uh, capture all of the variation and um, it just, it doesn't allow that pattern to come through in the same way, which is why I think um, it would very much be worth somebody going back and um, focusing a little harder on making sure that they're uh, sampling specifically adult big browns to see whether that relationship holds true after the fact. Um, I, uh, okay, we've got another question for Brittany and Georgia. Um, will all aspects of the RAP be absorbed by the river, river strategy? Brittany, do you want to answer or do you want me to? Um, I can, we could maybe both take a stab at it. So could you repeat the question? Are all aspects going to be dealt with in the river strategy? Of the RAP, I think. I think I've... Could, sorry, yeah. sorry, could you to repeat the question? Of course, yes. Uh, so the question was, uh, will all aspects of the RAP be absorbed by the river, river strategy? Sorry. <laughs> um, I think that things that are identified under, I guess you could say like the categories of the RAP that are beyond the scope of the criteria, we're looking at addressing through the river strategy. So that includes, um, how would I explain this? So whenever we were going through the beach comment period, what I kind of tried to explain to people is that whenever we are passing this BUI through, we are in no way saying that beach health is perfect because there's so many dimensions to beach health. Effectively, the wrap only deals with certain criteria. So anything that falls outside of the scope of those criteria, whether they be um, the original ones that were set or new uh, cultural dimensions to things, anything that's outside of that, we're looking to address through the river strategy. We're like, we're referring to river strategy as life after the wrap. And within the river strategy, things become a lot more um, complicated, if you will, in the sense of like, we would be looking to um, look for new funding and, and introducing new projects. But throughout the engagement through this process, we're identifying what people are seeing, uh, what things are of importance, and we're looking to, to effectively answer the public, uh, respond to that and provide remediations in that regard, but not everything fits with the criterion, if that makes sense. And Georgia, if there's anything you want to add, <laughs> I'm not sure if I, yeah. I think I think you captured that well, like beaches. So we are measuring if it hit a certain amount of uh, E. coli, you know, we met our criteria, but there's other things that affects beaches that aren't, that aren't E. coli. So that's not going to fit within the wrap. Hopefully it will fit within, you know, the river strategy will bring another place to talk at least about these things and try and find some funding for it. Exactly. So I'll give like a, a quick example uh, in relation to beaches, since that's the beneficial use impairment that we have going through right now. Something that came up a lot in the public comment period was all of the debris and, and garbage effectively that's on beaches. So now we have initiatives that are already going on now to, to have a plan for cleaning up beaches and, and responding to that need. It just doesn't fall under the wrap project and funding. So we found a new home for it. Perfect. Thank you both. Um, okay, so I think we do have another question in the chat. Um, okay, this one is also for me. Um, so do bats molt during the summer? And if so, do you believe that could have influenced your mercury or cortisol results? So the answer to that is yes. Uh, bats do um, have a period of molting and fur growth during the summer specifically. Um, the issue with that is that it is kind of like more of like a timing window than it is a specific time for um, everyone and there will be a reasonable amount of variation within a one to two month period so um, it is relatively difficult to um, given given this the scope that the scale that we were trying to catch bats at um, the the issue was that we only had Sort of that four month period to catch bats and then if two of those months um, were fully removed it would have shortened the period even more so uh, we decided 
for this particular study to just catch as many bats as possible and then um, kind of see if there was a relationship there and we would come back to that. Um, so I think, like I said before, it would be very, very beneficial to kind of revisit this but with a sampling plan that kind of um, takes that more into account, tries to time it either immediately before or immediately after, just to make sure that you're comparing um, the same season kind of for an entire colony. Um, but either way, uh, because the fur allows for the, um, the measurement of both of these, both the contaminant and uh, the cortisol hormone, over a long period of time, it should be relatively indicative of either the summer that we caught them in or the previous summer. Um, so it's not necessarily completely invalid, but um, I think in a in a perfect world, um, that is something that would be um, built into the sampling plan um, as opposed to what we did where we kind of just chose to see whether the relationship existed at all. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay, we have one last question, though I will say I am not 100% sure who this is for, so I might need to <laughs> uh, put this out to everyone and hopefully um, it will be clear, but uh, the question is, do you have access to data from Canada's C3 voyage down the Upper St. Lawrence? Unfortunately, I'm not sure who that's directed towards. Um, I'm guessing it's probably not me. <laughs> I'm wondering if it's just towards the River Institute, maybe, in general, um, because we were involved in C3 Voyage. However, okay. I wasn't around at that point. I don't know, Christina, if you were. Was, yeah, but I, I, I'm not aware of if there was any follow-up with the data in particular. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe we could have someone else answer uh, that question and get back to to this person later. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, okay. Yeah. It appears it's a uh, it's a question directed towards um, all of us, just kind of at the, at the River Institute as a whole. So um, yeah, we will we will unfortunately have to have somebody uh, get back to you on that one because I don't think any of um, us specifically in this session happen to have the answer to that, but um, we can make sure that uh, that answer does make its way over to you at some point. Perhaps okay. Jeff would be the one to answer that one. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I have a feeling he would probably know. Um, okay, well, that brings us right to uh, 12 o'clock. So I think um, that that concludes this particular session. Um, thank you so much for tuning in and for uh, all of the speakers who spoke today. And um, yeah, I will <laughs> close the session, I suppose. <laughs>
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 30th Annual River Symposium. Uh, we're going to start off the last afternoon of the three days um, with our final freshwater ecosystem challenges session. It's part three. Um, so for this session, we are going to have six presenters, including myself. And to start us off, we have Chloe Lajoie from Watersheds Canada, and her title for her presentation is How Can Nature-Based Solutions and Technology Help Canadians Protect Their Freshwater? So take it away, Chloe. Great. Oh, uh, it's disabled participant screen sharing. Say just one moment. <laughs> There we go. All right, so I'll just quickly share my screen. All right. All right, thank you, Mizzy. Oh, up there. <laughs> And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. As Mackenzie mentioned, I'm Chloe Lejoie. I'm the Natural Edge Program Manager at Watersheds Canada. And today I'm going to talk to you about our Natural Edge Program and how we use nature-based solutions and technology to help Canadians protect their fresh water. So to start, I just want to introduce you to our organization for those of you who don't know of us. So Watersheds Canada is a federally incorporated nonprofit charity. And we have been working to protect and restore our freshwater ecosystem since 2002. We are a small team based out of Perth and we raise every dollar each year through grants, foundations and donations, which we take and put right back into delivering our programs both throughout Eastern Ontario and across Canada. So our mission is to develop programs focused on education and on the ground stewardship actions, which we can share with people and groups across the country and reach as many Canadians as possible. And as Brittany mentioned in her session earlier before lunch, um, I run our, we have our natural edge program. Um, we have many other programs as well, but this is gonna be the focus of what I'll talk about today. So. The Natural Edge is a shoreline naturalization program where we work with waterfront property owners to design and create a natural shoreland by planting a selection of native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers that are suitable for their property. And we've developed our program to provide the tools and resources needed so that landowners can take action um, on the ground to protect their lakes and rivers. And this is because Canada is home to the third largest renewable supply of freshwater in the world, with over 2 million lakes alone. Freshwater is critical to Canada's economy and, economy and health and a key part of our identity. For many Canadians, summers are spent on the water, swimming, fishing, and spending time with friends and family. And shorelines are one of the most ecologically productive places on Earth where 90% of all aquatic life is born, raised, and fed within the first 10 to 15 meters from shore, and 70% of all land-based wildlife need a natural shoreline to survive. On top of that, vegetated shorelines also keep soils from eroding and protect water quality by removing up to 85% of pollutants from land runoff. So to keep our freshwater ecosystems healthy, we need to leave at least 75% of our shorelines natural. And climate change is having an effect as well. Uh, freshwater ecosystems have been identified among the ecosystems most vulnerable to climate change worldwide by changing temperatures. And it's a, it's a big topic as there's lots of ways that our e freshwater ecosystems are getting impacted. Um, we've seen with more frequent big storm events that we're experiencing heavy rainfall causing erosion um, and flood flooding events, as well as more drain rain during winter months, changes in habitat and spawning seasons, and a decrease in water quality. So if we don't start acting now, um, it's only going to get worse. So we're really trying to get the message out there and work with landowners to protect their shoreline and mitigate these impacts. 
So our surveys have shown that people value fresh water, including good water quality, natural shorelines, and aquatic life. However, when we go onto their land, we're seeing a huge disconnect between people's values and their actions. And this is impacting the very thing that they love. Because of this disconnect, um, Canada's freshwater is experiencing immense development pressures and the health of our lakes is rapidly declining. The way we once viewed and developed waterfront properties is changing and it's expediting the degradation of our shorelines in unprecedented ways. Algae blooms, again, loss of biodiversity and poor climate resiliency, such as the flooding and erosion are just some of these impacts. And out of 40,000 shoreline assessments that we've completed on Canada's lakes, only 22% of those properties actually meet the minimum criteria for sustaining lake health. And when it comes to waterfront development, uh, there is a misconception that this only covers what changes are made directly on the shoreline. Um, and I'm getting used to switching over from saying shoreline to shoreland. Uh, and that's because a waterfront property encompasses four zones. So there's the littoral, shoreline, riparian, and upland zones. And this spans 30 meters back from where the water meets the land. And the actions that are taken on this area directly affects um, the health of the lake and is the focus of our restoration program. So what's stopping people from taking action to protect our freshwater? Our surveys of past participants have shown that there are common barriers to action, including a lack of guidance, knowledge, and capacity. We found that people really just don't know where to start or how to go about taking on a project such as this. Um, initially, we built this program because we had our very first program was Love Your Lake. Um, and Love Your Lake is a shoreline assessment program in partnership with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And we do shoreline assessments of each property on a lake. And then that landowner receives a property report outlining how healthy their shoreline, shoreland is and gives different recommendations on how to improve it. A lot of times the recommendation was to plant and to naturalize. But we found even though people were learning about it, um, trying to understand it, they really didn't know where to start. So that's really why we built our natural edge program was to eliminate these barriers to action. So we created the Natural Edge to provide people with the technology and education needed to both understand the problem and make it easier to restore our shorelines and protect our freshwater. And our approach includes the use of our self-developed Natural Edge app. So our app, we took the best of industry standards and combined nature-based solutions to create a one-of-a-kind, easy-to-use restoration program. Our app a lot allows our our users to design a restoration plan on site with the landowner in less than an hour. Um, so we can reach more landowners much more quickly and effectively. And this really gives the landowners a chance to participate in designing their plan because they can help select the, the areas to plant. They'll go through the different native species that are recommended and can choose which ones they would prefer um, as we're there to guide them and, and kind of push them along and, and give recommendations on what to include in it. So therefore, working with the landowners, we can design a shoreline that's both environmentally friendly um, and has all those environmental benefits, but still functional for the landowner's lifestyle. So we're still outlining and leaving open how they're getting down to the water. So there's still that, that access way to get down to the dock, get down to the swimming areas, but the majority of their shoreline is then brought back to a more natural state. So we've developed our program and we deliver it throughout Eastern Ontario ourselves, but then we've built it so that we can easily share it with other groups all across Canada. So we provide them with training and support. They have access to our Natural Edge app, all of our tools and resources um, so that they can bring the program and deliver it in their own communities. We have partners in other areas of Ontario, um, as well as outside of Ontario, including New Brunswick, BC, Saskatchewan, and then I'm happy that next year we're bringing on even more partners so we're actually going to be starting to work with 20 new groups um, this is a mix of grassroots groups who work with some conservation authorities and now starting to work with lake associations and volunteers to bring this program to their own lake so next year we'll be starting with groups in nova scotia quebec manitoba um, alberta and continuing in bc and, and ontario as well So as I mentioned, our Natural Edge app, um, that's just a screenshot of, of what um, the app looks like on our, on our iPad. But we've also developed our native plant database. 
And this is available online, uh, but it's also built into the back end of, of the app. And this is what allows us to, to filter through when we are on site. Uh, so the database is based off of Canada's plant hardiness zones to ensure that only the most suitable native plants are selected. So when we're out on site working with the landowners, once we've decided the areas that we're going to plant, we'll take a, take a soil sample to determine soil type, moisture level, look at sunlight availability, and also take into account plant height. Um, because we know there are areas where the landowner would still want to keep those views intact and other areas where we would want to create privacy. So that's all taken into account and it's going to give recommendations based on those factors. I really love to show uh, this infographic um, because using the natural edge and naturalizing our shoreland properties along the St. Lawrence and all freshwater lakes and rivers will really help to secure and protect the land from erosion and protect water quality by slowing runoff, increasing infiltration, and filtering out excess nutrients and toxins. So I, again, love to show this infographic as it really shows the difference between the root systems of a mowed grass or a manicured lawn versus native, native plants. So you can really see how different it would be if you have a shore, uh, shoreland property where there's that manicured lawn and the very short root systems that are there and supposed to be holding their, their uh, land intact. Whereas if you have a mixture of native species with all of these different root systems growing and working together, it really helps to secure that shoreline. So just a few examples of past sites that we've done. Uh, so this is one of my favorite properties. This was also done on, the, on a river. This was the Madawaska River. Um, and we worked with the property owners there as they were suffering from um, erosion, uh, had flooding every spring, and they had a big problem with geese as well. So we worked with them to naturalize and plant 800 potted stock over just a couple days, working with uh, a group of volunteers to get to get the plants in. And you can see what a difference has um, and how much it's changed in just three years. They've left this area as a no mow zone to just naturalize and take over by itself. And I really like this picture because yes, we did plant wildflowers at that site, but not in this area. So that's really how much it has spread um, and filled in over those three years. And so we work with private property owners, um, but we also like to do sites on public lands. And that picture up on the right was actually just taken just a couple weeks ago um, at the Morseburg Waterfront Park, where we worked with the Morseburg Waterfront Advisory Committee and the municipality of South Dundas, as well as a local um, local school to plant about three or 200 native plants, um, or sorry, 300 native plants. And so this is right along a very public park. And we like to do sites like this because then anybody who's visiting the park can come and see what a naturalization is like and hopefully take that information home and implement it on their own property. And then finally, we also do agricultural sites um, to create vegetative buffers to help reduce nutrient loading. Uh, so to date, uh, we've planted over 139,000 native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers and restored over 90 acres of riparian habitat. Um, and then Specifically for the St. Lawrence, since 2021, we have been working with the Mohawk Council of Akwesasne, the River Institute, Raisin Region Conservation Authority, and the Great River Network to naturalize shoreland properties directly within the St. Lawrence area of concern. Um, and in the end, we'll have helped to have planted uh, 12,500 native species along the St. Lawrence River and its tributaries. Uh, so that's it for me. I'll leave it at that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Chloe. I will Thank remind you. the online viewers to add any questions to the YouTube chat if you have anything for Chloe or the following presenters. Um, so we're going to move forward with our next presenter. Um, it's a little bit of a change of schedule if you're following um, on our schedule here. Next up, we have uh, David Bruce Kahn from Barry College and Harvard University. Um, he will be presenting uh, A River Through Time four decades of biological research in the upper St. Lawrence River. So take it away. Just to confirm that you can uh, see my slides there. Yes, looks great. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here again. Uh, usually when I have presented uh, at this symposium, I have presented on a specific uh, project. Uh, in this case, however, I'm going to be going through a lot of uh, different programs that 
we have been doing over the last 34 years, uh, actually, uh, some of them going back almost a complete four decades. So this is going to go very fast. I'm going to go through a lot of slides, talk about a lot of research. Uh, so just hang on, and I hope you'll enjoy this. But uh, I want to acknowledge my wife, Denise, uh, who has been my primary collaborator over the years. But I, this work has actually involved many collaborators at many institutions in many countries over the years, and I appreciate all of them. Uh, we have worked, of course, all across the Great Lakes, but most of our work has been centered on uh, the Upper St. Lawrence River from Lake Ontario on down to about Montreal. And these are the primary places we've worked, mostly in the Thousand Islands region uh, there that you can see, but also in the area around Kingston and as well as uh, Toronto and the North Shore of Lake Ontario. Our work has actually covered five primary areas of biology malacology, entomology, parasitology, epidemiology, and uh, the biggest one, the long-term biological survey. So I'm going to go through each of these and just talk about the highlights of the research that we have done over the years. Uh, first of all, in malacology, we are we have been, for the, since 1985, we've been involved in surveillance, uh, surveillance for gastropods, for freshwater snails throughout the system, both in the tributaries of the St. Lawrence, as well as the St. Lawrence itself and in Lake Ontario. And you can see that we have quite a robust diversity of gastropods in the St. Lawrence system in various habitats. Uh, that includes mostly native species, but you can see at the very bottom, uh, also four species of uh, invasive gastropods that we're quite concerned about. Uh, this is one that we're working on right now, the Chinese mystery snail, Cyphangopoludina chinensis. This occurs in the St. Lawrence as well as the wetlands along the St. Lawrence, as well as well up into the tributaries on both sides of the border. And so we're continuing to work on that. We will actually be back this summer to do additional work, trying to understand the movements of this invasive species, as well as its impact on native gastropods. We got started in all of this back in 1990, actually, when the St. Lawrence River was first being invaded by the zebra mussels and quagga mussels. And of course, you can see on the map there on the right that the, the, the greatest density of these is in the Great Lakes area and all along the St. Lawrence River. So we began a, a survey at that point, and we also began to look at the impacts of uh, the zebra mussels on the native biota, especially the native unionary clams that have strong populations in the river, and we're continuing to work some with that. More recently, uh, the uh, St. Lawrence was invaded by another uh, foreign invader. This the Asiatic clam coming from Asia, uh, Corbicula fluminia. It came mostly into the Southern United States and is more of a warm water species, but just within the last five years, it has come into the St. Lawrence River area, the Ottawa River area, and we have been looking at the distribution there and trying to get an idea of why and how it can move into uh, colder waters, even though it's a more of a warmer water species. Uh, this work actually has been headed up by Tony Riccardi, a friend of many years. Uh, he's at the Red Museum at McGill University. And this is a paper we just published a couple of years ago, uh, our preliminary look at cold tolerance in this species uh, from where I'm currently working down in Tennessee all the way up uh, the area around Montreal. In terms of entomology, most of our work is centered on what are called shad flies by some people, more technically uh, correctly known as caddis flies. Uh, these insects live as larvae in the water They come out once a year and make these uh, tremendous swarms on land. As you can see in the upper left, uh, the larval stages you can see on the lower right and in the major picture. Uh, the one on the lower right is from living specimens that we were studying. Uh, up in the, uh, the the main figure here is from 2022, just a recent uh, survey of navigational buoys in the river, where we're quantifying the numbers uh, that are found all the way from Lake Ontario up into the Cornwall region. You can see this uh, as you move, move up into the area around Cornwall, you, you lose the hydrocycid caddis flies and you get a completely different type of caddis fly. These are hydrocycid caddis flies. Uh, we have been counting these on navigational buoys. We've gotten up to 40 or 4,000, excuse me, larvae per square meter. So these are quite dense, a, a very important uh, organism on the river. Other entomology, as we have more recently in the last three years, started working on looking at mosquitoes in 
uh, the tributaries as well as the St. Lawrence uh, wetlands and so forth. And uh, we found that the, the mosquito populations are quite diverse. 24 species we have identified and the little yellow stars you can see are the sites we have picked out in uh, primarily in New York State, but also right along the border. And again, if you look at this one red arrow, uh, we have uh, found now this uh, Aedes japonicus, uh, an invader from Asia, which is a very important vector of several uh, infectious diseases. And it has established now in the area, even though it is uh, more common farther south. In parasitology, we started out by looking at the uh, worms that were parasitizing the native amphibians, as well as fish in uh, the area in, throughout the St. Lawrence Valley. And we started with frogs. This paper published in 2022 was a survey that showed the variety of, at the top, the nematodes or roundworms, the digenians or flukes, and the cestodes or tapeworms uh, that we had found in frogs inhabiting the area. Uh, we also became very interested in the fish parasites. Uh, one of our really popular game fish in the area for people who live uh, locally is the brown bullhead uh, catfish. And so we looked at the parasites of those and they are infected, uh, about 80% of them are infected with this tapeworm Corallobothium fimbriatum. And we've been focusing on looking at the reproductive and developmental habits of this parasite and how it affects those fish populations. These are just a couple of papers that we've published over the years that look at the reproductive systems and the embryonic systems using electron microscopy to understand these processes. Uh, those fish, by the way, that were directly from uh, the St. Lawrence River uh, in the area around Brockville. Also, we've done a lot of studies with frog parasites. Uh, this is one called Echinostoma trivalvus. Uh, the cercarii or uh, juvenile stages live inside the kidneys of the, uh, both amphibians as well as fish and can cause a lot of damage, including death in large numbers. Uh, they then go from the fish or amphibians into uh, the waterfowl as well as into uh, some mammals, and they can also be quite pathogenic to those. So we have continued to have quite a bit of interest in these. But besides wildlife parasites, we have also been very uh, interested in what can affect human populations. Uh, there are many waterborne, mostly diarrheal parasites that are found throughout the area. Things like Giardia on the left, Cryptosporidium in the middle, um, uh, human infectious microsporidia on the right. We have been looking at those in terms of trying to understand how they move up and down the river uh, and how they uh, affect different areas. To do those, we've actually gone back zebra mussels, using zebra mussels because they're sitting out in the water, uh, filtering large amounts of water every day. We can go out and we can collect the mussels and use them as a sentinel species. We take them into the laboratory, grind them up, uh, and look for the presence of these pathogens using both uh, traditional staining techniques as well as uh, modern molecular techniques such as uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization coupled with uh, immunofluorescent antibody. And so what we can do is we can very, in a very sensitive way, determine where these parasites are present. And this is just an example of a diagram showing all of these pathogens put together, stretching all the way from uh, just west of Toronto, all the way actually up into the Cornwall area. And as you can see, they occur in rather large numbers and at most sites throughout the river, and yet uh, the distribution is not uniform. And so we're still trying to get a better idea of why the distribution varies so much. We've even pointed it more precisely than that, looking here at specific sites in Lake Ontario and in the Thousand Islands region. And you can see that if you break it down into the different pathogen species, you can actually see that there are some areas that are not affected much at all. Others where one particular pathogen would actually outnumber the other pathogens. Again, this is still an exploratory work, but we're happy to say that our methods that we're using on the St. Lawrence River have now been picked up and are being used in major navigable rivers all over the world. We do a lot of this using not only the zebra mussels as sentinel monitors, but using the navigational buoys. And so that brings us to our last major set of studies. Uh, we're doing long-term uh, biological survey of a variety of species up and down the river into Lake Ontario. And we use the navigational buoys because of course they are set at the same spot every year, but they're brought out on land during the winter when the seaway closes. And 
we can go and we can uh, look at these, examine them in January uh, at places like Scott, Ontario, where they are put ashore. And we get a lot of information from that. And now we have 34 years, uh, broken up a little bit, but 34 years of data. Very few data sets over that period of time. So we're quite excited about this. And we're still continuing this. Uh, we will be doing, for example, in January, we will be uh, up on the St. Lawrence River in the week of January to examine the buoys. And just to show you, this is from the 2008 navigation year. Uh, this is from the Cornwall area. And you can see the hydropsychic caddis flies here. Jump forward to 2021, two years ago. This is the same buoy, number 16. So exactly the same spot, uh, quite a few years later. And you can still see all of the little bumps underneath the algal ring. Uh, all of those are the hydrocycle caddis flies that show that this particular group of caddis flies have maintained their populations quite well, even though they are competing directly with things like the zebra mussels that uh, uh, both of them are fi filter feeders. So it's giving us a lot of information on uh, the impact of invasive species as well as the continuing health of native populations in the benthic environment of the, the river. Uh, we can also get a distribution of trends. So you can see as you go up and down the river, uh, the blue on the upper right, those are the hydrocycids up near the Cornwall region. As you move uh, upstream, you get brachycentrids, which are more common in the narrow parts of the river uh, and uh, displace uh, the hydrocycids. And then as you move on down to the Thousand Islands and to the eastern basin of Lake Ontario, uh, both of those insects are replaced by a, an ecologically similar group of arthropods, amphipod crustaceans uh, that you see in the purple. We're also, we have a lot of data on the specifics, going from the left to the right, uh, of changes in uh, size of populations over the years. And so again, uh, we have 34 years of change uh, this one, I won't take time to really point out the details, but basically what it shows is that, is that over uh, a number of years, we have had a, a great decrease in the number of brachycentric flies uh, throughout that narrow stretch of the river, we think due to uh, the people muscle. So with that, I want to just turn it back over to the chair and uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um... So we're gonna move ahead. Next, we have Hannah Gingrich. Uh, she's from Environment and Climate Change Canada, and her title is Assessing Whether Lake Ontario Can Sustain Healthy Phytoplankton Communities. So you can go ahead, Hannah. Just trying to share. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Um, yeah, looks good. Okay, awesome. So, um, Hi, my name is Hannah Gingrich, and I'm a fifth year marine and freshwater biology co-op student at the University of Guelph. And I'm currently in my last co-op work term with Environment and Climate Change Canada in the Watershed Hydrology and Ecology Research Division, being supervised by Dave DePew. And over the last six months, I've gotten the opportunity to join a project looking at whether Lake Ontario can sustain healthy phytoplankton and algal communities. So this lake or this map here shows the Great Lakes and their cumulative stress using a multi-stress index. And it's looking at factors such as pollutants, invasive species, runoff, anthropogenic influences, and climate change. And we can see the eastern most lakes being Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, they're appearing to be the, among the most stressed lakes. And these lakes have large coastal communities, high levels of industrialization, agricultural runoff, and so much more, which can influence the stress that they're experiencing. But if we shift our perspective to looking at this Great Lakes profile, we can see the change in elevation that occurs from Lake Superior all the way down to Lake Ontario. And so Lake Ontario is receiving its water from the other Great Lakes, where it accumulates their toxins, pollutants, and runoff. And despite all this, Lake Ontario is a highly productive freshwater ecosystem that supports a diverse range of life. 
So life in aquatic ecosystems begins through primary productivity, where algae and aquatic plants are able to convert sunlight and carbon dioxide into oxygen and sugar. The algae is then consumed by zooplankton and other aquatic organisms, such as mussels or minnows, as seen on the screen. And the food chain then continues from there, making this a very important concept of energy transfer. But going back to primary productivity, algae is one of the most important primary producers and it, it, and it is influenced by factors such as nutrient availability, water temperature, and light availability. And the production of oxygen by algae supports the foundation for all aquatic food webs. And algae can be split into two categories. So the first is microalgae or phytoplankton, which is microscopic single-celled or multi-celled organisms. Um, and they produce a significant amount of oxygen, but they're limited by nutrient levels, temperature, and light availability. So studying them can help to better understand nutrient cycling and the overall health of aquatic organisms. Macroalgae are the second type of algae, and they're larger multicellular algae, such as Cladophora, and they provide habitat for many aquatic organisms. They're primary producers that contribute to energy flow, and so understanding their dynamics is important for understanding how to manage coastal ecosystems as their overgrowth can lead to ecological imbalances, such as decreased oxygen levels in water. Algae is a nutritious food source for zooplankton and other herbivorous organisms, and they're a crucial link between primary producers and higher trophic levels. So zooplankton, such as the daphne on the screen, they play an important role in the grazing of algae, regulating algal blooms, and maintaining water clarity. So monitoring their, their populations is very important in assessing the overall health and productivity of aquatic ecosystems. Phosphorus is an essential macronutrient for primary producers, and it's often a limiting factor in many aquatic ecosystems. Given recent management efforts to reduce nutrient concentrations and the recent collapse of the pelagic food web, our main research question is to determine whether there are sufficient nutrients to support high rates of primary productivity along the north shore of Lake Ontario. So we're hoping to collect evidence that may suggest site-specific nutrient managements are required as opposed to the current whole lake management approaches. We are additionally looking at how primary productivity varies along a nutrient gradient, which may contribute to emerging food web issues. We're looking to assess whether Lake Ontario's food web is driven by top-down or bottom-up processes. So in a bottom-up scenario, the availability of nutrients regulates primary production, which subsequently affects higher trophic levels. And in a top-down scenario, the abundance and activity of top predators influences the lower trophic levels. So to do this, we're looking at how the net primary productivity changes along a nutrient gradient and the effect that a nutrient gradient has on algae and zooplankton communities. We're ultimately looking at how primary productivity impacts oxygen concentration and habitat quality for higher trophic levels. So the first way that we're looking to test this is through a dialysis array approach. And here is a look at an individual array. So each array has four dialysis bags, which are suspended between the array structure. And dialysis bags are semi-permeable membranes that allow them to maintain their contents while allowing the exchange of nutrients from the, their environments, so that the external concentration of nutrients is equal to the internal inside the bag. And each bag is reflecting a different aspect of the lake ecosystem. So the first dialysis bag contains 0.2 grams of cladophora. The next contains a low density phytoplankton community, which is the ambient population. We then have a high density phytoplankton community, which has double the ambient concentration. And our last is a high density plus grazers condition, where we will have the concentrated phytoplankton communicate community um, with a pre-allocated density of zooplankton grazers. And we combine all of this with a hobo light logger and a phosphorus puck, and this will allow us to monitor the light and nutrient conditions that each treatment is opposed to. So our goal for this particular experiment is to determine whether there are sufficient nutrients to support primary productivity or whether there's another limiting factor. And here's just a picture of one of our arrays um, in the field. So now we can zoom out and see how the arrays were deployed. So at each station, we had two moorings. And um, one mooring was located 
near shore at 15 meters depth, while the other was located in the pelagic region at 40 meters depth. And each mooring consists of a buoy and three dialysis arrays positioned at approximately two meters, six meters, and 10 meters below the surface. And we deployed this setup at three different sites along a nutrient gradient. So we had Coburg, which had low nutrients, Humber, which had high nutrients, and Oakville was an intermediate. We retrieved these arrays approximately every two weeks to collect their samples and refurbish them between July and October. So the next way that we're looking to address the research question is through the use of an eddy covariance system. And this monitors how much oxygen is being produced by the clodophore algae that lives on the lake bed. So in doing this, we hope to determine whether there's a difference in the amount of oxygen being produced by algae in areas of differing nutrient concentrations. And we combine this data with concurrent measurements of nutrient concentrations and light availability to help identify how nutrient gradients influence oxygen production. Uh, and here's just a picture of the eddy covariance unit being deployed. So here we have some preliminary results. As we previously discussed, Coburg is expected to have low nutrients while Humber is expected to be high in nutrients with Oakville being an intermediate. But looking at the graph, we can see that the Coburg 40 meter Clodophora shows more growth than the Clodophora at Humber 40 meters. And this suggests that even when the nutrients are considered low, they're still likely sufficient to support growth. So the reduced growth in an area of high nutrients, that's likely caused by another limiting factor such as light. We can also see that there was more growth in Humber 15 meters than in Coburg 15 meters. And Oakville 15 appears to have sufficient nutrients as well as more light than Humber. So from this, we can see that it's likely not nutrients alone that have to be high enough to support primary productivity. It's likely nutrients and light limitations depending on the site specific characteristics, but also energy transfer. So this project is ongoing. So we're just beginning to process our data, but here are some of the other parameters that we're looking at. We used phosphorus pucks to evaluate the level of phosphorus present at each treatment and depth where the dialysis arrays were deployed. We're looking at chlorophyll content, comparing the contents of the dialysis bags to their initial value to determine the growth. We used hobo light loggers to collect data on the amount of light that is reaching the arrays at each depth. We're looking at the production of oxygen that the clodophora produces on the lake bed. Next, we're doing stable isotope analyses to better understand the transfer of energy between trophic levels. And finally, the last thing we're doing is we're looking at the types of phytoplankton present at each site to evaluate the quality of food sources. So for example, cyanobacteria is not a quality food source while green algae and diatoms provide, diatoms provide much better nutritional value to the species that consume them. And by looking at the phytoplankton community assemblage at each site, we can make inferences of the quality of the lower aquatic food web to support higher level grazing and energy transfer. And this supplements the stable isotope analyses. So from this, we can see whether it's a grazing issue or whether there's simply not enough phytoplankton present to see whether this is a top down or bottom up process. So with these parameters, we hope to further evaluate the research question. I'd like to give a big thank you to Dave DePew, Andy Bramberger, and Tyler Harrell Lyle for allowing me to work on this project and present on it today. Thank you for listening and here are both my work and school emails if you have any questions. Awesome, thank you, Hannah. Um, so next up in the session, we have Alan Chan from Queen's University. And the title of his presentation is a molecular assay for highly specific field detection and identification of the boreal chorus frog. So Alan, you can take it away when you're ready. Hello. Hi. Let me share my screen. Everything visible? Yes, looks good. Great. 
Okay, today I'll be presenting some of the work done by uh, my undergrad thesis student last year, David Griffin, on creating a molecular assay for the highly specific field detection and identification of a species at risk, the boreal chorus frog, or Stachrus maculata. So there are many challenges, and I um, how do I get rid of the bar at the top? It's kind of blocking some things. Wait, there we go. My apologies. Uh, there are many challenges in amphibian detection and identification, um, and amphibians are some of the most threatened vertebrates, uh, with over 40% of populations globally under threat. Detecting and identifying amphibians is critical for effective conservation policy for local, um, for locating critical wetland habitat, as well as um, where populations actually are. However, morphological identification can be very difficult to the similarities between related species, such as the boreal and western chorus frogs in Ontario, uh, their small size, harsh field conditions, and complex life histories. Additionally, non-local or rare amphibians, um, especially salamanders, can be quite difficult to detect, especially as current wetland assessment uh, relies on calls. Um, so in healthcare, there's a concept called point of care testing. Uh, it's where diagnostics are applied by the patient's bedside. And this reduces turnaround time and allows for rapid treatment. So instead of blood work being sent off to a lab, um, ideally it's applied by the patient. Uh, so this includes things such as rapid COVID tests uh, in recent years, also things like glucometers and older devices such as heart rate monitors. Um, point of care testing improves prognosis by increasing the speed of diagnos diagnosis, uh, which is highly related to better outcomes. Uh, it makes patient it makes physician time more efficient and um, it reduces the cost of infrastructure needed and ecological monitoring can capitalize this, on this concept and advances in this field uh, examples would include water quality sensors microfluidic nucleic acid detection for invasive species and rapid immunoassays for uh, waterborne toxins a key benefit of point of care testing for ecological monitoring is that uh, we're now no longer linked to an academic lab. Um, and so there's a great deal of scalability and tests can be given out to citizen scientists. Um, one tool that's uh, that can be very useful for point of care testing is environmental DNA and DNA barcoding. So environmental DNA is genetic material released by organisms as they interact with their environment. And this is in the form of things like shut off skin cells, hair, gametes, feces, and by collecting an air sample, a water sample, or a soil sample, um, we can detect these organisms without directly capturing them. Uh, with DNA barcoding, we can use non-invasive tissue swabs, such as just swabbing the back of a frog, or a non-lethal tissue collection method, such as clipping off a toe. We can use this for early detection of invasive species, uh, surveying cryptic, rare, or at-risk species, identifying morphologically difficult species, or even describing whole ecosystem trophic interactions between many different species. However, there's many issues with current methods in eDNA um, barcoding processing. A lot of methods of eDNA processing requires lab infrastructure as well as clean DNA, which makes it very difficult to use in the field and by citizen scientists. It's limited by PCR inhibition, which is very common in some environmental samples, especially marshlands. Uh, they require large apparatus and long processing times, which makes them unsuitable for field use. And often there's significant turnaround time and expertise required. Um, even for single species detection, sometimes we need weeks to go from sampling to analysis. Um, so to set out to solve these problems, uh, my lab started working on uh, loop-mediated isothermal amplification in the last few years. So it's, it's an emerging method for DNA amplification detection, uh, which was developed in the last 20 years. It uses high strand displacement BST polymerase for isothermal amplification. So in contrast, PCR-based methods use high temperatures. And by thermal cycling or cooling and heating, um, it achieves amplification. However, lamp only requires a heating source to reach 60 to 70 degrees, which is very easy to do with a block heater and a thermistor. It's received extensive recent interest in point of care health um, healthcare, especially in ID and diseases. So instead of sending off samples to a lab for tissue for culturing and such, all we need to do is um, have a lamp assay running by the patient's bedside. And there's actually two COVID tests on the market that use lamp these days. The way LAMP works is it uses six primers, which makes it highly specific. So a large number of base pairs 
on the lamp assay needs to match with the target DNA. It produces self-propagating reactions with a stem loop DNA structure, as you can see in the bottom here. Uh, it's resistant to PCR inhibition, and it's efficient on crude lysate and non-purified DNA, which is critical for field use. And it can be very rapid. Detection can be achieved as little as 10 minutes in the literature, and products can be very quickly visualized with a pH indicator dye. So the reaction literally just turns from uh, yellow to red or some other colors uh, when it detects something, or by turbidity, so it turns cloudy. Uh, if you want to learn more about LAMP, please contact me afterwards. So for this project, we had two goals. We wanted to design and use a LAMP assay for the eDNA detection, as well as crude lysate identification of the boreal chorus frog, Sudacris maculata. And we want to make a protocol for a field-ready, community science-friendly LAMP assay for the rapid, infrastructure-free, robust uh, detection and identification of species at risk in general, as well as invasive species. So our first step for this was designing and validating our primers. Um, so we had six total steps of that. Uh, in silico primer design, specificity testing, sensitivity testing, a validation on environmental DNA, and validation on crude lysate. So to design our primers, we selected cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 sequences, which is a common barcoding gene, and we picked areas of the gene with high numbers of database entries, high intraspecific variation, so high variation between different species, and low intraspecific variation, so low variation within the same species. So this ideally would allow us to distinguish one species from another, but also get all members of that species. So we inputted the target sequence into a LAMP primer design tool, and we used expanded manufacturer recommendations. This generated seven primer sets, and we tested the primers in silico, so on the computer against a database, and uh, based off of that, it should all work. However, um, things that work on the computer are often work in real life. So we also the assessed the primer sets in vitro or um, in the lab on a Q CFX96 qPCR machine platform. The reason we use the qPCR machine platform was because it can both maintain a temperature of 65 degrees and also read the fluorescence of the reaction. So we add a bit of fluorescence dye. For this, we used a positive control, which is extracted genomic DNA from a boreal coarse frog, uh, negative control, double distilled water, as well as a uh, negative control in the form of um, DNA from nine frog species, which co-occur in Ontario. So we want to see that our assays would amplify our target frog, not amplify water, and not amplify other frogs. We then tested the three most promising assays for sensitivity. So only three out of seven of our assays actually worked. Um, it turns out the manufacturers were right, and their um, parameters were the best ones. We used synthetic DNA um, with known copies per volume, and we examined the limit of detection, which is the lowest number of detectable copies of DNA, as well as how fast the reaction took. Uh, thirdly, we tested our assay in real-world scenarios with actual environmental DNA. So we took DNA samples from 24 sites that we collected in 2020 and 2021 across eastern and southern Ontario. These samples were previously validated by expert observations, so acoustics and visual. We actually caught frogs in those locations and ID'd them, as well as droplet digital PCR, which is a gold standard in single species and uh, gene detection. And from digital PCR, we knew the actual DNA concentrations in these samples. We also tested our best performing assay on frog crude lysate, which is a field-friendly DNA extraction method that we created. So we simply took a toe clip or a frog swab. Uh, we pulverized the sample in buffer with a pipette tip. So we use a pipette tip and a tube as a tiny mortar pestle setup. We heated the, the whole thing at 95 degrees in a block heater, um, basically making a little bit of frog soup. Uh, and then we vortexed it, we shook it up. And this ideally broke down the cells in our sample. We then spun this down and used the liquid portion as our template for our assay. And it worked. Um, so here are our results in vitro. So our best performing assay detected synthetic DNA in under 25 minutes in pretty much all concentrations. So on the right, we have a table of template concentration to time to detection. So 10 to the 3 copies, 1,000 copies were detected in 23 minutes. And then um, with the best performing app, uh, with um, higher concentrations of DNA, 10 to the nine copies, uh, detection was achieved in under 10 minutes, which is faster than qPCR is capable of. Sensitivity was overall comparable to qPCR, uh, and one copy of DNA was detectable per microliter of reaction. So this table actually extends much further down, but there was no room on the slide. And here's just our sensitivity curve with darker colors representing lower concentrations of DNA. So on the y-axis, we have concentration of DNA. On the x-axis, we have time. So higher concentrations detected earlier, as expected. 
And these are our results on environmental DNA. On the right side, we have a map of sampling locations. So the Kingston's on the bottom left, Rockport's on the right side, and then Toledo's on the top side. Uh, red here indicates that it was a non-detection, green was a detection. Um, on the left side, we have a table showing the same thing as the map. Uh, the top half of the table were samples that did not have any digital PCR detections and had no visual or acoustic detections. On the bottom, we have areas that had visual detections and acoustic detections, as well as digital PCR. It's notable that LAMP was able to detect um, the boreal chorus frog signal, even when the digital PCR signal was as low as 0.32 copies per microliter, um, as well as when it was as high as over a million copies per microliter. So LAMP performed as well as digital PCR in all conditions. It's important to note that LAMP cannot quantify DNA though, unlike digital PCR. Finally, we have our results on crude lysate. Uh, so we took toe clips, uh, small tissue samples from the boreal chorus frog, the western chorus frog, as well as the spring peeper. Uh, and then we ran our LAMP assay on the crude lysate uh, with the method I outlined before. And we found that only boreal chorus frog amplified and it amplified pretty well. So this shows that even if we just took a little swab or a tiny bit of tissue in the field, we can detect what species it is, identify between these closely related species with a LAMP assay. Um, finally, I'm gonna give you a cost comparison between uh, quantitative PCR, which is the most common method of uh, single species detection in environmental DNA and LAMP. So quantitative PCR requires a qPCR machine, which is usually in the $30,000 to $50,000 range while LAMP only requires something that heat a sample up to 65 degrees. Uh, Thermal Fisher sells a block heater for $1,000, uh, but you can DIY a block heater for around $30. Uh, the primers and probes for the reaction uh, are also much cheaper for LAMP. Uh, the, best, the, be the best performing form of qPCR is probe-based qPCR, and the probes cost roughly $360 for a total of around $400 for a set of primers and probes. Uh, this does last you 4, 000, uh, around 1,000 reactions, though. However, LAMP only costs around $20 to $25 for the primers. LAMP is more expensive per reaction at $3 per reaction for the re uh, reagent mix. Um, but the low amortization cost of the apparatus means that it's overall a much more economical choice. And also, it has much greater downscalability. Um, smaller numbers of samples can be processed without using a, uh, investing a large qPCR machine. Finally, sample processing costs are much lower for LAMP as well. Um, because we can use very crude methods of DNA extraction, um, sampling uh, DNA extraction costs can be as low as just 10 cents compared to qPCR, which requires pure DNA. And um, the kits required for purified DNA are as much as $20 per sample. So in conclusion, our assay could rapidly detect Sudacris maculata signal from eDNA or crude lysate with high sensitivity and specificity. The simplified apparatus uh, compared to qPCR reduces amortization costs and makes it ideal for field detection. It's usable on swab or toe clip samples extracted in the field with heat or lysis or, or buffer only, which gives us a crude lysate. And the most exciting thing about LAMP is there's already healthcare products available on the market. Uh, a company called Lucera makes a LAMP test for COVID, which costs $50 to $100. Um, so it's already proven for the field of healthcare. So in our in the future, we hope to do a bit more product development for field or citizen science use, as well as on other invasive, uh, other species at risk in invasive species. So if you have any questions, please direct them to my email, alan.tn at queensu.ca. And thank you to our funders, as well as uh, uh, contributors to this project and other members of my lab. Thank you, Alan. Um, so, we do have one more presentation for the session, and it's going to be myself. Um, so I'm just going to get my slides up here. Give me one moment. All right. Here we are. Okay, so <laughs> my name is Mackenzie Wiley Arvik, and I'm a research biologist at the River Institute, and I'm working mainly on the Great River Report, um, but I'm also helping along with other projects. And um, this paper here that I've been collaborating with uh, Matt Wendell and Christina Charette is about um, the recent range expansion of the tube nose goby in the upper St. Lawrence River. Um, so I'm just going to go through 
where we're at right now with the paper and the findings. Um, sorry. I do just want to start off with some background information, starting with invasive ecology. Um, so it's important to note that although there are um, a high frequency of non-native introductions in the um, in a lot of freshwater ecosystems, not all of them necessarily become invasive. It really comes down to the how the uh, new species is able to adapt depending on their traits in the new environment. Um, and a lot of the time it is degraded habitats uh, that invasives are able to do quite well. Um, so it comes down to the environmental conditions. Um, and one thing to note, a lot of the times in uh, the in literature within um, invasive research, it seems that there's a high frequency of Eurasian or Ponto Caspian species that are being introduced, um, being introduced and also become invasive in um, freshwater ecosystems. And this uh, could be due to the vectors of introduction attributing to the introduction the uh, non-natives introduction, so particularly shipping um, activity, but this may also have to do with um, this region being particularly um, good at evolving species with invasive traits. So uh, those that have high tolerance to environmental heterogeneity are generalists, um, things like that. So just to name off a few Eurasian invasives that are within our system, uh, there's the round goby, the dry snid mussels, Eurasian milfoil, and the common reed, and they become very abundant in our system. Um, so that's why tube nose is kind of of concern because it is from this region. Uh, so uh, the ecosystem of concern, we've talked about it a bit already throughout the symposium, is the upper St. Lawrence River. Um, and this is a very susceptible ecosystem. And in general, freshwater systems are susceptible, but particularly because of the geographic location of the Upper St. Lawrence River, um, it is a highway for commercial shipping because it's um, in between the Atlantic Ocean and the Great Lakes. Um, so this is a big highway for uh, commercial activities. And as well, um, it's very popular spot for recreational activity. So in a lot of ways, other human activities have degraded the, the system, um, which may aid in the uh, establishment and expansion of new non-natives. So the tube nose goby uh, as a species, um, like I said, it is from the uh, Eurasian region um, in the Ponto Caspian uh, freshwater systems. And it is a, it, most likely originated uh, because of shipping ballast water that was brought here from this region. And it was first detected in 2011 in the Upper St. Lawrence River um, and has since expanded uh, greatly throughout the system. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the round goby, which is another uh, invasive goby species. So you kind of think to compare the two, um, which we'll get into a bit later, but it is good to note that um, the round goby had a much faster expansion and the tube nose is has taken a bit uh, more time to, uh, I guess, gain more gain more area. Um, so this is an interesting point. And also, just want to um, just want to note here because we're going to get into these this in the results um, with the literature. It does seem that tube nose do frequent more rocky substrates and moderate aquatic macrovite cover. So this is something that we wanted to look at to see if um, our data overlapped with these findings. So the objectives of the study, we wanted to determine, of course, the tube nose goby temporal and spatial trends, so how it's expanded over time, um, as well as identify the most important environmental predictors of this species uh, population density. So in order to uh, collect data, or the data that it was used for this paper, um, came from the FIN survey, so the Fish Identification Nearshore Survey, um, which is set up at the River Institute. Matt Wendell leads this. I'm sure a lot of you um, have heard of this, this project. And it's been going on since 2015, and the 2023 season just came to a close, um, I believe this last month. So within this survey, um, basically each, each survey involves um, monitoring the different characteristics of habitat, starting with the fish diversity. So there's the SANE net um, surveys that occur. So we look at fish diversity. Um, we 
are able to measure, identify, and then count the fish species. And then there's also plant diversity and plant cover that is looked at, um, habitat characteristics such as water quality, um, and we note any uh, invasive species, any invas um, species at risk. And there's also uh, drone surveys and as of 2021, eDNA surveys. So there's a lot that goes into um, the, the FINS project. And from here, we're able to uh, use this data for many um, uh, indicators for the river report and now um, to look at the tube nose and um, what's happening with the species um, in the past few years. So we'll start off with objective number one and look at the spatial trends of the tube nose goby. So here the map series is just showing you um, from 2018, which was the first year of, uh, of um, documentation for the fin survey uh, down to 2023. So as you can see, the small yellow dots indicate the uh, survey sites for each year. And then the, the, the larger colorful dots for each year represents where the tube nose goby is present. So it's very clear that the expansion um, has increased over time. And if you look more recently in 2022 and 2023, um, they're around the same kind of area, but it does seem that the density is increasing in the uh, Quebec waters of Lake St. Francis. Um, so it, it, the tube nose does continue to move forward downstream and uh, most likely will move, will move further downstream as uh, time passes. And then here we have a figure to represent the spatial variation in density. So the lighter color shows the higher density and then the darker color is uh, much lower density. Um, so we've put little points here to kind of demonstrate where we're at. Um, so starting with Kingston and then ending in Valleyfield downstream. Um, and it's very clear that Kingston has the, um, the highest density. And this is actually right around where the initial detection was for the tube nose goby. So it does make sense that density is higher in this area. And of course, as you move down, it's it's lower. Um, so most likely as time passes, the areas that are a little lighter green are gonna become more yellow um, as the expansion continues and those populations increase um, with time. And now temporal trends, we'll just quickly go over these. This is just a very simple graph showing um, just the linear increase in density over time. Um, and this is for the all of the sites um, for each year. So there's a clear linear trend going on here um, that will most likely continue on into the future. And finally, environmental predictors. So here, just gonna uh, try to explain this figure. It is, it is a little different from the other ones. Um, so I've highlighted here, uh, circled tube nose goby in red. Um, so that's, so um, in comparison to other species, um, when we're looking at the arrows that are here, this is showing the uh, density of species in specific habitats. So the longer the arrow, the higher the density. As you can see, tube nose is a little shorter, so it's not necessarily dominating um, the habitats, but they are still present. Um, and if you look at the arrows in blue, these are environmental um, characteristics. So for instance, macrophyte cover um, is pointed in the same direction as tube nose, which indicates that tube nose will most likely frequent in high macrophyte covered habitats. And the same goes for that soft substrate arrow, it's pointing um, into the same kind of direction. So this is most likely overlapping with that species based on the data that we collected. Um, and one thing to note also that's interesting is tube nose is almost pointing in the exact opposite direction of round goby, so they're negatively correlated. So it seems that a lot of the time when we're catching round gobies, we're not catching tube nose and vice versa. Um, and I think it, yeah, this is only for 2021, but um, we're just showing one year to kind of represent uh, how it was going. And um, one other thing as well, just going back to the um, introductory slides, I did mention how uh, it seemed that rocky substrates uh, were preferred or were seen to overlap with uh, tube nose presence. And although this these results don't necessarily show this same result, um, it is 
important to note that it, this could be due to potential uh, methodology. So we did use stain fishing for, for the fish surveys. And uh, this doesn't necessarily um, capture all the fish species. And because tube nose is a quite small species, it could be hiding underneath uh, these rocky substrates if they are there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't in rocky substrates. This is just based on um, the data with the methodology that we used. All right, so just some uh, some quick conclusions. Obviously, the tube nose has been increasing over time in uh, both uh, temporal and spatial trends. Um, the highest density is seen in Kingston, which aligns well with its initial detection point. Um, and as of 2023, it looks as if the invasion front is in Lancaster, Ontario, which is just um, over in the Quebec waters of or it's just on the brink of going to the Quebec waters on the Lake St. Francis side. Um, although MFFP um, have been doing extensive uh, monitoring on their side and have actually um, detected the tube nose on that side. So this is something um, we're gonna be trying to collaborate with them and see if we can get that data. Um, as well as with John Farrell, I know he has data for a tube nose. So we're gonna try to compile and bring all that together for this paper. Um, and of course, like we said, the high macrophyte cover and soft substrates, these are the kinds of habitats that we're, uh, we expect to be seeing the tube nose most likely uh, based on these results. And finally, kind of bringing it all together, why is this important? Why are we worried about this species? Um, and I think one of the biggest takeaways, I mean, for the FINS project that we have such a big data set, um, it's one of the, the largest for the tube nose and it's, bring everything together, we're able to see characteristics both before and after invasion um, when we're bringing all of all the data together, um, especially with the drone surveys, um, we're able to compare between, you know, the start of the summer to the end of the summer. And then when we look back in later, later years, we can, we can compare exactly how a habitat um, once was the, the state of it, um, and just see what kind of uh, long-term impacts have occurred after invasions. So this is really important work to, work being done here. And we're also able to um, kind of highlight the drivers of invasive populations. So with the tube nose particularly, there's most likely downward larval drift and um, also like recreational activities are probably contributing to it, like um, local ballast water exchange uh, between river sections and between the Great Lakes, for instance. Um, and also when we look at the environmental predictors, um, it's it's important to note how soft substrate, high macrophyte cover, it does kind of um, correlate with wetland type habitats. So unlike other species that um, may veer away from these type of habitats, wetlands may not be safe from tube nose and other new invaders coming in. So it's important to understand these potential impacts moving forward and monitor um, monitor these effects. Uh, and of course, as we, we've we talked about a bit um, in other presentations, up and coming technologies such as eDNA is gonna be so important for early detection and being able to um, catch things early on and not allow things to expand and impact in the way that they've done in the past. Um, yeah, so that's all I have right now. If you have any questions, we're gonna move into the question period now for anyone who have dropped questions in the YouTube chat. And I'm just going to quickly stop sharing my screen while the other presenters uh, join in. OK, I'm going to, I see here on the YouTube live, I have a couple questions coming in. I'm just going to make sure we're all here. OK, perfect. So. Um, from Lee Magahi to Alan, she said, "Great talk. Would like to re would like to connect you to Bojan, who will be presenting in the last session today, as the work you're doing would complement his work very well." Because uh, I know Bojan is, is actually on. my lab member, and we, we work very closely already. Okay, perfect, amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lee just wanted to make sure. Um, and then I have one here from. The Adams for myself. Uh, how can you explain that the tube nose goby expansion was slower 
than the round gobies. Um, so yeah, this is this is just based on um, other other literature. Um, we we haven't done that exact um, temporal and spatial analysis, um, but this this just comes with um, the connection between dryasid mussels kind of invading beforehand and then rowan gobies coming in and uh, basically expl exploding because their um, native prey item was also here it just happened to be that overlap um, but yeah it did it did happen um, in a much shorter period of time um, it, it was 2011 that they came in and, and only now is it kind of making its way all over the upper St. Lawrence River um, so just just through literature we're able to to identify that that it is slower. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, and then I'm gonna open the floor maybe while we wait for a couple other questions if anyone has them. If anyone else on uh, from the session has any questions for each other, um, I don't know if anyone had anything. I have a couple I wrote down, so if if not, I can go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna read mine. <laughs> um, what did I have here? So for for Chloe, I know that you mentioned um, like the most the ideal situation for naturalized naturalizing shores would be seventy five percent. I'm wondering, do you know the state of naturalization right now? And potentially, if we're trying to get to that goal of seventy five percent, like how um, how long it could take, or you know how how realistic it could be within the next amount of years i don't i don't have those numbers uh that's our goal but that would it'd be a big survey i think to figure out where we are on that scale um mm -hmm. it's something we would like to it to know about and to achieve but it, it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah i don't exactly have those numbers right now mm -hmm. okay i'm just wondering i loved your presentation by the way <laughs> thank you um and then uh bruce I had one for you. It's it's kind of like it's kind of relevant, but not really. Just because you have all this history on the river and and going through thirty plus years of surveying the the buoys, um, I'm just wondering if you if you've seen anything firsthand over time, like that's really caught your eye in regards to like um, like the season, because it is it is winter, right around January. Are you seeing any big changes that? Um, that are surprising in regards to like climate change or um, just the the density of of species on these buoys. Um, I'm just interested to see, yeah, if you've if you've seen big changes in regards to that. Well, it's a great question, and um, of course, it's a complicated thing to answer, especially when you de are dealing with climate change. But on top of that, you've got invasive species moving in. Uh, you ha have other kinds of uh, things taking place. It's hard to know. Uh, what is the cause or, or what is related to any changes you see. But we definitely have seen a lot of changes. The river has changed a lot. Uh, you, uh, you know, the, the gobies are a good example uh, having an impact on things. Um, what we have seen in the river, uh, the biggest changes I have noticed since 1985 going up until today, almost 40 years, is there certain species of these caddisflies, especially the brachycentric caddisflies that occupy a zone basically in the Brockville Narrows, what we call the Brockville Narrows area, uh, going from about Brockville up to Cardinal. Uh, we used to have very, very large numbers of caddisflies, brachycentric and canis. Uh, we, in some of the scuba surveys we did during the summer, we got up to 17,000 larvae per square meter of bottom. Uh, and those have dropped to very, very low levels. Meanwhile, in the area around Cornwall, these hydrocycid caddisflies have maintained their populations quite strongly. So it's an interesting thing looking at uh, two different caddisflies that have slightly different preferences for substrate and food. One has been, we believe, uh, outcompeted and mostly decimated by the invasive mussels. The other, the ones near Cornwall, have held their ground and have actually kept. Uh, it's very hard to find any Dreisinid mussels on the buoys around the Cornwall area, uh, and yet you find them all covered with these you know, other insects. Uh, there's some other small trends that we've seen, um, changes in the uh, a, an increase in the abundance of 
uh, limpets, for example, freshwater limpets in certain parts of the river. Uh, but, and there's been a change in the proportionality of the two different Dreissenid species over the years. Uh, so it, definitely we see some trends. What we can attribute those things to, that's a, a bit more difficult. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting, especially with the, the large differences just between river sections that really aren't that, I mean, they're, they're far enough, but yeah. Um, that's that's awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. I I did have um another question come in um for yourself as well. Sandra is wondering if you work in Prescott area or if you did work in Prescott area um in the 1980s regarding shad flies, caddis flies. Is this Sandra Wong or yeah? Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, my wife and I and we knew her a lot uh, back then. Uh, we were working a lot with the shad flies in that area at the time, and we still are. And uh, we do, uh, you know, most of the buoys all the way from Lake Ontario all the way down to Lake St. Francis. Uh, those are managed by the Canadian Coast Guard. They put most of those on shore at the Prescott Coast Guard facility. So we go there each year. We were there uh, back in January of this year. We'll be there again two months from now, January of 2024. Mm -hmm. And um, when we, we still see a few of the shad flies, but not in nearly the swarms that occurred there back when Sandra is talking about. And that's where we think they have been pretty much uh, knocked out by the Dracenids. Right. But yes, Prescott remains a major focus of our activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, I had I wrote I wrote a little note here, Alan. I was wondering, could you explain what you mean by synthetic DNA? I'm just like interested how that. Yeah. Works. So there's two types of synthetic DNA. Um, there's clone synthetic DNA is basically DNA that's been manufactured for us with a custom. Um, uh, custom sequence of base pairs. Um, there's two types, a linear G-block, which is completely synthetic. It's been built base, base by base. Um, companies like IDT make it. It costs around $100 per um, sequence. And you're usually limited to pretty short sequences. So we use it as a positive control standard. And the other type, which I used, is a cloned plasmid. So we basically insert our sequence into a plasmid, which is a circular piece of DNA, put that into bacteria, grow up the bacteria, and then uh, extract the DNA from the bacteria. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, it was thinking sy like synthetic and DNA was just like odd to me, but that, that does make sense. That's really cool. Um, I'm just looking, refreshing the YouTube chat here. Um, I don't see any others coming in unless any of our other session presenters have anything. Um, I believe we can wrap up. Um, yeah, looks good. Thank you everyone for coming. I believe uh, we were a little ahead of schedule just because we had uh, one presenter that didn't come. So we have a longer break now, I believe. Um, I believe we have 20 minutes before our next session. It will be our last session of the symposium, the Great River Report session. So tune back in in 20 minutes. We'll have the timer set back up so we can see exactly um, when we'll be starting. So yes, thank you everyone for coming and we'll see you later.
Hi, everyone. We're back for the final session of the River Symposium. Thank you for joining us for this final session. It's going to be focused on the Great River Rapport, which is a project that Abe and I have been working on for the last few years together with a really incredible team. And we're going to start the session off with uh, giving a talk by the two of us, so Abram Francis and myself, Lee Magahi, and it'll be followed by presentations by other members of the River Rapport team. So I'll just get my screen up to share with you. All right. So uh, the Great River Rapport, ecosystem health report empowered by story and an indigenous paradigm. And like I said, I'm Lee Magahi, and I've been working on this project for five years now. We're going to be talking to you today about some of the, the overarching principles of this project and also finishing off with some of what we see as the best practices. So um, I'm going to hand over to Abe to introduce himself. And I think I've introduced myself many times over the past couple of days, but my name is Abraham Francis, I'm a dear client from Akwazasne, uh, first year PhD student and founder of the Alunia Collective. Um, and yeah, I've had the wonderful enjoyment of working with Lee McGaffey for the past couple of years. And it's really funny to think about where we began um, with this river, great river report, Ganya de la Juana, um, where this inspiration comes from. And it reminds me of where it really began for me, which was over a cup of coffee with Lee McGaffey and where we connected and we were supposed to get a picture and we never even took the picture. And then she did finally get a picture of me and it was horrible. And then thank goodness for Stephanie Hildebrand coming in and saving the day. <laughs> but that this really is about this communication amongst people and communities around this river as we engage the river with agency from the biocultural foundation of my people and using that with the stories and so many other teachings and lessons that come into this conversation. So yeah, we wanted to talk today about some, the name of the river, so the Great River Rapport. Um, that the word rapport, we we used it intentionally. We didn't want it to be a report as such, where we're just giving information out. We wanted it to be a conversation and where we have, you know, a, a good relationship with the people and a respectful relationship with everyone involved in the project and the information we bring to it. And also the River Rapport really brings together and oh my God, isn't this slide glorious? And thank you to Stephanie for this good, good medicine all right here, but really emphasizing this interconnectivity between the environment and our own health that restoring and protecting the river is also restoring and protecting ourselves. And this, this entire report is founded, as I mentioned, in the Biocultural Foundation of My People, and in particular, a really important speech um, and lesson that we have in teaching, the Ohanda Galiwadakwa, and this teaching that acknowledge all of creation for fulfilling their roles and responsibilities to each other across time. And what I really love about this is just how we've been able to bring so many different scientific pieces into this and have conversations across this boundary. So the project started with us uh, being asked to do a health report on, on the Upper St. Lawrence River. And we wanted this science to be driven by community questions. So we spent the first year and a half asking people along the stretch of the Upper St. Lawrence River what they were concerned about. Um, and the, the stretch of river that we that we cover is from the Thousand Islands down to the Quebec border, so Lake St. Francis, and we've split the river up into five geographical areas. So the Thousand Island, Brockville at Narrows, Lake St. Lawrence, so the Four Bay of the Dam, the Aquasasne, Cornwall, Messina region, and Lake St. Francis. And we had a survey going for the first, actually two and a half years. And in that survey, we learned what people really enjoy to do on the river. We also learned what their concerns were, and we asked an open-ended question to everyone and said, you know, what do you think are the greatest challenges for the Upper St. Lawrence River? And this slide here represents these greatest challenges. So the great five greatest challenges to biodiversity on the planet are climate change, habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, 
and species over exploitation. And so this graphic here just represents the, the these challenges represented for each of those five sections of the river. And you can see that pollution, particularly in the Aquasosne Cornwall, Messina area, um, ranks really highly. But all five challenges are represented here. And also the extra other that's included in the graphic um, was people bringing up concerns around policy and also education and outreach. And so transparency related to the health of the river. We went through a process after we heard from the public about what their concerns were, and we identified 35 ecological indicators. And this process involved 50 scientists, local community members, indigenous partners, the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne, who's our founding partner for the project. And I know that many people have said to me, couldn't you have picked 12 or, you know, 15, something reasonable. 35 indicators is a lot of indicators, but I will say that every time we put the indicators in front of people, for the most part, what they want to know is represented in this project. So we're excited that we managed to pick 35 that were relevant. The project so far has invo involved 39 organizations, 50 scientists, 14 funders, and we've so far pulled together 156 data sets. And I know we'll be pulling together a lot more. And back to the important dimension of the biocultural context, the importance of the Ohanta Kaluwa Dekwa, the relationality that it teaches us and the importance of fulfilling our roles and responsibilities, which ultimately is that foundation for the river rapport. And as a part of this relationality, and I've I've really had the enjoyment of learning and teaching and exploring what does it look like to build meaningful participatory relationships among people, amongst communities. And these are some of those expressions of that, that in this relationality, in these relationships, that we're caring for each other, that reciprocity. We're caring about the environment as relative. And we're caring for kin. Again, another extension of that kinship network that composes who we are as Haudenosaunee people that we're sharing as a part of the River Report. Multivocality. So this is a, a slide which even I have talked about a bit. I am always uh, struggling to bring my personal voice into these stories and Abe is encouraging me to do that. So um, as anyone who knows me knows, I love this project and the work that I do. And so I talk about it with anyone um, who, who's willing to listen and also as we as we learn and as we feel our way through this project and understand what we're really doing I have conversations with uh, you know people that I can use as a sounding board and one of those people is uh, one of those people that I use regularly is my sister Kim and she came up with this word multivocality or, or rather gave me this word and it's such a great word because I think for what we're trying to do with the river rapport is we're trying to make sure that we do represent everybody's voices um, so we're hoping at least we if we haven't managed it so far that we keep striving towards this and that people when they listen to the project and they see the results they can see some of their own voices in the products that we bring forward. Today, we're going to be presenting on some science after this initial presentation. Uh, we have 35 indicators and we have started on 13 of them. Today, members of the research team will present on four of those indicators. So that will be on the amphibians, on invasive species, nutrients, and then also on contaminants, which are found in herring gulls. We take a lot of this science and we put a lot of effort into translating it. So we want people to be able to understand what we're doing. And we use lots of different forms to translate the knowledge. So we, we like it to be in, in various formats that anyone can understand. And so far in translating and mobilizing this knowledge, we've reached almost two and a half thousand people through in-person engagements and over 17,000 people online, which is really impressive when you think of the team. We only have you know a few people on the ground doing this work. Um, and we're really grateful to them for the efforts that they put in to make sure that the work that gets done from the science side is then put out. And we do this uh, through education materials. So Emily DeRochi is a teacher and also an environmental scientist. And she's working with our team to bring together materials that can be shared through schools. And, and this particular series that she's put together is called the Changemaker Series. 
We also have many outreach events, and I think people who are probably listening to this call have maybe been involved in some of these. Um, they also involve many other people from the River Institute, not just the uh, River Report team. And then myself, as well as all the team members, sit down with community members and community groups and have conversations about the river and the health of the river. We also have social media campaigns, which are also really successful in getting the word out on, on what we're doing and um, how we're doing it. I'll give this slide back over to you, Abe. Yeah, and with this one, what I really wanted to just communicate is how empowering it is for the work that we're doing here and the recognition from all the way back to the foundations of what inspired the River Rapport, the purposeful naming that comes into it, but also that yeah, we could have boiled this down into a lot fewer other indicators, but that because we're centering community voices, we're calling in and we're prioritizing that. And that also comes into that multivocality, that multiple ways of knowing and recognizing everyone in this process. And in that way, I think that people can feel empowered through this, that they're not just speaking into the void and offering up perspectives that are just going to be ignored because... <clears throat> some expert told them otherwise. And it's part of that action that we're imbuing into this work that we're doing that the River Report has inspired in so many other places. Thank you, Abe. I'm gonna finish off with just running through nine best practices that, we've, uh, that we'd like to put forward today. And these be best practices are what we've identified as being best practices currently. I'm sure they'll evolve and if we talk about this project you know at a later date they might they might change so we wanted to highlight that we start with a conversation with the people and we commit to listening and actually we commit to listening all the way through the project we're in service to the local communities so that's both the indigenous community and the non-indigenous community we really want to answer the questions that they ask us we know those questions change through time as well we are respecting and including all forms of knowledge in the project, sharing progress at each step of the way. This is, we've found to be really important. As we make progress and we share it, we get new insights from our partners and collaborators. We welcome critique as a mechanism to improve what we're doing. We don't take it personally. We'd like to get it right. So when we make mistakes, we'd like to know about them. We're also open to revisiting our understanding of the ecosystem and refining the work as we go. So that's part of the point before where we're listening to critique to make improvements. Committed to knowledge, translation and mobilization. We've touched on that already for the number of people we've already reached through the project. We really want to make the science accessible. So staying the distance, striving for consensus, uh, which is another Point that comes from our Indigenous partners where we're really wanting there to be consensus on the project. We have to remember to slow down and be patient with the, pro with the process. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our project collaborators, and we have many, that includes the data providers and the people that help us work on the projects, review each indicator, help us with the outreach partner for all the various events that we do, and also, of course, acknowledging our funders so um thank you all for listening Abe would you like to sign off I just want to acknowledge how beautiful this is and how important it is to me to kind of reflect on these last like four or five years that we've been at this so I'm just really grateful you won't go on thank you so thanks very much everyone for listening and uh, I'm going to hand it over now one by one to our scientists um, the first scientist that is up is going to be Erin Smith, and she's going to be sharing with us the work that she's been doing on nu the nutrient indicator for the Great River Report. Great. Thanks, Lee. And thanks, Abe, as well, for that uh, wonderful start to our session. Uh, all right. So I can share my screen here. All right. Yeah, so as we mentioned, you know, we have uh, our indicators that we started working on. And so uh, one that I've been working on for the past little while is the nutrient indicator. So I'm going to share some of the findings from that today. Uh, so just a very brief background uh, on nutrients. Um, so I'm looking at two nutrients, so phosphorus and nitrogen. 
um, and together uh, these control primary productivity and freshwater ecosystems um, with phosphorus being the primary uh, limiting nutrient for plant and algal growth. Uh, and so from this figure, uh, you can see that, you know, we have different sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, um, primarily coming from urban and suburban areas where we have um, a lot of land use change um, and different sources that combined with having uh, hardened surfaces increase runoff into our lakes and rivers. Uh, and then as well with agriculture, where we have things like fertilizer and manure. And again, when we have uh, surface runoff occurring, uh, those eventually end up again in our lakes and rivers. Um, and then you know, promote that plant and algal growth. So uh, we want to have levels that promote uh, a healthy ecosystem where we have enough primary productivity to uh, allow the ecosystem to function as it naturally does. Um, and so that's why we're, it's important to monitor uh, these nutrients. Uh, so the Upper St. Lawrence River, again, if you've been uh, attending this symposium throughout the week, then you've you know probably heard a lot about it, but just to kind of give you some context with this map here, um, so you can see a little bit of the land use patterns where we've got uh, quite a bit of natural land use, especially in the southern portion of the watershed in New York, uh, but also quite a bit of agriculture, especially uh, in the uh, southern portion of the watershed, uh, and especially in the downstream sections around uh, Lake St. Lawrence and Lake St. Francis. Um, so we know that you know, as I just mentioned, that's going to influence water quality and specifically nutrients in the river. Uh, and you can also see on this graph uh, the sampling points that I have. Um, so as we mentioned, you know, we have all these different uh, data sources that we've been able to pull from, a mix of uh, government data and academic data. Uh, and so thankfully, there's a lot of uh, nutrient data out there. So I was able to have a large spatial range, as you can see here, spanning from the Thousand Islands all the way to Lake St. Francis. So I'll just kind of give a <clears throat> brief overview of my methods. Um, but basically, we started with a literature search, uh, looking for all the data that's available uh, that's been published, uh, looking at nutrients in the upper St. Lawrence River in that range that I just mentioned. Um, so looking at, again, academic articles, uh, as well as potential government sources. Uh, of course, with this area, we've got multiple jurisdictions that we have to cover, so um, both at the provincial state level with Ontario, New York, and Quebec, um, and also at the federal level. So we have to look through all that open data and try to see what's available and download it. Um, and that's where we start to do the uh, data compilation. Um, so taking that data, putting it together, see what uh, measurements we can put together and analyze together. Um, you know, just kind of all the sort of uh, sorting out of data that ends up taking a lot longer than uh, you might expect it to. Uh, and then once that's all together, we can start the statistical analysis. Um, and so again, I had a nice large data set to work with, which was great, um, but of course it was very messy. And so um, I'll explain on the next slide uh, what statistical analysis method I ended up going with to deal with that kind of messy data that I had. Uh, and then of course, once we go through that, we try to interpret it and see um, what these findings mean. And uh, again, as uh, Lee mentioned earlier, you know, try to interpret that for us as scientists and then of course translate that so we can uh, mobilize the knowledge that we get. So uh, as I mentioned, I had a very messy data set. And so um, that meant that I ended up going with a little bit more complicated uh, analysis method, which we call generalized additive models or GAMs uh, for short. And so basically these allow uh, me to analyze my data that's non-normally distributed um, and include multiple different terms uh, to consider things like uh, the fact that I have different data sources, the fact that they're collected at different depths within the river, um, you know, the spatial and look at the spatial and temporal trends at the same time um, and even consider the interactions between those. Um, and so I won't get too deep into how I created these uh, models. You can definitely feel free to ask me about them at the end uh, or email me after you can see my email at the bottom of the screen there. But today I'm just going to highlight a few findings um, from both my total phosphorus model at the top uh, and my total nitrogen model you can see at the bottom there. Uh, so for total phosphorus, I'll look at the temporal, the uh, annual changes, and the spatial, looking at longitude and latitude. And then for total nitrogen, uh, looking at year and the effect of precipitation on total nitrogen. So looking at total phosphorus, uh, so year ended up being a significant term uh, in my GAM. And so we see that uh, based on this graph, you can see that it was a linear relationship um, where it decreased throughout time. Um, and so 
Uh, this makes sense when we think of some of the changes that have occurred in the river over this time period. Um, starting in the 1970s, there was the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, which was specifically targeting phosphorus, uh, reducing it especially from municipal effluents. Um, so within the river, this would have been at places like Kingston, Brockville, Cornwall, uh, would be the kind of the major ones. Um, and then also, of course, we know the St. Lawrence River receives its water from Lake Ontario, uh, and other studies have found a decrease following the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, in phosphorus in Lake Ontario. So we know that uh, would also be driving a decline uh, within the St. Lawrence River. Uh, another thing that happened during this time period uh, was the invasion of uh, dracaenid mussels, which again has been talked about throughout the symposium. Um, and so that occurred around 1990, uh, and that would have been another, uh, you know, had another effect on nutrients where uh, they're rapidly filtering the water and uh, therefore reducing the amount of phosphorus in the water column. Uh, and so we see that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that effect in a few slides as well. Okay, and then also looking at the spatial trends of total phosphorus. Um, so you can see here, I've got a bit of a heat map kind of thing going on um, where the brighter orange indicates higher uh, levels of total phosphorus. Uh, and so you can see that we have lower levels in the upper uh, sections of the river, especially at the Thousand Islands where you can see um, of the major kind of white blob at the start of the river. Um, and then the downstream, we have the brighter orange just that indicates again, those higher total phosphorus. Uh, and if you think back to that map that I showed earlier, where we had uh, a lot of agriculture happening on the southern portion of the watershed uh, in this downstream section, right? We had a lot of that agriculture that would be uh, contributing fertilizers onto the landscape. Uh, and again, eventually going into the tributaries and into the rivers. Um, and other studies have found that uh, levels of phosphorus in the tributaries are quite high and that is likely linked to that agricultural activity going on. And so, as I mentioned, uh, we know that there's a relationship between dracaenid mussels and total phosphorus, uh, and there's also a relationship with uh, chlorophyll A, which can be used to represent uh, algal biomass in the water. Uh, and so, one way that we can look for an effect of dracaenid mussels uh, on water quality is by looking at the relationship between chlorophyll A and total phosphorus, so that ratio. And so, um, as filter feeders, they take in both of these, but in the near shore zone, uh, they tend to lower chlorophyll A more than they reduce total phosphorus in the water column where it's you know, coming from external sources still being resuspended into the water column, uh, whereas the chlorophyll A is being uh, taken and consumed uh, by the dracaenid mussels. And so what this graph here is showing is that we do see an effect of the dracaenid mussels in the near shore region uh, for Kingston and Brockville. Um, so these were two sites that had continuous monitoring uh, 10 years before and 10 years after dracaenid mussel invasion. Um, so we do see that there was an effect of them on water quality. Uh, on the third part of the graph, we can see at Akwesasne Cornwall um, that we don't have a significant effect. Um, and there's a few reasons likely for this. First, we see that there's a lot of variability. Um, going back into the data after I kind of found this, uh, I saw that this data point was at the Moses Saunders Dam. Um, so it would be uh, less representative of a near shore uh, water quality conditions where we have very well mixed water um, that we'd be measuring rather than just strictly near shore like the other two sites. That's likely why we see that high variability uh, and lack of effect uh, of dracaenid mussels on that relationship between chlorophyll A and total phosphorus. All right, switching gears and now looking at total nitrogen relationship. Uh, so looking temporally, uh, we can see that it had quite a different relationship um, with time compared to total phosphorus, where again, total phosphorus had that nice linear decline over time. Uh, we don't quite see that with total nitrogen. And so on this graph here, we can see um, the orange section shows uh, an area of significant increase in total nitrogen and purple shows an area of significant decrease. Um, so we had this significant increase happening um, starting in 1990. Uh, and you can see the kind of general trend of total nitrogen from the 1970s to about 2000 uh, is this increasing trend. Uh, and so others have found this increase uh, specifically with nitrates um, in Lake Ontario, where it seems that uh, unlike total phosphorus, where we had the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement specifically targeting phosphorus, um, it didn't specifically target nitrogen. Um, so we don't see that strong effect happening. 
Uh, rather, it seems that in 1990, it could have been something uh, related to the Dracaenid muscle invasion, um, changing water quality. That could be why we have that significant effect there. Um, and we also know that total nitrogen has a bit of, can have a bit of a slower change, uh, thinking about things like atmospheric deposition as well. Uh, and so that could also be to do with this uh, kind of delayed decline that uh, started happening in about 2006. Um, so it could be something that uh, was a delayed reaction to changes uh, on the landscape, um, or it could be related to uh, changes in agricultural practices where uh, agriculture tends to be a, a strong con contributor of nitrogen to aquatic ecosystems. Um, so changes in um, drainage systems on uh, farms could be related to this uh, decline in total nitrogen. All right, and the final graph I'll show you today is looking at the relationship between precipitation and total nitrogen. Uh, and so again, to remind you, the orange section uh, shows a significant increase in total nitrogen. Uh, and so that we see that um, for the first section of the graph up until about 66 millimeters precipitation, uh, we see a positive effect uh, on total nitrogen where there's this uh, clear increase. Um, and so this would relate to, again, surface runoff where um, when we have large amounts of rainfall, um, it's washing everything into the river. Uh, this seems to taper off a bit after that 66 millimeters, um, but this is really important when we're thinking about climate change, its potential imp impacts um, on the water quality uh, of our lakes and rivers, and is definitely something we'll need to continue to monitor um, as time goes on, especially knowing that we're likely to have an increase uh, in precipitation in certain seasons, uh, as well as an increase in uh, frequency of uh, storm events and intensity of storm events as well. All right, so just kind of a brief summary of kind of some of the things I talked about. So legislation is effective when we looked at the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, uh, definitely seemed to have an effect of decreasing total phosphorus. Um, we saw an impact of invasive species altering water quality dynamics, especially uh, in the near shore sections of Kingston and Brockville. Um, we need to consider climate change impacts. We saw an effect uh, with total nitrogen. I didn't see an effect with total phosphorus, but it's something that we need to continue to monitor uh, as changes occur uh, in this region and in other regions. Uh, and finally, we need uh, consistent monitoring along the river so that we can continue to um, look at these long-term trends, look at large spatial trends, uh, and you know, see uh, where we need to have uh, you know, more management uh, and you know, see what's working and what's not working. Uh, and of course, the importance of collaboration to advance research, uh, where, you know, because I was able to take data from different open data sources um, by other scientists sharing their data with me, um, that was what allowed me to do this analysis. Um, so that's really important uh, for continued research. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin, for that great presentation. I, of course, am aware of the work, so it's all, you know, something, things that I know, and I'm, I'm sure there's lots of people out there who are interested to see the progress you've made on that indicator, so thank you for presenting that. The next scientist that's going to present for us is Mackenzie. Mackenzie, will you introduce yourself and share your presentation? All right. Hello. I'm going to grab my slides here. Can you see that, Lee? Yes, you're perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm going to be presenting on the invasive species indicator for the uh, Great River Report. So it's more so the uh, history of non-native species introductions in the region. Um, and I'm just going to start off uh, by going over a few concepts just to di dif differentiate between what non-natives are and what actual invasive species are. So um, as mentioned in, in a couple other presentations this afternoon, um, non-natives are any organism that have come into a novel environment from uh, a foreign region. And it's dependent on this environment, the conditions um, and characteristics of this environment, as well as the traits of the species, um, their evolutionary history, whether they are going to become invasive and whether they're gonna really have impacts on the new environment. Um, so I'll go over more details about this, but um, overall there, there could be many non-natives in a system, but only a few will end up becoming um, 
more successful in the sense of a base in uh, as an invasive um, and they will have significant impacts on the habitats that they have um, entered. So let's gone over the upper St. Lawrence River is the region of concern um, and it's a hot spot for non-natives specifically because of its geographic location um, again being between uh, the Atlantic Ocean and the Great Lakes um, we're connecting these two areas and it's um, become very uh, highly impacted due to the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway that was constructed in 1959 um, this is, of course, to bring goods from other areas of the world to our region, as well as the Great Lakes. Um, and with this, it brings uh, risks to new non-natives introductions. Um, and then also recreational activity contributes to um, these kinds of changes and potential um, introductions. And with that stocking, so specifically fish for fishing, uh, sport or just recreationally. Um, fish have been stocked mm -hmm. deliberately in some cases um, just for for the for the practice. Um, so we're going to get into more as to um, the specifics of vectors of introduction in the next couple of slides. So these are the kinds of things that um, bring species from elsewhere into a new system. And it comes down to the types of changes that we're doing, um, whether we know it or not. Um, so the movement of goods from one part of the globe to uh, another um, has been a very big uh, part in the introduction of species to new environments, um, as well as recreational sports, like I said. Uh, so for instance, deliberately through stalking or even accidentally, for instance, when um, you're boating around in, let's say, the Great Lakes area, and then you move your boat into the St. Lawrence River, um, if we're not paying attention to, to certain things. Um, we could be bringing a single colonist from one area into the St. Lawrence River, and it could be as simple as that um, for a new species being introduced. And um, another thing, humans seem to love exotic species. So whether it's for um, your big aquarium tank or you're trying to create a pond in your backyard, these are the kinds of things that bring species from from exotic places um, into the region, and it in, it increases the risk of introductions occurring through this vector. So, uh, the main aim of the report, of course, was to assess the overall presence of non-natives. So, looking at how many have occurred over time, uh, to identify the most successful taxonomic groups and species determine temporal trends uh, of these introductions and also rank these vectors um, that have attributed to these introductions, as well as the regions from which these species um, are native to. And to do so, like to the other uh, river report indicators, we use a systematic literary search to identify databases and relevant primary literature. So the two main papers that um, we were able to identify was De La Fontaine and Constant 2002 and Ricciardi 2006. And these two were similar in the sense of having data um, for basically all non-natives introduced um, for the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes. Um, so they were very helpful in compiling kind of an overall list overview of um, for these temporal trends. Um, and by using these two and then uh, cross-referencing with databases, we were able to fill the gaps of what other species were introduced after 2006 um, and also uh, look for the accuracy within which vectors were most likely contributing to the introductions, as well as the uh, dates of introduction. Um, so that's where all the, the data is coming from um, here for the report. So we're just going to go over the temporal trends to begin. Um, so if you look at the the first graph there with the black line, it's very clear that invasions uh, or introductions are increasing over time uh, quite rapidly. And if you look around 1960, this seems to um, be more so. There's there's more frequent introductions after this time. Um, and this is most likely due to the, uh, the opening of the Seaway in 1959. Um, and then if we look 
just below in the uh, graph, it separates the, the total number of species by taxonomic groups. Um, and we have plant species really dominating. Um, you can also see that in the pie graph represented there. And I just want to note um, for benthic invertebrates specifically, um, as well as some algae and zooplankton, there seems to be a lot, um, a, a lot higher uh, introductions for these species after 1960 as well. So this can th this is thought to be correlated to um, shipping related vectors because they are smaller um, species that can be taken up in the uh, ballast water, let's say, of of ships. So. Um, because this is a very clear trend um, after a few decades after the opening of the seaway, there was regulations put in place in order to minimize the risk of shipping related um, introductions. So in 2006 in Canada and 2008 in the US, there was mandatory ballast water exchange, which is basically going through the process of flushing out any fresh water that came from foreign areas um, in, a, in a shipping vessel so that that water was not then brought to a new environment. So this is a great example of how um, there has been some lessons learned from the past. And uh, since the these mandates, um, there has been a decrease in the number of introductions from these kinds of um, vectors. So it's really great. Um, now we're just going to uh, break down some of the other vectors of introduction. Of course, there is the shipping vectors, um, which is uh, attributes more than a third of all of the non-natives in the list, but there is also um, deliberate release and um, accidental. So there's uh, the 33.9% is kind of grouping together any releases from aquarium. Um, so whether it's plants, fish, or benthic invertebrates, um, and also accidental release in that way as well. And then the last one there that we grouped together uh, was deliberate or any um, bait release. So this has to do basically with just the fishing industry, uh, particularly recreational fishing. So that does attribute um, a good portion as well to, to non-natives. Um, so if we break down this, this bar graph here, I know there's a lot of colors going on, um, but I just wanna make a few points here. Shipping related vectors um, definitely seem to attribute largely uh, to taxonomic groups with small propagules and larvae. So like I said, algae, zooplankton, um, and then if you see also uh, over a half of benthic invertebrates are um, introduced in these in these ways as well. Uh, plant species are introduced um, largely through cultivation as well. So that's actually planting the species, us bringing them here for that reason. Um, and then fish species, like I said, through stocking deliberately. Um, so those are the big ones kind of attributing largely to these introductions. And then we have the region of origin here. Um, so I kind of touched on this in, in my last presentation, if, if you guys were around. Um, so Eurasia is a really big contributor, it seems, to non-native introductions in general. And we see this a lot in the Great Lakes, and we can kind of connect this back to the shipping, um, the shipping activity because we do have goods moving from this area to North America. However, it also seems to be a trend in other literature elsewhere around the globe. Um, so this might be due to the fact that Ponto Caspian uh, species just happen to have invasive attributes or um, traits that allow them to be uh, allow them to tolerate a lot of environmental heterogeneity. Um, so there's a, maybe a lot of things going on here at the same time. Of course, the vectors of introduction don't help, but Ponto Caspian um, species just seem to be really invasive. So it's it's interesting to take note of that. And as we move forward, um, you know, monitor these potential new introductions and take note of the kind of traits that they have to um, to stop any further establishment into the future. Um, so those are kind of the specifics for the general species or non-native species. Now I wanna give a little more detail into the big invaders. So the actual invasive species that are covered uh, quite intensely in the literature within the system. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of these three species specifically, and I grouped them together for a reason that I'll explain. So we have the zebra and quagga mussels, also known as the they're known as the dry snid species and the round goby fish species. 
And the reason these two are together um, are because they're native to the same environment. They're both from the Eurasian Ponto Caspian region. They're both brought here in shipping ballast water, um, but the timeline is what's really interesting and it kind of worked to the benefit of the round goby specifically. So the zebra and quagga mussels were first introduced in about around the 1990s into the system. And from there, with no native predators, they were able to increase in abundance and begin um, massively filter feeding the water um, and changing the water quality, which had cascading effects, um, increasing macrophage growth, and then shifting fish communities, which had very major impacts, um, as many people would know along, along the system. Um, they were also able to colonize basically any surface, which would also include um, other native uh, benthic invertebrate species. So this had uh, its own impact on the diversity of unionoid species in the river. But then about a decade or so later when the round goby was introduced, this uh, these mussels were so abundant that the goby was able to rely on these as a, as a um, prey item. And then also because of their generalist uh, feeding behaviors, they're able to outcompete other na native fish species and also began to prey on eggs and larvae of large fish. Um, so they had major impacts on a lot of uh, habitats along the river there. And one final point as well, um, because round gobies uh, were able to become quite dense in their in their population sizes, the prey sorry the predatory fish species began shifting their diet to the ground gobies, um, which seems beneficial in ways. However, as the round gobies continue to feed on the mussels that may be accumulating um, contaminants through their filter feeding abilities, this then bioaccumulates up to these fish species and brings concern for um, our own human consumption of these predatory fish species. So these are the big ones that are that are definitely highlighted a lot in literature and are continued to be monitored uh, today. Um, so yeah, we'll move on then to the plant species. I wanted to group these three together, not that they're one and the same, but because they're very similar in the sense of characteristics um, and they embody the, the traits that do kind of um, explain why plant species are so relevant in, in the non-native uh, list that we've compiled through the report. So all three of these are from Eurasia. The common reed and the starry stonewort were both brought in again through shipping ballast water. Um, and then the Eurasian milk oil was actually released as a because there, it was an aquarium plant. So these three definitely have large impacts, especially in wetland areas, because they're able to form dense mats or large monocultures. And when they're doing that, they're reducing the light availability to native plant species. So that's then reducing their diversity and also having cascading effects on the fish populations that rely on these native plants. Um, so they're outcompeting um, these, these species and just kind of taking over habitats a lot of the time. Um, and another th another thing, they, because they do grow quite quickly, this is this is something to definitely look for, especially as it only takes a single um, colonist to basically create a new population. So these are the kinds of species that we really want to be looking out for when we're uh, cleaning our boats out and trying not to move anything at all, like any any hint of a plant to a new new area because they they can proliferate quite quickly and quite easily for these reasons. And finally, the spiny water flea. Uh, this one's a little different from the other species. Um, it is a planktonic crustacean. It's also, you guessed it, been introduced through shipping ballast water. Um, and this one is spe specifically from Europe, um, the Europe area. And this one is of great concern. It's really, really small, but it has a lot. Um, it's able to do a lot in a short period of time. And the main thing is consuming zooplankton. And this, of course, not only affects zooplankton diversity, but it also takes away um, prey availability to other zooplanktivores. So they they have less, um, they don't have as much to consume, and then their, their diversity is impacted in that way as well. And although they are quite abundant, you would kind of think, oh, maybe other species would be able to rely on that, them as food. 
um, but that's not the case. There's a lot of um, the literature does explain how fish species have tried to shift and uh, take up these zooplanktivores and eat them. However, you can probably guess from this weird tail that it has, um, the sharp barbed area makes it very difficult for them to actually be consumed. So they then expel them and aren't able to use them for any nutritious purposes. So um, this one is definitely of concern as well, um, especially because it's so small and can be easily um, moved from one area to another. So just a few concluding points. Not all non-natives become invasive. However, we shouldn't take any new introductions lightly. Um, and we especially need to understand the overlapping traits between those invasives or those non-natives that become invasive, especially when it comes down to region of origin, um, Ponto Caspian species specifically. Um, we have learned from the past in some ways through the mandates that we've created. However, we still need to continue to look at um, what can be changed and how we can move forward. And early detection is vital um, for minimizing establishment. And that's all the time I have. Thank you. And I look forward to any questions that people have after. Thank you, Mackenzie. I'm going to get going right away to hand it over to Bojan. Bojan Chen is cross appointed between the River Institute and Queen's University, and he will be presenting today on his work with the amphibian indicator. Bojan, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, start your presentation. Highly, uh, good. is the visual okay? Perfect. Okay, I'm going to start. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, so, my name is Bojan Chen. Uh, I'm a postdoc cross appointed between a River Institute and a Queen's University. So today, the talk, the title of my talk is the Effects of Climate Change on Amphibian Distributions in Upper St. Lawrence River Basin. So before I get on to detail the progress, let's flash back with a little background. So according to the latest released IUCN 2023 report, the second global amphibian assessment said over 8,000 amphibian species assessed it, two out of five, are threatened with extinction, which makes amphibians the world's most threatened vertebrates. And from a global view, the threats, the driving amphibian declines from uh, ranking from high to low, the top two are habitat loss and climate change. If you're looking more detailedly, so growing human population contribute, continues to drive the habitat destruction, pollution over exploration and expansion of these invasive species and climate change have already presented a serious challenge to the amphibian survival, and then the extent and severity are expected to magnify in the coming future. And when we're focusing down to our local region, to the Upper St. Lawrence, so Southern Ontario, which is home to over 2,000 species of plants and animals, uh, one of the most biologically diverse areas of Canada, has lost over 90% of its original wetlands uh, due to urbanization and aquaculture. And the human footprint continued to expand along the St. Lawrence River. If you look at it to the right side, the chart, uh, it is a human influence index. This index was generated by NASA, which they overlay multiple uh, human like influence layers, like a population density, electricity, power infrastructure, like a cropland, railway construction, etc., all together to give an estimate of how deep the human influence was placed on the landscape. So we can see uh, this entire like upper St. Lawrence River Banks area have been like a thoroughly like uh, uh, influenced by human. So apart from this like a land or habitat loss scenario, the climate change also severe. So studies suggest the str strongest climate changes by the end of the 21st century will occur in the tropics and high latitude, especially in the Northern hemisphere. So all this scenario, all pressing urgent needs for the amphibian conservation in Canada. However, we also have challenges. So in general, conservation planning and land management are depending on understanding the species distribution, abundance, et cetera. However, due to the biological characteristics of the amphibians, those vital information are hard to obtain and less understood, not to mention how these have changed and will change over time. 
The current standard amphibian monitoring methods are largely derived from the marsh monitoring program. They are relying on counting calls and visual identifications. Here, I want to point it out. So here's what I have been doing, like one field uh, work on amphibian. So it's very hard to like uh, record its call, but also it's even more harder to visually identify because they are normally located in the deep marshland or a high, very hard to access. And also for these species coverage are limited to species that can make calls, not to mention a lot of these amphibians such like salamanders, they cannot make any call signal. So they are very hard to monitor. And also we have a limited time span for monitoring and you need a substantial uh, like a personnel support to conduct systematic surveys. That's why in order to improve the current monitoring system and help us better understand those animals, we propose to establish an integrated like, amphibian a diversity monitoring tool set in the St. Lawrence River Basin. Here are the R&D pro uh, progress so far. So as a sub project of the Great River Report, our focusing area is the upper St. Lawrence, basically it's between Thousand Islands, uh, Thousand Islands National Park and a Lake St. Francis. But in order to better or have a comprehensive understanding of this area, we enlarge our study area to a 100 kilometer buffer from the main river channel. And by collaborate with eight organizations and programs across the border in Ontario, Quebec, Vermont, and New York, we are able to acquire over 141,000 raw historical data for analysis, which covers 11 Nora and 10 salamander species. So here are some like, uh, visualization results of the historical species richness pattern and hotspot analysis. So we can see here, uh, we have different color categories, which the warm color indicates the places or region have higher species richness counts. And from these two times, like a two graphs, we can see there are clear north shifting trend of these amphibian hotspots to compare uh, between 1970 to, to, to 1999, and to 2000 and 2022. But with this occurrence only data analysis, we cannot answer a lot of questions like what is the limiting factor to their distribution and what could be the factor that impact the range shift? So we explore a little more. We apply the species distribution modeling using occurrence records and in combination with the environmental variables to predict the current and future suitable habitat for the amphibians. Mm -hmm. And we, are, we selected one algorithm named MaxSan. It is a machine learning algorithm, which right now is quite popular in the species distribution modeling area. So in a nutshell, we input recorded like distribution along with a series of prediction variables that with environment variable will select that's supposed to have impact on their distribution. And through the modeling, a MaxSan could generate a probability function that correlates multiple environmental variables with occurrence of species of interest, then project that function into the target region or time. So basically, the model are able to identify the environments where a species has been observed. And it will give you the distribution of the environments similar to those where the species has known occur. So here, are the environmental variables and a scenario was we'll select for our modeling. For the, in the indicator species, uh, for the first stage, we select uh, two. One is a Nora, one is salamander. The great tree frog is a bit of a, like a prevailing species that have widespread across the landscape. And the northern two line salamander is a bit like a picky on the habitat, but it is a species of interest. For the environmental variables, we select three major categories. For the climate, we choose the world climb with 19 different climate variables and with elevation and land cover, we have 16 different categories. Altogether, they're supposed to have like impact on the distribution of these amphibians. And when projecting the, our model into the future, we'll select the two time points. The one is year 2050, the other one is 2100. And we'll be working on two emission scenarios. That is the representative concentration pathways 2.6 which suggests the most optimistic scenario, which suggests like a lower carbon emission and will result in less than 2% of a temperature increase in the future by the end of 2100. And RCP 8.5 is the 
pessimistic scenario, which will have a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide emission, which will result in a bit of a high temperature increase by the end of the century. And on the global circulation model, which the climate model we derived try to capture, predict the future climate scenarios. So we have multiple models at hand, but each model have their own focus. Some of, them, of these uh, models uh, predict the future to be a little dry. Some of uh, predict the future to be a little cool. So in order to have a more consensus view, we chose three different models and working on the mean prediction to have a more consensus uh, prediction in the future. And all the modeling have been set for 10 replication and with a total of 1,000 model iterations to explore the potential variance of the model output. So let's come to the first result. The current suitable habitat prediction of the green tree frog. From right side, you can see here, here is the suit suitability of these uh, habitat predictions for current time. So we have multiple categories. You can see the color from uh, dark red to dark green. Uh, in the rank suggests very high potential to least potential. And uh, from this map, we can see the relative uh, prevail uh, prevalent or uh, widespread of these species. When project into the future uh, for the low emission scenario, we can see to uh, in, at time of 2050 in the RCP 2.6, there is a like a north shift and a contraction of the suitable habitat but it was still managed to keep some of this suitable habitat for these species at, by the end of the next century. However, when project are modeling the high emission scenario, we, which will result in a higher uh, temperature increase, we can see the north shift and the contraction of the suitable, suitable habitat became more severe. And by 2100, there will be no suitable habitat for these species at that time. As for the northern two-line salamander, we can see due to their different biological characteristics and habitat preference, we have different distribution of suitable habitat for these two different species. And for the northern two-line salamander, its suitable habitat is more leaning to the mountain regions. When we project our model into the future, at the lower emission scenario, we can see, yes, there is a north shifting and contraction, the trend and towards the places or the regions with more like an altitude or higher altitude. But we still manage to have some suitable habitat by the year of 2100. Similarly, for the high emission scenarios, you have the contraction becoming more severe and we lost all the suitable habitat for the Northern Tula Salamander in the 2100. But here, even though the results seem a little daunting, but I need to stress here. So the result doesn't mean this, like a, there's no like a suitable habitat will link to local extinction because the model can only show you that's just, there's no similar habitat for those species that they have been living now for the comparison of the different time, time ranges. And also here are the environmental factor contribution to the SDM of these two different species. For this chart, we, for the y-axis, we have two uh, different uh, two indicator species, and the top is the uh, gray tree frog, and the lower one is the northern two-line salamander. On the x-axis are the, uh, the environmental variables we put in the model, and the circle up above shows like how much contribution uh, for each of these variables can be put or related to the SDM outputs. So it's similar to like random forest. So the model will run uh, the simulation of each time of a multiple like, replications. But each time they will take out one of these variables and to see how much the decrease of the model prediction gonna be. And then they normalize that decrease into percentages. And compare these two species, we can see bio three, which is isothermity, bio four, temperature seasonality, and bio 18, which is pre precipitation of the warmest quarter, uh, have higher like uh, importance rankings. And to stress out here on the land cover categories, the broad leaf deciduous forest have higher contribution to the distribution of this uh, northern two-line salamanders. And let's see, so what's next? Here are these like a black dots are the historical occurrence site that we have. 
and the map just show the current suitable habitat prediction generated from the modeling. We can see the powerful performance of this species distribution model. They can give us way much more, way much more information uh, like compared with the occurrence records alone. So imagine we're gonna work on a bunch of like a modeling candidate species with all these candidates and neurons and sediments together and we overlay their suitable habitats together will generate a multi-species amphibian like SDM cluster to give us more information on their local diversity hotspot and for this like a uh, distribution patterns. Given the probableness of this SDM, that makes it the most widely used modeling tool for forecasting global change impact on biodiversity, selecting conservation areas uh, or guiding habitat restoration, et cetera. But the accuracy of SDM are depends on the three major components. And in order to apply or make like any conservation decisions, it is very important to validate the results with independent data sets. It's like, uh, that's very like a crucial. And also it's a source class of the current modeling because normally we only have a handful of our current data at hand. So the practical like a uh, method is where we divide the data we have at hand to using some for training and some for model testing. But ideally, if we could have independent, independent data source, that will create more uh, accurate prediction or validation for the model. So how to acquire this data? Apart from the fact that compared to other vertebrate groups monitoring in the upper and north region, our modeling like our current records on amphibians are, are okay, comparatively uh, short and specifically for the lack in the salamander uh, data sets. So that's why we need to develop EDM methods and application in this monitoring to acquire enough independent or following up data so we can use to make a model optimizations. So our landmate, Alan Tian and staff in Morocco have already addressed a lot of these EDA applications. So thank you for them. I don't have to stress that here. And the next important thing is to uh, iterate SDMs. So right here, you can see there's a study on the snowfly through multiple years of model iteration. Each time they can like a, a using different like a, a, a survey method like guided by the previous year's model. So by the several rounds of model optimization, the model of prediction accuracy increased drastically. And that's are the two major components of our integrated tool set uh, for enhanced the current uh, Fabian diversity monitoring. The two parts is SDM and detailed ED analysis. And let's circle back a little bit. So from the global view, we know the habitat loss and climate change are the two major threats driving the decline, but very closely by number three is the disease. So the two fungal disease has been like a, a implicated uh, amphibian decline worldwide. And so rather than working on the ED analysis on amphibian species alone, yeah, it's very practical. We can also develop EDN application on this fungal disease detection, and they can work as early warning for the amphibians. And also, that's a current being developing in the Lockheed Lab at least. Okay, so these are all the like progress we have for this like a tool set. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bojan. Great presentation. And we're going to finish off our final talk for the Great Report session is from Fan Chin. And Fan, if you'd like to turn your video on and uh, share your screen, you can get started. Please introduce yourself as well. Wow, share screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. I don't know to put this more. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So my name is Fan. Uh, I started. Um, I'm working with um, Riven Studio for nearly um, ten months already. I work on the contaminant indicator for 
the first part of the contaminant indicator is for the herring goal. So today I'm going to present the results I did uh, for the um, uh, uh, herring goal data, uh, which we analyzed the contaminant level, uh, the trend of contaminant level in herring goal X. And also I will present um, uh, part of the uh, part of the uh, the job uh, we did with the e, uh, ECCC on the comparison of the com between uh, herring goal and the blue herring for the trend of contaminant levels. Yeah. I can go to the next. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> the contaminant. Uh, Upper Sandarin River uh, region has already been uh, impacted by the historical um, release of contaminant. Uh, of contaminant, so the region is uh, very con uh, contaminated by virus uh, pollutant. The mo uh, the major concern for the ecosystem and human health is that most of the contaminant can be bioaccumulated, bio as we can see from this uh, this uh, sigma that uh, the contaminant uh, found in water could be um, uh, uh, transferred tropic, uh, transferred and accumulated in the food chain uh, up to uh, nearly the, uh, 10 billion uh, times uh, higher than the, uh, in the predator, top predators such as the fish eating bird, um, than the concentration that we could find in the water. So, um, uh, the heron go was used as uh, was used by the uh, federal government agencies such as the Environment Canada to uh, monitor in the, the the environment health. Uh, one of the uh, one of the pine, uh, pine studies uh, performed by Her um, uh, Herbert showed that the contaminate the contaminate. Uh, particularly the uh, DTE are related to the egg um, thinning uh, uh, portion, uh, which affects the reproductive success of the success of the uh, of the uh, baby bird. So we can see that the, the uh, with the concentration increased uh, DTE in eggs, the egg sh uh, shell uh, the percentage of egg shell thinning increased also. So we can see that um, the first uh, the first uh, contaminated monitoring program for wildlife in Canada actually is for the heron go. We can see from the number indexed here is the zero zero one. Uh, in this uh, in uh, in this uh, monitoring program, actually it's a uh, international uh, by by national uh, program um, between U.S. and Canada. In this uh, monitoring program, there are 15 sites were selected in the Great Lake uh, region, uh, among which there are two sites, which is the last two sites, the, the 14th and the 15th site, correspond to the Snake Island and the Striken Island in the uh, Sandarin River. So um, in our study, we are interested to uh, evaluate uh, how, what is uh, the trend of the contaminated labels in heaven go uh, based on the historical data we obtained from the from the uh, environment Canada. In addition. We also compared to the the herring go data to uh, great blue have great blue herring data, which this bird has also been has also uh, been used as uh, as an indicator for the environment health. The difference is that the herring go is like uh, we consider it like a opportun um, opportunities that he. Uh, uh, frequently shift shift their uh, shift their diet and shift their trophic level while uh, the blue, uh, great blue herring is a strict physical walk they only eat uh, most of the time they only eat only eat fishes so uh, as I present uh, previously in the last two slides the objective of this uh, of this study is to first firstly uh, e uh, evaluate in the temporary and spatial uh, trend of the contaminated levels in heron go 
specifically we choose the, the tissue um, analyzed tissue of X which uh, which could avoid for example the uh, the, the bias uh, bias the trend due to the um, uh, growth uh, for the adult sample. Also, for the second objective, we would compare the contaminant levels uh, between heron girl and girl and uh, blue heron. Uh, also, this comparison uh, is uh, is, uh, is uh, has been done on the analyzed tissue of X in San Ramon River. For the second uh, objective, we uh, have uh, we have two uh, hypotheses. First uh, hypothesis, we uh, compare the between those two species, and we expected to have observed the similar temperature and top contaminated level uh, in those two birds in the same region. Um, secondly, we uh, expect to uh, observe the similar temperature um, of the same uh, of contaminant trend for the same species between regions. For this uh, for this work, we compared marine section and the and the freshwater section. We didn't compare. We didn't put the marine uh, the uh, salt water uh, region as showed in this graphic in our analysis because there is the lack of uh, sampling uh, for the herring go, uh, which we could not do the comparison. So for the method part, we have selected the six, six contaminant, which has a long-term uh, survey. The data is more complex, uh, complex. And also we select the data that uh, locate the data that uh, uh, from the samples that are located in the uh, in the uh, in the region of interest, for example, the upper San Rim River and also along the San Rim River region. So for the first part of the results, when we compare uh, the, the, the sample from the two sampling sites, as, as I presented previously, the Snake Island and the, the Striken Island, we didn't find uh, any uh, difference for, uh, for the sampling between the samples from those two uh, sampling sites for the contaminant in uh, Herringo X. However, when we applied the uh, the general uh, when, I apply, when we applied generalized additive modeling for the for the data, we have observed uh, site specific uh, uh, trend um, of contaminant levels in Herringo X. We have observed in Snake Island all six selected contaminant um, decrease over time significantly. However, in Stretch Island. We only observed uh, um, the five organic contaminant decrease significantly over time, but there is no significant decrease for uh, mercury in Herringo X in Strick Island. By comparing those two islands, we have found out that for uh, the uh, the Strick Island has higher concentration of mercury, deltron, and uh, merix compared to uh, Snake Island. Um, but the, but there is no significant difference be, uh, for the mercury and the DDE and the DDE for the Strike Island compared to uh, Snake Island. For the second part of our study, uh, to compare those two birds, we have for the uh, data inspection, uh, part we have found out that there are uh, significant difference for the accumulation pattern for the contaminant in uh, the eggs of herring go and the blue herring. So we have found a better correlation of DDE, deltron, and the mercury data with the sample from for from the blue herring, and those three um, contaminant. Uh, looks like preferably accumulated in the egg of blue herring. In contrast, for HC, HCB, uh, PCP, and the Merix, they are uh, correlated better with samples from uh, with herring go samples, and uh, looks like they are preferably accumulated in the eggs of um, of uh, herring of herring go. To compare uh, between the species that in in freshwater region. Uh, for the decreased trend that we have observed um, 
most of the uh, contaminant decrease significantly over time, except for the mercury in uh, heron gold in freshwater region and the mercury and the merix in blue heron in um, uh, marine region from marine sector. By comparing those two birds, we have found significantly higher concentration of HCB, DDE, merix, and the PCB in heron gold X compared to uh, blue herring. In the meanwhile, we have found high, significantly higher concentration of mercury, uh, DTE, and deltrin in blue herring X compared to uh, uh, herring gold. Secondly, we compared the, the region for uh, each of the, uh, of the species of the bird that we have found for uh, herring uh, for uh, herring gold. There is a clear difference on the uh, contaminated accumulation pattern between freshwater region and the uh, and the marine sector. We can see here those the cluster of the uh, sampling point are click are click uh, are clearly separated in our uh, PCB graph. Uh, graph. Uh, however, for the blue herring uh, data, we uh, those two re uh, the samples uh, from those two regions are um, overlaid and they are difficult to separate. We didn't observe any difference from the uh, for those two regions. By comparing uh, the by comparing uh, uh, the contaminant data from uh, the two regions for each of the species, we have found out that for uh, blue herring, uh, only HCB showed a significantly higher concentration in marine system um, compared to freshwater sector. In the meanwhile, for, H, uh, for herring gold, all the, contamin all the six contaminate uh, showed higher concentration, significantly higher concentration in freshwater sector than, uh, than marine sector. So as a take, as take home messages, we have observed that specific pattern of mercury accumulation um, for uh, our two birds. Uh, so we have found better correlation of uh, HCB merics and the PCB accumulation in uh, in uh, heron gold X. In the meanwhile, we have found better correlation and the uh, and the preferable accumulation pattern of a of mercury dioxin and DDE in um, blue herring uh, eggs. All the contaminant has showed significantly uh, decreased trend over time, except for the uh, mercury uh, in uh, heron gold in freshwater sector and the merix and the mercury uh, in blue herring. Uh, X in a marine sector. By comparing between species, we have found out that uh, um, uh, 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 HCB, DDE, Merix, and the PCB showed a significantly higher concentration in um, uh, heron gold compared to blue heron. While in marine sectors, we have found that uh, mercury, DDE, and PCB showed higher concentration in uh, blue herring compared to herring gold. When compared between regions for one species of the bird that we have found uh, for all six contaminants, they have showed significantly higher concentration in herring gold uh, in freshwater sector than marine sector. While for um, uh, um, blue herring, we only found the uh, HCB showed significantly higher concentration in marine sector than uh, freshwater sector. So um, that's all I can present today. So if you have any questions, just feel, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much, Van. It's really great to see that data and see how much you've done with it and comparing these, uh, these groups. Um, I uh, I noticed uh, in the chat there was a question actually directed at me um, asking about what the difference is between community and public when showing the the reach that the river pool has had um, and then a follow-up question saying you know is community equated to in-person 
And just to clarify that, that, that yes, if we have people in person locally at the River Institute or in Akwesasne or um, any of the, you know, like an in-person event that's that's local, then yes, that would be considered as community. The River Report team meets with birding groups and fishing clubs and local trapping associations and has some very local events. And for those, we call those um, interactions, community interactions. Uh, when we talk about public events, we're talking about when we're broadcasting out. And so, you know, something like this event, for instance, this, the River Symposium, where we're we're broadcasting out to a large audience that may be, you know, national and international, that's no longer considered a community because, you know, the people that are attending could be from anywhere and it's not as localized. So that's just a, a hopefully I've answered that question for the person who asked it. I don't see any other um, questions in the chat specifically. Um, I had a few questions that I wanted to put to to the team. Um, and if there's anything you know that any of you wanted to add as well, please please feel free um, to add. I um, Mackenzie, I have a bit of a challenging question for you, and I I know I've had lots of opportunities to ask you questions, and then of course now I give it to you on on the spot when I've never put this to you before. But I, I became curious because you know, we talk about a number of species. Um, you know, invasive species through time, and 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 it's you know it's up there over a hundred, um, mm -hmm. and so I was wondering about how those numbers would compare to indigenous species, and and don't answer that because I'm not sure you'll have that on hand. But I, I was curious about biomass because you know we talk about actual number of species, but if if I were to scoop up you know a group of organisms, let's say the fish or something in the St Lawrence River, what would be the ratio of indigenous to non-indigenous or is that an impossible question to answer on the spot and we can answer it another day yeah I definitely don't have a specific answer but that's a great question like that's something that maybe we'll be able to dive into with the data sets we have we'll have to we'll have to look but that could definitely be something to um, add to the indicator because it would be interesting and I I don't know the ratio like that's that's another thing um because there is there's 108 uh, that we've identified within the region, uh, which is a lot, <laughs> but that's also across so many taxonomic groups. It would be very interesting to to highlight that and see if we can figure out that that number for biomass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'm thinking about modeling the system in future, and I'm going to need all the biomass numbers that <laughs> came to mind. Um, Erin, I love seeing your results and, you know, I, I like the way we can link, um, you know, for the phosphates, we can link to management actions that have been put in place and we can, you know, directly tie the trends. And I'm really curious to see what comes out of the, the nitrates you know, total. Um, sorry, have I got those the wrong way around? No, are they the right way around? Do you want to comment on that, Erin? Sorry, on, on like the sources for the mm. like nitrogen and phosphorus? Hmm. And the policies that have been put in place that have that affected the change that you see, you know, the way you see it in, in the data that you've presented. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, right, that was a, a pretty big legislation, right, between, you know, Canada and US and um, yeah, clearly had a direct effect on total phosphorus, um, you know, targeting those municipal affluents, like I mentioned. Um, nitrogen you know, comes from a little bit more uh, what we call like non-point sources, right? So especially agriculture I talked about. Um, so it can be a little bit trickier to try to target, right? When you've got a lot of um, different farms managed by different people. Um, so yeah, it, you know, the legislation can be efficient when we have, you know, direct sources that we can target, but um, when we don't have those and it's a little bit more widespread and a lot more people that you have to talk to, uh, yeah, it can be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I had it the right way around. That's great. Um, Bojan, when I see your work, um, and, and you and I have already discussed this, but it's uh, it's not only important to understand where the hotspots are now, but where they're going to be in the future. And then conservation efforts, you know, to make sure that we can target ways that they can be corridors so that as the systems change and the habitat becomes no longer suitable, that these uh, conservation practices can help to conserve corridors that can help these these animals to, you know, move with the times. 
Um, have you got any thoughts on on that and and the sort of time frames that we've got and whether that's possible? Uh, that's kind of a current uh, limitation of modeling as well. So right now we're projecting for uh, for their future uh, suitability or habitat suitability is solely on climate scenarios. We have to make the assumption that landscape yeah will not like change because we because we cannot anticipate like how much we're going to change. But on, based on current uh, variable set, we can verify the important like, landscape or land cover types and linking to that. And then by continuous model iteration, I think we will be able to capture, at least find a trend in the nearest future. And then with like a multi, like an area, like they can have hand, we can project the, 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 the like their super habitat in the future in a more concise or precise way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And then, Van, your work, you know, we're looking at these birds and, and hoping that, you know, we wouldn't have to monitor both of them long term, but it looks like from your results that the sorts of they contaminants are... you're up in them, they both need to be monitored. Is that is that the conclusion? Yes, yes. it's like um, if you want to focus on specific region that you will need to, for example, for this uh, half south wood region, maybe continue monitor the blue herring, it's uh, it's better because there is a lack of uh, sampling for the herring gold in this region. And we have also observed, uh, for example, specific species, specific accumulation pattern for each of the uh, contaminate. For example, a macro maybe will be better to monitor with blue herring, but not with, uh, not with uh, herring gold. For, uh, for the merix, maybe better with um, uh, I think Merrick is better with uh, herring gold than blue herring, etc. And also, we have observed the uh, region specific uh, accumulation pattern. For example, for the herring gold, we have observed that in uh, freshwater region, it's like they are high for all the sanctified companies, while in, while in the freshwater region, we uh, in the marine region, we only observed like a uh, high HCB for uh, for the uh, blue heron. Uh, actually, there are some interesting in my in my results that I just thought about yesterday, and I sent a message. I talked a little to Jeff and uh, sent the email to Raf this uh, not yesterday that I would like to do a cutoff time for recent for recent uh, data that because we do have observed some recent increase for. For example, the HCB in marine system for uh, for the blue herring, I didn't put in the in the slide because I think it might, might be too much. Um, we also have observed some uh, recent increase for uh, for mercury in marine region for both birds, which is very interesting because the paper published by Jeff and another uh, researcher showed that for fish data, they do have observed a recent increase. So I think those things are very interesting. So for my my data, maybe we could do a recent data cutoff data, yeah. cutoff yeah. period. That's something I would like to do next. Mm -hmm. That would be good. And link up with some of the work that Courtney's talking about too, with the with the pitch, yeah, with the and the um contaminants and so on. So we've run over time, so we're gonna have to call it call it there. And we do have um Mackenzie, I think we're gonna be handing over to you to make up um the one talk that was missed in an earlier session so we'll just be adding that one in quickly and then after that um we'll close out so i'll leave it to you mackenzie yeah perfect yeah so uh we are gonna just finish off the earlier session of freshwater ecosystem challenges so got verma is joining us and uh her presentation title is Monitoring and Health Status of Benthic Diatom Communities of Bundelkhand Rivers with reference to the proposed Ken Betwa Link. And she is from CMP Degree College. GOT, you can go ahead and share your screen and take over. Thank you. Thank you so much. My slides are visible. Yes, I can see them. Um, just one presentation. It's okay. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. 
Okay, thank you so much for providing this opportunity to present my piece of research work here in this platform. I'm very sorry for this uh, late. Uh, <clears throat> so my presentation topic is the monitoring of diet, uh, monitoring of the cane vitva linkage uh, with the help of uh, diatoms. It is a very important linkage in our country uh, because in the Cane River, I'm just going to background of this work actually. So the Cane River, there is a surplus water and Vipa is a deficit of water. So that's why we have, the government of India has, has, has planned that when uh, the situation is occurring, we can uh, 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 link this, uh, these two rivers uh, for this kind of issues resolved to the diversion of the uh, of the water into the cane uh, from the cane in the Vedava river. So I'm just going to uh, check the significance or the effect of this diversion on the aquatic biodiversity with respect to the uh, diatoms. You know, the biodiversity in the freshwater system is distributed in a fundamentally different pattern from that in marine water still systems. So organism on land or in the sea alive in media that are more or less continuous and with extensive reason that species adjust their range to some degree of climate or ecological conditions change. So freshwater diversity is usually highly localized and even smallly or strain systems often harbor unique locally evolved form of life. Freshwater species diversity is high even in regions where the number of species at any given site is low, then species differ between one site to the next. But the freshwater habitat are relatively discontinuous. Many freshwater species do not disperse easily across the land barriers that separate river drainages into the discrete units. So in tropical developing countries, the process of species extension and the genetic loss may become severe in the future due to the loss of habitat, blockage of waterways, interaction, interactions, and large-scale prevalence of fish diseases. Now, the government of India has approved the country's first river interlink project on Cane Vedipa, and this MOU has been signed among two states and the Union Government of uh, the Union Government of India. So, however, it becomes necessary to know before the linking of these two rivers, the Cane and Vedipa, the effect that may occur on the health of these rivers through scientific studies. The extensive pre-linkage survey was undertaken to study the diatom flora in these two rivers. So the study on the community of the epithetic diatom in the river Bigma and Cane as this perspective was analyzed. And this is my study area. So we came and paid forever. There are linkage between these two rivers. These are very important rivers of Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's a tributary of river Yamuna and Yamuna is the main, major river in the Indian subcontinent as the Ganga, you know very well. It's a very important river in India and a very huge river also. So, so both are the tributaries of the river Yamuna. So diatom samples have been analyzed in these two rivers. Samples were obtained from scraping of the uh, cobbles and pebbles and samples were preserved in formalin. And after that, there are some treatments like acid peroxide treatment to prepare permanent mount of the diatom <clears throat> for identification. Accomplished by the standard methods, the relative abundance is calculated by counting of maximum 500 to 250 diatom cells in each sample. And also, these counts used to compute even this index species diversity index and also cluster analysis and principal component analysis also be performed on the, these data sets. So this table, it represents the geographical coordinates of these locations and also the physical chemical properties of these two rivers in different stations. I have sampled uh, uh, water in these different stations of Cape and Betwa. So it's clearly visible here. Now, the, uh, the basis of the observation which I have recorded in these two rivers is a percentage composition of diatom flora in these two rivers. It's uh, presented here in this table. Naviculus is dominant uh, family in both the rivers. Uh, it's a more than 60% of the uh, percentage composition and, uh, and there are different other forms are also present in their uh, composition. Positive composition is also mentioned here. 
and this is uh, basically a distribution of the item genera in these two rivers. So I'm just trying to represent here that there are few forms that is in red color and in purple color. It defines that there are few forms of uh, diatoms which are specific to these rivers, like Cane River, the Ancanema, Nidium, Hippodonta, Fristulia, Acnanthidium, Tabularia, and Storosura. These are the specific forms in the river Cane. And also the Semina Everest, Epithemia, Ropelodia, Pleuro Sigma. These are the specific forms in the river. Betwa. So it means it, it defines that there are few forms which are represented, uh, specific, uh, represented, representing form or the uh, import, important forms which are only present in specific river. So it means there is some speciality, there's some specific forms which are, which represents uh, that if this river may be uh, interconnected or interlinked, so in future, this, these species may be Vanished, or it may be a different type of loss may be there. And finally, uh, after that, uh, on the basis of the data which we have gathered from the observations, so it's a distribution of uh, species and genera in these two rivers and at different stations. So <laughs> on the basis of this distribution of the species and genera in these two rivers, you know, only 39% 39 of similarity I got in these two rivers. So it is a very important feature that only 39% common in the rivers, it means very low similarity in these two rivers. And now it's a species rich genera in these two rivers. Uh, in this uh, graph, in this figure, you will clearly mention that Navicular, Nishia, Simela, Selectra, and Gomponima, these are these most species rich genera in the river cane. And similarly, in the case of Betwa, so it's slightly different from the cane. So Gomponima is uh, the most abundant forms, most uh, rich species rich genera in case of Betwa. And now the next is about the diversity indices in these two rivers. So the seven diversity indices, uh, log base two, I have identified, I have calculated in these two rivers in which the cane is uh, high diversity, as cane and river cane shows high diversity than the river Betwa. So the extent of similarity is low within the same ecoregion, not very distantly located from each other. So this is very important because these two rivers are very much closely uh, um, situated in the same ecoregions. And this table, it represents the assemblage forming text of the items in these two rivers. So there are different forms. On the basis of more than 10% abundance of the data, I have prepared this uh, a table that represents the most abundant and assemblage forming texts in these two rivers. And uh, in this figure, I just wanted to uh, represent that some important specific forms in these two rivers, which are dominating in the river Cain as well as Betwa, which represents their pictorial uh, images. And this is the cluster analysis uh, on the basis of the data which we have gathered from the uh, our observation. So this cluster analysis, uh, both the rivers are forming separate clusters. So it is also a very important indication that both are completely different. And this is the uh, spatial distribution of the item in the Central Highland rivers of the Cain and Vitva. Uh, it represents uh, that the, it reveals that the river Cain and Vipa are differently different community structure because you know uh, they all are very differently located. So it's it reveals that the both the rivers are completely different with respect to the species. So these results shows that both the rivers are very closely and in the same ecoregions in the ecoregional conditions, but the same biogeographical reasons, and the communities are different from each other. So this uh, study and all these points towards the diverse nature of these within rivers and the linkage could destroy the biodiversity, paving the way, way for bioinnovation, which is common in distributed habitat as waters will be regulated as per needs of the populace. So the study, it presents new data from study of benthic diatom diversity, assemblages, and habitat conditions in the river system that will be heavily altered by the interlinking projects in the near future. So our result, it provided for the first time an assessment of the atom flora of the Kin and Bigdwa River. 
proposed river linking project of India is the most ambitious plan of our country. So this is a need to visualize many relevant issues of the sustainable equity biodiversity conservation of these rivers for the same ecoregional rivers of the central highland. So in the present study, the baseline information on the status of diversity, species composition, abundance, richness, distribution, and identification of priority habitat characteristics of the river would help to incorporate in the degrade control measures on the adverse effect from the project planning phase to various other stages of development would be useful to quantify the level of species and habitat change or loss after the interlinking of Kevitin and Bitwa River. So it is expected that the study will be helpful as a decision-making tool for the assessment of factors related to the proposed interlinking and conservation and management of fish, ecology, and biodiversity. Thank you so much for listening, for the patience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jyoti. Appreciate you joining in. Um, I believe, yeah, that, that is all we have today present, presentation-wise. So I thank everyone for coming. I'm going to hand it off to Abraham Francis, who is going to do our closing. Um, yeah, take it away, Abe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, here I am again, back at it, doing the uh, closing for this really beautiful, wonderful year of the River Symposium uh 30 years at this and you know a river through time i think that's just such an important piece to to celebrate about what we've been able to accomplish in all this time and all the people that have been a part of this and made this beautiful symposium possible every year you know um and when i first start when i opened on wednesday i really kind of started exploring and talking about what the symposium has meant to me how important it was to me to be a part of this and to contribute a body of work, you know, all those years ago, three years ago now. Um, and it would happen during a really important time for me. And then to be here again this time in a new space in my life and to be able to contribute some more to this and just to see all this awesome work as a part of the River Rapport, as a part of all of the wonderful things that have come out of so many different relationships. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge this marvelous subcommittee that put together this, this wonderful event and, and were so kind to me and uh, me running on Indian time pretty, uh, pretty consistently throughout this time. And, you know, I just want to give a special shout out to Georgia Bach, to Emily DeRoshi, to Lee McGoffey, to Stephanie Hildebrand, to Zach, I can't say your last name. And I apologize. Aaron Smith, Elsie Lewison, Alexi Harquill, uh, Mackenzie Wiley Arbic, Jennifer Jarvis, Emma Rydell, and Christina Collard. Your hard labor and contributions to this is recognized and celebrated and loved. You are amazing. And to all the wonderful artists that have been a part of this, and to all the wonderful presenters and everyone that has been a part of this event, to all the various sciences that we have covered in this time, connecting community and research across time. And I really appreciate that. So I really celebrate in that moment. And to close out the thought that I shared on Monday about how the Ohanda Galiwadakwa, the Thanksgiving address, brings our minds together in this space, that we can focus, that we can be present, you know, as, as challenging as that may have been over these past couple of days for many folks, myself included, when I was able to arrive and be present in those conversations, I just really loved and appreciated all the insight and knowledge gained. And so we arrive here at the end, this moment where we close out the space and that we now release everyone back to their lives and their regularly scheduled programming and, and appreciate this time. And so again, I invite you in to bring your minds together to acknowledge all of creation for as they continue to fulfill their roles and responsibilities and to carry this time with you, to think about as we continue to move forward and, and do this continued work, this, eight, this work for the environment, for each other, and that we imbue that with love and celebration as we have been doing in these past couple of days. And so I'll begin, and wherever you are, I hope that when you hear me say to, that we're collectively saying that together from wherever we are in the world.
And so I began. Kyo kyo kwa so to hun seo ska ni galiwasa. Danti to nu kolato ne so kwa yatizu ne gadi o hando galiwa dekwa. And wano headsto. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. Ungwe suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. Yeke ni staha o hunja. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. One ga suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. Ga jo suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. O te la suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. O hun te suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. O nun kwa suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. Ka yin tusala. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A guego aska de do afwet nuni ne on kwa ni gula dono de to no lado ne. O chi nu wa suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne ga hi suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne gondilio. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne o gwele suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. To. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne o ji da a gunga, toni on to hak ni kwa ni gula, to. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne ka yeli ne kawa lage, toni on to hak ni kwa ni gula, to. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne yoki suta gunga la diwelas, toni on to hak ni kwa ni gula, to. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no ar danchi de no kwa lado ne sun kwa ji a kyo ke neka ka lakwa. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne yuki suta suta neka ka lakwa. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne o ji sto kwa suma. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano de te no lado ne ka yeli ni un kwa etike. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. A gue go aska de do afwe nuni ne an kwa ni gula dano danchi de no kwa lado ne so kwa etizo. Tony on to hak ni kwa ni gula. Ona wa deli wan hodo nua wa ni zalade doga o teno sa yun kwa ni gula. Ize gine e za wa do sun telo e gadi. Tony on to hak ni sa wak ni gula. And so, again, that gratefulness for all of us gathering here today and really appreciate everyone being here at the 30th River Symposium. And again, the celebration of everyone that made this possible and dealt with all the crazy schedules and brought us all together and set the stage for us to share this. And also did such an innovative approach with being this hybrid and in-person and just really grateful. And so with that, I send everyone off on their own um, to go back to their lives and look forward to being here next year at the 31st River Symposium. So, onegiwahe, tuknigo.
Thank you.